Good morning and thank you for joining today's hearing on the Central Business District Tolling Program. The hearing will begin shortly. Good morning. We will now begin the hearing. Today is Wednesday, August 31st, 2022, and the time is 10.01 a.m. My name is Lou Oliva, and I will be today's hearing officer. The hearing is being live streamed and recorded and will be available publicly on the MTA YouTube channel and the Central Business District Polling Program Project website at mta.info slash cbddp. Sonographers are present and will create a written record of today's hearing. By attending this virtual hearing, you consent to be recorded. Today's hearing will begin with opening remarks, followed by a presentation on the Central Business District Polling Program Environmental Assessment, and then public comments. There are 314 speakers signed up. Speakers will be called in the order they signed up. After we get underway through the Q&A function, we will send each speaker present today your place in the speaker list. Please give us a little time as it will take some time to get this message to each speaker in attendance. Throughout the day, we will regularly let everyone know where we are in the list so you can gauge how much longer you may need to wait to speak. If you joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, or if you did not sign up to speak but would like to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. You may also request to speak anonymously. If this is your preference, please indicate this in the Q&A function and we will give you further instructions. Please do not use the Q&A function for comments you would like to submit on the Central Business District Polling Program. Comments can be submitted by visiting mta.info slash cbdtp, calling 646-252-7440, via email, I'm sorry, via mail to CBD Tolling Program, to Broadway, 23rd floor, New York, New York, 10004, or via email at cbdtp at mtabt.org. You may also submit comments directly to the Federal Highway Administration via email at cbdtp at dot.gov or by mail at FHWA, New York Division, Ray, CBDTP. Leo W. O'Brien, Federal Building, 11A, Clinton Avenue, Suite 719, Albany, New York, 12207. Comments submitted by phone, by mail, phone, email, online form, or verbally at a hearing will be considered equally and carry the same weight. In addition, and again in recognition of the overwhelming interest, we have, we have added the ability to submit personally recorded video comments. As with oral comments at the hearings, Video comments should be limited to three minutes. Recorded video comments may be submitted via email at cbd at to cbdtp at mtabt.org. Such comments will be considered equally and carry the same weight as all other methods for submitting comments. Part captioning and American Sign Language interpreters are available at today's hearing. To turn on cart captioning, use the CC button on the bottom of the screen. Sign language interpreters will appear on the screen for all attendees. To hear the translated auto, use the interpretation button on the bottom of the screen. We will now start with opening remarks from Dr. Allison De Sereno, MTA's Deputy Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. We are excited to be here as we continue our public outreach on this historic project. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to learn more 
and share with us your thoughts and comments. This morning, I am representing the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority and MTA more broadly, and I'm joined by Nicola Angel, Vice President at Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority and other members of the agency, as well as other colleagues from the other project sponsors for this effort. Richard Wilder, Deputy Chief Engineer Design for the New York State Department of Transportation, and Willem Ulam, Deputy Director of Traffic Engineering and Planning from New York City Department of Transportation. We also have with us today, Rick Marquis, New York Division Administrator for the Federal Highway Administration, the lead federal agency for this project. He will be joined by Monica Pavlik, Project Manager. Key personnel from all four of our agencies are also in attendance today, listening to what you have to say. Your comments will be recorded, indexed, and responded to as part of the environmental assessment process. Last year, we held 10 webinar-style public sessions, nine similar sessions focused on environmental justice communities, and several meetings each of the Environmental Justice Technical Advisory Group and Environmental Justice Stakeholder Working Group. Since then, we have incorporated comments heard during these sessions into the technical analyses for the Environmental Assessment, or EA. I want to thank you all for your earlier input. I believe you will see firsthand how your comments affected what we explored and how we addressed concerns. On August 10th, 2022, we released the Environmental Assessment for Public Review. If you have not yet had an opportunity to read the entire Environmental Assessment, the executive summary, which has been translated into multiple languages, is available on our website. The rest of the document is also on the website, and you can find a hard copy of the entire environmental assessment at numerous locations throughout 28 counties in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. A complete list of locations is also available on the project website. In a few moments, we will begin with a presentation that provides a summary review of the environmental assessment findings. It's a bit longer than one might expect. But there is a lot of important information here, and we want to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to hear about the areas in which they may be interested. After the presentation, we will listen to those of you who would like to provide oral comments. The formal comment period on the environmental assessment continues through September 9th. For those who prefer not to speak but still want to submit comments, we will provide information on other ways to do that again later in the session. Now, let's begin our presentation. So what is the Central Business District Tolling Program? In 2019, New York State enacted the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act, which authorized the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, or TBTA, to design, develop, and implement a vehicular tolling program to reduce traffic congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District. As defined by the act, vehicles entering or remaining in the Manhattan Central Business District on or below 60th Street which is shown in the map in orange, would be told. The FDR Drive, Westside Highway, Battery Park Underpass, and any surface roadway portion of the Hugh L. Carey Tunnel connecting to West Street, in essence, the dark red line along the edges of the orange area on the map to the right, would be excluded from the toll. After covering the project-related capital and operating expenses, revenue collected would fund MTA's 2020 to 2024 capital program and successor capital programs. By law, 80% of the net revenues would be used for New York City transit capital improvements, 10% would be used for Long Island Railroad, and 10% for improvements for Metro North Railroad. With respect to how the Manhattan CBD tolling program would work, locations for infrastructure would include detection points placed at entrances and exits to the Manhattan CBD. On the avenues, these detection points would generally be between 60th and 61st streets, and an algorithm would be used so those who stay on excluded roadways are not told. In essence, as someone is coming down the roadway, the detection points would detect their vehicle and determine how long it should be before they're seen at the next location. Assuming they continue to be seen at each location within the allotted time, no toll would be charged. If, however, the vehicle is not seen and then not seen again, at some point, the system will determine that they must have entered the central business district and a toll would be charged. On the right, you can see an example of what the infrastructure and the tolling system equipment would look like. It's predominantly poles, as you see on the right, and mast arms, as you see on the left. 
Importantly, the tooling system equipment will be clustered and housed in a single unit enclosures as shown on the bottom. The enclosures are purposely designed to minimize the amount of equipment on the poles and to reflect light in a way that makes them less visible to someone walking or driving. With respect to how customers would pay, it would be very similar to what people experience today. They would be able to pay with EasyPass or tolls by mail where an image is taken of the license plate and a bill is mailed to the registered owner of the vehicle. And we will also have the capability for future third party providers. In essence, these are companies that may use different types of technology that can link into the technology that this system would have. The benefits of the program would include reduced vehicular traffic in and near the Manhattan Central Business District, improved travel times within the Manhattan Central Business District, including for buses and deliveries, and a new source of local recurring capital funding for subways, trains, and buses, as well as improved regional air quality. So why is an environmental assessment or EA needed for this project? Well, some roadways in the Manhattan Central Business District have received federal funds. So approval for tolling is needed from the Federal Highway Administration. Before a federal agency makes a decision, the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA requires the federal agency to understand and disclose the environmental effects of the action. In this case, the tolling. An EA is performed to ensure federal agencies consider the environmental impacts of their actions in the decision-making process. For a proposed action that is not likely to have significant effects, or when the significance of the effect is unknown, the EA aids in determining the significance of the adverse effects. Since the project could have effects on environmental justice populations, Federal Highway Administration and the project sponsors incorporated enhanced public outreach and coordination with federal and state resource agencies. The project's purpose is to reduce traffic congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District in a manner that will generate revenue for future transportation improvements pursuant to acceptance into Federal Highway Administration's Value Pricing Pilot Program, or VPPP. The need is to reduce vehicle congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District and create a new local recurring funding source for MTA's capital projects. The purpose and need are refined through four objectives. To reduce daily vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, within the Manhattan Central Business District by at least 5%. To reduce the number of vehicles entering the Manhattan Central Business District daily by at least 10%. To create a funding source for capital improvements and generate sufficient annual net revenue to fund $15 billion for capital projects for the MTA Capital Program. And to establish a tolling program consistent with the purposes underlying the New York State legislation entitled the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. You may be asking, why do we need to toll the Manhattan Central Business District? Well, traffic congestion has been a problem in the Manhattan Central Business District for many years and one of the most challenging policy problems for generations. Many efforts have been made, and yet congestion in New York City consistently ranks among the worst in the United States. Indeed, congestion costs 102 hours of lost time, equating to almost $1,600 per year per driver in delay. Between 2010 and 2019, travel speeds fell 22% in Manhattan Central Business District, and local bus speeds have declined 28% since 2010. The average speed of select bus service, New York City's bus rapid transit service routes, in the Manhattan CBD is 19% slower than in the outer boroughs. With respect to MTA's subway, rail, and bus systems, they need to be repaired and modernized. Funding from the project would support the 2020 to 2024 capital program and the successor programs that prioritize investing to improve reliability, committing to environmental sustainability, building an accessible transit system for all New Yorkers, easing congestion and creating growth, and improving safety and customer service through technology. I'll now walk you through the findings of the environmental assessment. There are two project alternatives that are evaluated in the environmental assessment. The no action alternative, in which there is no program to toll vehicles in the Manhattan Central Business District, no comprehensive plan to reduce congestion, and no new annual recurring funding for MTA capital programs. And there is the central business tolling or action alternative, where we implement a tolling program consistent with the Mobility Act to toll the vehicles entering or remaining in the Manhattan Central Business District. We install tolling infrastructure and tolling system equipment and signage within and near the Manhattan Central Business District. 
and generate funds for MTA's capital investments in subways, buses, and commuter railroads. The environmental assessment explores each of the topics in this chart. The specific chapters that address the analysis for each area are identified here. As you can see, the analysis shows that most of the areas have beneficial effects or no adverse effects, but there are a few areas with potential adverse effects. The slides a bit later in the presentation will address each of the areas and identify any mitigation that is needed. This slide has a lot of information and it is in the executive summary and in chapter two of the environmental assessment for further review. I am going to spend a few moments reviewing and explaining it here so everyone can understand its importance. As I said a moment ago, there are two alternatives for this environmental assessment, the no action and the central business district tolling alternative. Within the central business district tolling alternative, there are a number of tolling scenarios that vary in several ways. Modeling these different scenarios helped us to understand the full range of effects of the central business district tolling alternative since the decision on the actual tolling scenario has not yet been made. For those of you who participated in the early outreach, you may notice that we now have seven tolling scenarios when we originally discussed six. That is because we added a tolling scenario, which I'll get to shortly, as a result of concerns raised during the early public outreach. So let me walk you through. Along the top are the tolling scenarios. Tolling scenario A we refer to as the base plan. This is the plan that is characterized in the legislation. Tolling scenario B has that same base plan but starts to add caps in the form of how many times a vehicle can be tolled and certain exemptions. Tolling scenario C adds what we call low crossing credits for vehicles using tunnels to access the central business district with some caps and exemptions. Those crossing credits, when they are low, are roughly $6.50. When they are high, as you see in tolling scenarios D, E, and F, the credits are roughly $13, and this was used for modeling purposes. In D, E, and F, you see those high crossing credits. In D and E, they are applied to the tunnels that enter into the central business district. And in F, vehicles using all of the tolled facilities that enter Manhattan would be eligible for crossing credits. Moving down the left side, you see the distinction on the items that are varying. First, the potential crossing credits. Again, these are credits that would be applied toward the central business district toll for tolls paid at facilities prior to entering the central business district. As you move to the right, you can see the no's and yeses, which determine whether or not that potential crossing credit applies to the facilities that are identified. Moving to the next group are potential exemptions and discounts in the form of caps on the number of tolls per day. Importantly, by legislation and in the modeling and in the program, passenger vehicles would be charged only once per day, but other vehicles could be charged more than that. And as you read across to the right, you will see under each of the different tolling scenarios how these different types of vehicles were treated with respect to caps or exemptions. Finally, as you move to the bottom, we have the approximate toll rate for autos, small trucks, and large trucks that resulted from the modeling. The one tolling scenario I'd like to mention is tolling scenario G all the way to the right. This tolling scenario has a base plan with the same tolls for all vehicle classes. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation, but importantly, as you see on the bottom, the toll rate is set the same for every type of vehicle. So that was a lot of information. And so I'd like to leave you with some key takeaways. First and foremost, tolling the Manhattan Central Business District in all scenarios reduce traffic entering the Manhattan Central Business District and results in a net benefit in congestion reduction for the region. Discounts, crossing credits, and exemptions result in the need for higher toll rates. Higher toll rates lead to a greater degree of traffic reduction in the Manhattan Central Business District, but also lead to increased traffic diversions, including increases along the Cross Bronx Expressway and the Staten Island Expressway. Crossing credits lead to more parity in the total cost among different routes that are taken by vehicles entering the Manhattan Central Business District, but 
those same crossing credits change the balance of effects on traffic. They result in less effect reducing traffic from Queens and much less effect reducing traffic from New Jersey. They result in greater effects reducing traffic from north of 60th Street in Brooklyn. And they result in more traffic at the Queens Midtown Tunnel, the Hugh L. Carey Tunnel, and the Long Island Expressway. Before we move on, I thought it was helpful to give at least a sense of where are the commuters actually coming from into the Manhattan Central Business District. On the left, you can see the 28 county region. Again, this is all in the environmental assessment for further review. The colors on the map denote the proportion of total commuters to the Manhattan Central Business District from each county in the 28 county region. The map also shows how many commute by transit, car, or some other transportation mode to reach the Manhattan Central Business District. Not surprisingly, counties that are further away tend to have fewer commuters to the Manhattan Central Business District. For example, of all the commuters to the Manhattan Central Business District, fewer than 1% come from counties like New Haven and Dutchess. About 1% to 3% come from counties like Rockland, Morris, and Richmond. And roughly 4 to 5% come from Bergen, Hudson, and Westchester counties. Closer in, about 6 to 10% come from Nassau County and the Bronx, while the remainder of the New York City boroughs contribute 11 to 22% of the commuters to the Manhattan Central Business District. On the right in the figure, you can see that of all the people commuting to work in the Manhattan Central Business District, the vast majority, 85%, commute by transit. Of the 11% who commute by car, approximately 8% of them are from counties in New York, roughly 3% in New Jersey, and less than 1% from Connecticut. Now we'll go through the effects of each of the topic areas. On the top right of each slide, you'll see that we've identified whether effects are beneficial, not adverse, or adverse. In this case, this is the regional effects of transportation. Broadly speaking, all tolling scenarios reduce the number of vehicle entries into the Manhattan Central Business District and reduce vehicle miles traveled in the Manhattan Central Business District. The table on the bottom left provides the degree to which the traffic is reduced. In this case, there's a reduction of vehicles entering the Manhattan CBD of nearly 20% to roughly 15%, depending upon which tolling scenario one is looking at. On the right-hand side, you see the increase or decrease in daily vehicle miles traveled for each of the areas throughout the 28 counties. And as you can see, broadly speaking, regionally, again, there's largely a benefit. In the Manhattan Central Business District, VMT decreases anywhere from a little over 9% to about 7%. Throughout New York City, the reduction is roughly 1.5% to about 0.7%, and so on down the group. With respect to highways, we have beneficial effects, and we do have some adverse effects in a few locations where mitigation will be required. Some locations experience a decrease in congestion, which is a beneficial effect. There were three highway segments, though, that would experience adverse effects in the form of increased delays at certain times. As you can see here, it's the westbound Long Island Expressway near the Queens Midtown Tunnel in the midday. Approaches to the westbound George Washington Bridge on I-95 also in the midday. And in the evening, the southbound and northbound FDR Drive between East 10th Street and Brooklyn Bridge. For mitigation, the project sponsors implement a monitoring plan prior to the project beginning that identifies thresholds for adverse effects. If the thresholds are reached as a result of the project, the project sponsors will institute transportation demand management measures, such as ramp metering, motorist information, or signage at identified highway locations with adverse effects. In addition, post-implementation, the project sponsors will monitor effects, and if needed, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, TBTA, will modify the toll rates, crossing credits, exemptions, and or discounts to reduce those adverse effects. Note the call out in the upper right, and recall what I mentioned regarding tolling scenario G earlier. During our early outreach, in conversations with environmental justice communities, we shared information regarding changes in traffic patterns. Here on the left, you can see one of the maps that was used for analysis related to traffic and air quality effects. These are areas with environmental justice communities. Under this tolling scenario, some of these communities would experience reduced vehicle miles traveled. Others would see some increases as traffic diverts to avoid the toll. As noted earlier, as the toll goes up, these diversions increase. 
Participants raised concerns about the increased traffic along the Cross Bronx Expressway and asked what that meant in terms of truck traffic, as trucks are associated with particulate matter and associated health effects. The team reviewed the initial six scenarios at a specific location, McCombs Road, and found the daily increases in truck traffic in the table to the right. During this same outreach period, the trucking associations also raised their concerns that people can move to transit to avoid the toll, but trucks cannot do this. Further, though tolled bridges, roadways, and tunnels typically charge higher tolls for trucks given the wear and tear on the roadway, the purpose of this project is to reduce congestion. The project team looked closer at why trucks were diverting in the modeling. We found that the extent of the diversions was linked to the truck toll and price differential in the initial six tolling scenarios where trucks are tolled at a higher price. To test this, we created tolling scenario G, which prices all vehicle types the same. The result, as you can see, reduced the diversions along with the relative incremental number of trucks on the Cross Bronx Expressway. Given the concerns raised, the project team decided to include this tolling scenario formally in the environmental assessment. With respect to local intersections, again, there are beneficial effects and adverse effects where mitigation is required. Specifically, most intersections would experience decreases in delay. Tolling scenarios D, E, and F, the high credit scenarios, had four out of 102 intersections that experienced adverse effects in the modeling in the form of increased delay at certain times. And you can see them here on the right. Project sponsors will monitor those intersections where adverse effects are identified and implement appropriate signal timing adjustments to mitigate the effect per New York City Department of Transportation's normal practice. In terms of transit, we found beneficial effects and some adverse effects where mitigation is required. With respect to beneficial effects, reduced roadway congestion would result in reliable, faster bus trips. There is an increase in transit ridership of one to 2% system-wide for travel to and from the Manhattan Central Business District, but no adverse effects from increased ridership on any lines or transit stations. We do see that some scenarios increased ridership could adversely affect passenger flows at specific stairs or escalators, what we refer to as station elements. With respect to mitigation, in tolling scenarios E and F, TBTA will coordinate with New Jersey Transit and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to implement a monitoring plan with specific thresholds for pedestrian volumes on a specific station stair in Hoboken Terminal. If the thresholds are reached, TBTA will coordinate with these agencies to implement signage and wayfinding. In all the tolling scenarios, TBTA will coordinate with MTA's New York City Transit to implement monitoring plans with specific thresholds at the locations bulleted here. At 42nd Street and Times Square, there's a specific stair affected. And if the threshold is reached, the center handrail will be removed and the riser will be adjusted. At Union Square Subway Station and Flushing and Main Street Station, there are two escalators, one in each, that could be affected. If the thresholds are reached, we would increase escalator speeds. And at Court Square, there's a stair affected. If the threshold is reached, we would construct a new stair to increase capacity. With respect to pedestrians and bicycles, the EA found that increases in passengers at transit hubs would have no adverse effects. It would be some increases in bicycle trips overall and near the transit hubs, but again, no adverse effects. Outside the Manhattan Central Business District, increased transit usage at individual stations would not adversely affect pedestrian conditions on nearby sidewalks, crosswalks, or corners. But within the Manhattan Central Business District, there are two crosswalks and one sidewalk that would be adversely affected. You can see here on the right with the red lines that they occur near on 8th Avenue, near West 32nd Street and 7th Avenue, and on West 34th Street and Avenue of the Americas. For mitigation, the project sponsors will implement a monitoring plan with threshold for action. If the threshold is reached, pedestrian space would be increased and obstructions will be removed or relocated. With respect to parking and to social conditions, specifically population characteristics and neighborhood character, we found either beneficial effects or no adverse effects. 
With respect to social conditions, improvement in travel time and safety, reduced vehicle operating costs, and reduced emissions would occur from the project. There would be no adverse effects on neighborhood character or access, travel to employment within the Manhattan Central Business District or reverse commuting, traffic patterns on local streets or community facilities and services. With respect to parking, the study found a reduction in parking demand within the Manhattan Central Business District, an increased parking demand at subway and commuter rail stations and park and ride facilities outside of the Manhattan Central Business District. But the increase at any individual location would not be large enough to result in an adverse effect from the project. Economic conditions found increased productivity as well as safety improvements. There were no adverse effects to any particular industry or occupational category in the Manhattan Central Business District. Depending on the tolling scenario, the toll could reduce taxi and for higher vehicle revenues in the Manhattan Central Business District. While the industry would remain economically viable overall, individual drivers could be adversely affected, and this is dealt with a little bit later in the presentation. In terms of energy and noise, again, there are beneficial effects and no adverse effects. With respect to energy, the region would benefit from reductions in regional energy consumption as a result of reductions in the vehicle miles traveled. In terms of noise, 102 intersections were assessed and all the crossings into the Manhattan Central Business District. The study found imperceptible increases or decreases in noise levels resulting from changes in traffic volumes. With respect to air quality, the environmental assessment found that regionally air pollutants would be reduced, including precursors to greenhouse gases. There would be no local exceedances of air quality standards. Recognizing that air quality is of great concern to many constituents, we have several enhancements, though there were no local exceedances of those standards. New York City Department of Transportation will coordinate to expand the New York City Community Air Survey Network of air quality monitors. This will be supplemented by a small number of real-time monitors for particulate matter. Also, based on feedback during outreach for the project, MTA will prioritize Kingsbridge and Gun Hill bus depots, both located in and serving primarily environmental justice communities in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, when electric buses are received in MTA's next major procurement of battery electric buses. In terms of environmental justice, the study did find adverse effects where mitigation is required. The map to the right shows the communities that are environmental justice communities throughout the region. They are widespread. And as shown earlier, in some cases, certain EJ communities will benefit directly from this project. However, the project would have the potential for disproportionately high and adverse effects on low-income drivers who do not have an alternative transportation mode for reaching the Manhattan Central Business District and on taxi and for higher vehicle drivers in New York City, many of whom identify as part of an environmental justice population. This adverse effect occurs specifically in tolling scenarios that toll their vehicles more than once per day. We have a number of mitigation for low-income drivers, which you can see here on the left. There will be a tax credit for central business district tolls paid by residents of the Manhattan Central Business District whose New York adjusted gross income for the taxable year is less than 60,000. CBTA will coordinate with New York State Department of Taxation and Finance to ensure availability of documentation needed for drivers eligible for the credit. CBTA will also post information related to the tax credit on the project website with links to the New York State Department of Taxation and Finance website to guide eligible drivers to information on claiming the credit. TPTA will also eliminate the $10 refundable deposit required for EasyPass customers with no credit card linked to their account. It will increase promotion of existing EasyPass payment and plan options and will work with MTA to increase outreach and education on eligibility for existing discounted transit fare products and programs. The project sponsors will establish an environmental justice community group that will meet on a biannual basis with the first meeting six months after project implementation to share updated data and analysis and hear about potential concerns. For effects on taxi and FHV drivers, the project sponsors will work with appropriate city and state agencies 
so that when passengers are present in the vehicles, the passengers will pay the toll rather than the driver. Again, these mitigations would be for New York City taxi and FHB drivers if a tolling scenario is implemented with tolls of more than once per day for their vehicles. TBTA will work with MTA New York City Transit to institute an employment resource coordination program to connect drivers experiencing job insecurity with a direct pathway to licensing, training, and job placement with MTA or its affiliated vendors at no cost to the drivers. For those who may not want a commercial driver's license, TBTA will coordinate with MTA New York City Transit to submit a request to the Federal Transit Administration for a pilot program that will help increase eligibility of taxi and FHB drivers to use their vehicles to provide paratransit trips. And MTA's New York City Transit will implement this program if approved. With respect to construction effects, no adverse effects were found. Construction would consist of replacement of existing poles or installation of new poles and mast arms, excavation and construction of foundations, placement of new support poles or structures, attachment of tolling system equipment, and restoration of the roadway, sidewalk, or ground surface. The construction would occur on streets and sidewalks and take approximately one to two weeks per location. During this time, there would be temporary disruptions to traffic and pedestrian patterns and temporary noise disruptions at nearby land uses, such as residences and businesses. The project sponsors would require the contractor to develop and comply with plans and procedures to minimize construction effects. With respect to visual resources, there were also no adverse effects. Infrastructure is similar in form to streetlight poles, sign poles, or similar structures already in use throughout New York City. Signage is similar in size and character to signs already present, and the color would match existing light pole colors. On the bottom right, there's a rendering of tolling system equipment that would be placed on existing infrastructure. Again, as noted earlier, the tolling equipment is clustered into those single enclosures to reduce visual impact. And cameras would use infrared illumination at night, so there would be no visible light needed. The project would have a neutral effect on viewer groups and no adverse effect on visual resources. With respect to Section 4F, a de minimis impact is one that, after taking into account any measures to minimize harm, results in either a Section 106 finding of no adverse effect or no historic properties affected on a historic property, or a determination that the project would not adversely affect the activities, features, or attributes qualifying a park, recreation area, or refuge for protection under Section 4F. Central Park in the High Line have the potential for a de minimis use. Federal Highway Administration is soliciting input from the public on the effects of installing equipment and signs within and on these properties. Signage and four replacement poles with tolling technology would be installed in Central Park. Tolling technology equipment would be added to the underneath of the existing structure of the High Line. You can see some of the renderings at the bottom here. With respect to the findings, the Central Business District tolling alternative does not result in adverse effects pursuant to Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, and it does not adversely affect the activities, features, or attributes that qualify the resource for protection under Section 4F. Federal Highway Administration has concurrence on a proposed finding from officials with jurisdiction over Central Park and the High Line, and will consider public input on its proposed finding received during this public review of the environmental assessments. There were two final additional enhancements I would like to mention, and again, they were in response to outreach during the early outreach period. First, the project sponsors are committed to ongoing data collection and reporting on the potential effects of the project. Data will be collected in advance and after implementation, and a formal report will be issued one year after implementation, and then every two years thereafter. The reporting website will make data, analysis and visualizations available in open data format to the greatest extent possible, with updates provided on at least a biannual basis as data becomes available and analysis is completed. Again, through our conversations and public outreach and particularly with environmental justice communities, we are also committed to prioritizing equity in bus service improvements. New York City's buses serve a greater share of low income minority households than other modes, including subways. MTA developed a new approach that combines considerations of equity and air quality to identify equity priority areas. 
which are then used to target improvements and investments to promote equity and access to opportunities in transit-dependent, historically marginalized, and underserved areas. Information on our early public outreach is here on the left. During that period, we held 10 virtual public outreach meetings, as well as nine environmental justice outreach meetings. We had three meetings of the Environmental Justice Technical Advisory Group and two meetings of the Environmental Justice Stakeholder Working Group. During the 19 public outreach and EJ outreach meetings, we had over 1,000 participants registered and nearly 400 speakers. All of the sessions were left on our project website and people could access them through YouTube. To date, we've had over 14,000 views and we've received over 7,300 comments. Our current public outreach sessions will include six public hearings starting on Thursday, August 25th and running through Wednesday, August 31st. We will also have another meeting of the Environmental Justice Stakeholder Working Group and another meeting of the Environmental Justice Technical Advisory Group. With respect to schedule, this shows where we currently are. We did our early public outreach in 2021 and early 2022. We prepared the environmental assessment. We've notified agencies and organizations and individuals of the environmental assessment's availability. And we're now in the midst, in orange here, of public review and comment on the environmental assessment. After the formal comment period closes, there will be a determination whether the action, in this case the tolling, will result in significant effects. Ultimately, we're expecting that in early 2023, Federal Highway Administration will issue a decision document. If adverse effects are not significant or can be mitigated below significant levels, FHWA would issue a FONSI, a finding of no significant impact. If there are significant effects that cannot be mitigated, then an Environmental Impact Statement, or EIS, would be required. As noted, our public comment period is open until September 9th of 2022. If you'd like to submit written comments, you may do so in the following ways, through our project website, by email, mail, phone, or fax, or to the Federal Highway Administration by email or mail. All of this information is also available on our website, and the information on the project website, email, mail, phone, and fax for MTA Bridges and Tunnels is also in the environmental assessment. In addition, formal oral comments can be made at the public hearings, as many of you are doing today. They will be recorded by the stenographer. Thank you again for attending this public hearing to learn more about the environmental assessment for the Central Business District Tolling Program. And now, we look forward to hearing from you. We encourage anyone joining via Zoom or live stream to take a short survey using the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the chat section of the Zoom. We are gathering public comments today on the environmental assessment for the Central Business District Tolling Program. Comments will re be recorded, indexed, and responded to as part of the environmental assessment process. Responses will not be provided during today's hearing. There are 314 speakers signed up to speak today. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. At the two and a half minute mark, the clock will turn red and you will hear a beep notifying you that you have 30 seconds remaining. We ask that speakers keep their remarks to the three minute time frame out of respect for all other speakers. We will be calling speakers in the order they signed up, but anyone who wishes to speak will have an opportunity. Due to the volume of speakers, there may be extended wait times to speak. Comments submitted by mail, phone, email, online form, or verbally at a hearing will be considered equally and carry the same weight. If you have joined Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, or if you did not sign up to speak but would like to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. You may also request to speak anonymously. If this is your preference, please indicate this in the Q&A function and we will provide you with further instructions. Please note that comments on the Central Business District Tolling Program are not being received via the Q&A function, and comments submitted in that fashion will not be part of the hearing record. When you are called on to speak, there will be a brief transition on your screen before you will be able to unmute and enable your camera. Please make sure that once your, your screen updates, your camera and microphone are enabled before beginning your remarks. If you do not wish to use your camera, you do not have to do so. You will not be able to unmute or enable your camera until it is your turn to speak. Please remain patient until then. In the event you missed your name being called, 
We will call you again after all other speakers in attendance have been called a first time. As a reminder, this hearing is being live streamed and recorded and will be available, pub available publicly on our YouTube channel and on our project website at mta.info slash cbdtp. Stenographers are present and will create a written record of this hearing. By attending this virtual hearing, you consent to be recorded. We will now begin the public comment portion of today's hearing. Our first speaker is Assemblymember Deborah Glick, followed by Assemblymember Kenneth Zabrowski. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today regarding the MTA's plan for the CBD tolling program. The need to reduce gas emissions and create a reliable revenue stream to improve our transit system makes congestion pricing a reasonable policy choice. There is a need to improve accessibility for people with disabilities, upgrade critical infrastructure, move buses towards zero emissions, and improve subway safety. However, in regards to the implementation of this project, there are a few concerns I have about the residents who live in the CBD and how this will impact their lives. My first concern is about how this will impact the economy. It is reasonable to assume that everyone in the congestion zone will experience pass along charges for services and deliveries, unlike New Yorkers living uptown or anywhere outside of the CBD. The promised impact of the program on the environment is still hypothetical, but the impact it will have on hundreds of thousands of residents' pocketbooks, many of whom are struggling economically as it is, is certain, whether they own a car or not. While it is viewed as harsh by many people in the congestion zone to be charged an extra fee simply to drive home, it seems especially punitive to charge them to leave home, which the remaining in zone toll seems to do. The ancillary impact of new tolls put a severe burden on our residents, most of whom do not contribute to the congestion or pollution, considering that the majority of them either do not have cars or leave their cars parked in already, already heavily taxed parking meter zones or parking garage. However, those who do use vehicles due to medical treatments may be especially disadvantaged. Another concern is how the tolls will impact God's Love We Deliver, a non-for-profit based in the CBD, which will experience an estimated cost of half a million dollars a year to continue to serve historically marginalized communities and where 90% of their clients are below the poverty line. An exemption or a discount for this critical service is a top priority, as it will surely affect the lives of New Yorkers who need these services to, su to survive and live in all parts of the city. In closing, I reiterate my support for congestion pricing and understand that the committee has said any consideration in one area increases the need for higher tolls to cover that consideration. But I suggest that solely relying on congestion pricing to cover the MTA needs may not be the most equitable solution and an added additional broad-based revenue stream should be considered. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Assembly Member Kenneth Zabrowski, followed by County Executive Ed Day. Hi, good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm Assembly Member Ken Zabrowski. I represent Rockland County, um, one of the west of the Hudson counties in the MTA district. Um, I, I've been an opponent of congestion pricing for a long time. Have testified previously. I don't want to spend too much of my time here today uh, speaking about my broad-based opposition. I voted against uh, the legislation that set up this entire process. But um, being where we are today, I really want to talk about the west of Hudson commuters, Rockland County in particular, but up to Orange County, um, the commuter tax, uh, the portions of the sales tax, those of us in the MTA district from um, west of Hudson pay all the same taxes, yet get a fraction of the service. So listening to the presentation earlier, where it was talked about some of the benefits 
um, none of those benefits will be um, received by West of Hudson commuters. In fact, when you talk about the 90 10 10 distribution of the funds, you know, even the 10 to Metro North um, won't go to West of Hudson commuters unless they have to pay some sort of a toll or, or pay a fare in order to get over the river first before getting on Metro North. Um, I may oppose congestion pricing completely, but at least it would be something for my constituents if, something, if there was something in this plan to suggest that it would be used to improve the historical, um, I think, lack of investment for West of Hudson commuters, but of course there, there's nothing there. So I think we need to provide, if this is gonna go forward, credits to West of Hudson commuters those in Rockland that have to pay a toll to get over that bridge. Now, I understand that there's different authorities involved in this process. A lot of Rocklanders have to go down the Palisades Parkway and head over the GW Bridge. There has to be a recognition of that, and there has to be some sort of a credit given to those folks. They don't have the options. Every train in Rockland County is run by New Jersey Transit, um, which, number one, is substandard service, and number two, takes a long time to get down and then over. Um, so if, and, and also a lot of folks, whether they be nurses, police officers, firefighters have to commute in off hours where there literally is no mass transit opportunities. So I know I don't have too much time yet, but when we talk about credits, you have to remember West of Hudson commuters. And at the very least, there has to be some sort of a credit as most as possible I would advocate for for those commuters that are paying a toll to get over the river. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is County Executive Ed Day, followed by Assemblymember David Weprin. Hello? You may begin your remarks. Hey, stop. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to set this up. We can see you and hear you. You may begin your remarks. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, and um, my name is County Executive Ed Day. And I want to thank you for the opportunity. Like almost all of the members of the Metropolitan Community Transportation District, Rockland County has no one seat rail ride to the Central Business District and severely limited mass transit alternatives. This transit desert forces more than 60% of our residents to drive into the city because they have no other way to get there. And that commute is not cheap. Our residents pay heavy tolls on the George Washington Bridge, Lincoln Tunnel, and Tappan Zee Bridge for decades while being subjected to a $40 million annual value gap between what we pay to the MTA and what we get in return. That equates to $400 million gap in just the last decade. And now you, you want these commuters to, to give even more while all of the East River bridges remain toll free despite the significant transit options they, to get into the city from those communities. Among those commuters include cops, firefighters and others whose work schedules would leave them stranded save for using their own vehicle. Have all of you forgotten 911? Is this your reward for their sacrifice? Connecticut commuters, yes, an entirely different state, do not pay one red cent and unbelievably receive better service from the MTA than our overpaying MTA member, Rockland County. One project approving this point is the MTA's recent $1.3 billion Penn Station access project provide a second one seat extension ride into Penn Station for Metro North, east of the Hudson commuters. Yes, a premium one seat ride, while we in Rockland still cannot get that basic one seat service. In exchange for that $40 million extra collected by the MTA from Rockland each year, our county has received service reductions and increased fares. No improvements to the Pascac Valley rail line in 15 years, and no significant improvements to facilities rolling stock, yards, or equipment. Now, the MTA will say they invested heavily in the west of the Hudson Port Jervis line, which is true. But unfortunately, that line only serves only one station in Rockland, and our residents make up less than 2% of that ridership. I challenge and invite each and every one of you, 
to find any significant MCA investment has been made in Rockland County for the last 15 years. Rockland County residents face by far the highest level of transit and equity in the MTA region, and it would be an insult to these families who are re already struggling to keep up with rising gas prices and record-breaking inflation to move this forward without an exemption as part of the CBD tolling program if it is implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Assemblymember David Weprin, followed by Councilmember Selvina Brooks Powers. Assembly member, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Good morning. I'm Assemblyman David Weprin. I represent the 24th Assembly District in, in Queens, which will, which will be one of the most adversely impacted by the imposition of congestion pricing. Congestion pricing is not a fair deal for New Yorkers. It is an outer borough tax that will cripple families and businesses in New York City at a time of record inflation while we are still recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. The proposed date for implementation of congestion pricing could be as early as the end of next year or the start of 2024. I am calling for a moratorium on the implementation of congestion pricing through at least December 31st, 2028, and I will sponsor the legislation to that effect. My district, which extends along the Grand Central Parkway, is a public transit desert. A trip into Manhattan can take two hours and often requires hopping two buses and two subway lines, whereas driving more than cuts that time in half. Many of my constituents have no viable transportation options other than driving a car. Congestion pricing is anti-drivers, which includes taxi drivers, truck drivers, app-based providers, and millions of our neighbors from across all five boroughs. Inflation is skyrocketing and congestion pricing will raise costs for every business in New York City. There are no carve outs for small businesses or the working drivers will be hit twice by congestion pricing. First by the fees and next by the increased prices of goods and services. There are no exemptions for the disabled, the elderly or the infirm. To make matters worse, the MTA is currently redesigning the bus network and eliminating multiple stops that my constituents have used for years, which will result in further disruption to ridership. Our businesses haven't returned to normal and their success, success requires the patronage and financial support of outer borough residents. But congestion pricing will cut this much needed revenue at the knee. The supply chain disruptions that have impacted all of our lives for the past few years will only be exacerbated by congestion pricing, which will impose yet another fee on shipping companies and truck drivers that transport our goods. Any increases in shipping fees will be borne by our businesses and ultimately the customer. Savvy shipping companies may cut their losses and abandon us as a market if the cost of doing business becomes too high. The MTA is notorious for mismanaging funds. What happened to the $15 billion in federal funding? In closing, the MTA is an unacceptable, unaccountable, and untrustworthy steward of the public funds. We must focus on fixing the MTA and making it accountable. That's why I'm calling for a moratorium on the implementation Please of congestion pricing through, through 2028. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Council Member Selvina Brooks Powers, followed by Samir Lavingina. Council member, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Good morning. I'm Councilwoman Sylvina Brooks Powers, representing Southeast Queens and Eastern Rockaway in the New York City Council. 
and serving as the chair of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. I'd like to thank the agency for hosting this forum for New Yorkers to share their perspectives on how congestion pricing will affect their community. This proposal stands to significantly impact the fabric of our city by reducing traffic in Manhattan's urban core and by establishing a new funding stream for our public transportation network and the many critical improvements necessary. We have a real opportunity to ensure that our subways, buses, and commuter rail systems continue to meet the needs of everyone who lives, works, and plays in the New York region. But this must be done right and done equitably. The MTA has released a wide ranging set of proposals with toll levels rising as high as $23. I have been stopped at events across the city, emailed, called with very valuable feedback on the congestion pricing plan with concerns of the impact to communities like the one I represent. I believe it is critical that out of borough communities like mine, as well as Staten Island, South Bronx and Western Prince Queens are not unjustly affected by the financial and potentially the environmental burden this toll may impose. As the chair of the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure and as a council member whose constituents have some of the longest commutes in the city, I know firsthand that many residents in transportation deserts rely on our cars as a key part of their commute. Our communities lack viable public transportation services to effectively, safely, and reliably travel into Manhattan. I have many constituents who are seniors, as well as people in need of medical care only available in Manhattan, when for them, the only way to access vital services is by car. An overly expensive toll will present a real financial burden to our seniors and disabled communities that live on fixed income. Additionally, we need to be sure that our existing infrastructure can accommodate new commuting preferences. My district has three Long Island Railroad stations. The MCA should consider expanding intra-city LIRR fare discounts to make rail an affordable option for more New Yorkers. I also want to make sure that as commuter demand shifts from cars to commuter rail, our stations do not experience crowding, overwhelmed parking, lot and less reliable service. I have also heard serious concerns from taxi drivers about this proposal. Our network of taxi cab, livery and rideshare vehicles fill key transportation gaps in many communities. And these drivers have already faced serious economic burdens in recent years and please already conclude your remarks. a congestion surcharge. If I could just ask for one more moment, please. I'm sorry, can I ask for one more moment just to complete it? In respect for all speakers, we ask that you keep your remarks to three minutes. You can submit additional comments to us via email and we'll follow up with you on different ways to submit comments. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Samir Levengia, followed by Glenn Dewar. Hello. Hopefully you can see and hear me. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to give comment today. I'm a, a resident who lives in the CBD area or what will be the CBD area. Uh, I live adjacent to Union Square Park and I previously lived in the West Village which would also be included in the area. Previously, I've lived in two different places with congestion pricing, Singapore and London. And in both places, it works amazingly to keep congestion down and improve quality of life for residents, commuters and others. Right now, we're simply asking people to pay um, for vehicle usage with their time and their health via um, issues with um, greenhouse gases and other uh, stuff like that. So I, I think I read through the environmental um, assessment and I appreciate how thorough it is. Uh, in my opinion, I think options D or E are the right way to go. It's just a question for me of what, what is going to raise the most money for the MTA, what is the simplest and what is gonna reduce car usage as much as possible. When I'm thinking about these options, what I think is if I was a resident or I was about to take a car into the cordon zone, what would prevent me from doing it? We want to reduce these trips as much as possible into the cordon zone in, in order to improve the lives of the people who live in it as much as possible. I think that means we should have as few exceptions as possible, and we can always increase costs and tolls later if the need for more money arises. There's so many benefits like the environmental 
benefits, reductions in noise, bus, bus speed, safety, and, and speeds for emergency vehicles. I often walk around the area and I'll see an emergency vehicle be stuck in a ton of traffic. And I honestly wonder what is happening to the person inside when those sirens are going off. I think we should additionally consider charging different vehicles, not just personal vehicles uh, versus trucks, but like SUVs or smart cars, different amounts of money because they simply take up way less space, emit less and do way less damage to residents who live in the area. I'd also love to see a ramp up in bus service. When London uh, launched their congestion pricing program, they ramped up bus service by 27%. Ridership skyrocketed by 30, 37% virtually overnight. And it was half, half of those people had been people who had gotten out of their cars. To summarize, I don't think we can delay this project any longer. It's been delayed again and again. And in the meanwhile, people who live in the Corden area are suffering. This project will dramatically improve the lives of everyone who lives in the region, be it by cutting travel times for drivers, delivery times for delivery companies, better air quality for residents, better bus speeds for bus riders, and capital improvements for anyone who uses the MTA via this dedicated funding stream. The benefits of this program are innumerable, and we should mitigate the issues raised as much as possible. But it is clear that congestion pricing is something that must be done, and I look forward to living in what will soon be the cordon zone, and I am very happy to pay whenever I need to take a car in or out of the area. Thank you so much for hosting these sessions and taking my comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Glenn Dewar, followed by our 15th speaker on the list, Sarah Gribitz. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Glenn Dewar. I live in Queens County. I'm a lifelong resident of Queens County. Um, whoops, there's my video. <clears throat> um, I'm a lifelong resident of Queens County. Um, I have been a caregiver for most of my life. My mother was mentally ill. I took care of her for 28 years. Um, my partner sadly uh, was diagnosed with cancer in 2019. I took care of him for the 17 months I tried to keep him alive. And now I've been left to take care of his mother. She's in a senior living facility, but there's still quite a many things that need to be taken care of that often require transporting her. Um, for example, right now, uh, I need to find a neurologist for her because she's beginning to forget things. These plans for congestion pricing uh, don't consider caregivers. When I looked at the presentation that you presented, disabled people didn't exist, the elderly didn't exist, were not mentioned, and caregivers, most of all, uh, don't exist in any of these plans. Uh, the idea that somebody would be using a car to transport a disabled or elderly person in need is not discussed. This program takes a lot of the best doctors and makes them inaccessible to people in the outer boroughs and any place else that need to drive a person in. When I'm considering a neurologist, I won't be able to consider some of the best neurologists in the city because they will be inaccessible to me. I won't be able to drive her. She uses a walker. We were just in a pandemic. Obviously, transit is not a great idea when you're commuting, a when you're transporting a vulnerable person. My partner, when he had cancer, uh, his immune system was compromised in the middle of a pandemic. Telling people that they have to take transit in that environment is insane. Um, when we look at the people who are behind this, it's transportation alternatives. And they have been not mentioned throughout this presentation, but they're really the masterminds behind this. And they hate drivers. Their, their early mottos have been one less car. And currently, if you go to their website and look at uh, their branding, their current thing is streets are for people. So when I'm transporting someone with cancer or when I was taking care of my mother, I'm not even a human being to transportation alternatives. Only people on bikes apparently are human beings, but not people who need cars. Bicycles have room for one person and the people behind this don't understand that. They don't understand caring for another person and the responsibilities of that. They live in a fantasy world and we need to seriously consider the elderly, the disabled and caregivers and stop excluding them from, this, from, from life in the city and our world. Uh, thank you very much. That's all the time I have. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Gribitz, followed by Jonathan Miller. 
Our next speaker is Jonathan Miller, followed by Michael Murray. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Miller. I'm here representing me and my husband, Jonathan, today. We are residents of the Central Business District. We live on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And unlike uh, two speakers ago, I completely disagree with him. We are lifelong Lower East Siders. My husband's a fifth generation down here, and we completely oppose congestion pricing, and particularly that it doesn't exempt residents who live in the CBD. This insane plan is going to cost higher living for everyone, not just those uh, who own cars. It's gonna cost more to get goods and services into this part of the city. My taxes, I live and work in New York City. My taxes pay for these roads and we should be able to drive on them without having to pay additional money. And every time we come home, we have to pay. Now we talk about exemptions for low income New Yorkers, $60,000 is just a joke. But really, I have three children in this city. Public transportation on the Lower East Side is a mess. For all you MTA people on here, you should know that the East Broadway subway stop is the 12th most dangerous stop in New York City. I'm not going to take my kids there. The M14 is among the worst bus lines in Manhattan. It's really a shame that this is such a money grab by the MTA. They can't even see how they don't exempt residents of the Central Business District. And this is going to be born on our backs. So maybe in some kind of alternative universe, the goals are noble. The MTA has made it clear it's not really about reducing pollution or air quality. It's really about raising money for them, which frankly is not my problem. Um, and the, the residents need an immediate exemption for all residents. It should not be income-based. And the last point I want to make is that I use my car in Manhattan, as many people have mentioned on here, to see doctors. My son has hearing loss, requires a lot of special services. And the second we leave the CBD, we're going to be charged. It's really ridiculous, and we are completely opposed. And I will cede my time for other people. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Murray, followed by Daniel Ekman. Michael, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Thank you for this opportunity to comment on proposed congestion pricing schemes. Mark Twain said, there are three kinds of lies, white lies, damn lies, and statistics. And the EA's happy findings of little to no adverse impact defy logic. This will be an unmitigated economic disaster for everybody living in the Central Business District and every business located here. Some have said this is an outer borough tax. Well, it's also a huge tax on the people living within the Central Business District. If people outside the district don't want this and people inside the district don't want this, it obviously needs to die. In any case, my wife and I are retired senior citizens living on a fixed income in what would be the Manhattan Central Business District. Moreover, I suffer from severe COPD and emphysema. With air pollution threatening my very existence, I should be a fan of congestion pricing that improves air quality. But the reality is that congestion pricing as currently proposed will be an absolute disaster for my wife and I. My health precludes my, me from using mass transit. We need to drive to essential medical care. And under the current proposal, we face punishing tolls every time I need to go to New York Presbyterian to see the lung transplant team, or whenever I need to go to the National Jewish Respiratory Institute at Mount Sinai. Moreover, we face onerous tolls whenever driving to see relatives on Long Island or simply doing something like going to Stu Leonard's and Yonkers. In short, the current proposal would largely limit our lives to the CBD, virtually erasing our right to travel. No other population would face the hardships that would be imposed on residents of the CBD. Moreover, residents of the CBD are not the cause of traffic congestion. Commuters, trucks, and four hire vehicles cruising our streets while waiting for fares are clogging our streets. And those claiming that residents of the CBD 
have many options other than driving. All seem to assume that people are healthy enough to walk, bike, or use mass transit. While the Uber, Lyft, and taxi lobbyists demanding exemptions are asking society to subsidize the very activities that cause congestion, undermining congestion's pricing ability to get more people to use mass transit. Clearly, fairness requires exemptions for residents of the CBD, especially seniors and the handicapped. If politics precludes fair treatment of residents of the CBD, then we should follow London's congestion pricing program, where residents of the CBD get a 90% discount. Please conclude your remarks. Additionally, with congestion pricing increasing the cost Thank of all goods trucked into the... Our next speaker is Daniel Ekman, followed by Evan Furrer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry. Uh, good morning. My name is Dan Ekman. Um, I live in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. I'm a native New Yorker. I'm a small business owner. I'm a middle class father of two, and I need my car to earn my living. Not everyone in Manhattan is an investment banker or a web developer. My job involves the use of tools and a ladder. I can't put it on a bicycle, and it's illegal to transport those things on the subway. You want me to pay upwards of $100 a week? That's $5,000 a year. I don't have to feed my children. The MTA wants money. The MTA always wants money. Maybe get it from somewhere else this time. You've got my sales, you've got my sales tax, you've got my state income tax, you've got my city income tax, you've got an MTA surcharge on my vehicle registration and my cell phone bill. I'm pretty sure you've got one on my home phone and my internet service. I haven't checked that recently, but I'm assuming that it's somewhere in the fine print. The city wants to work on congesting. The congestion is a created problem. You showed a graph at the beginning of this that said that since 2010, suddenly, congestion spiked. Well, guess what? In 2011, we went from having 13,000 medallion taxis to having an extra 80,000 Uber drivers. And then Manhattan alone has 350 miles of bike lanes. And you eliminated all the available legal parking for private vehicles pretty much in the central business district, which means that everybody on the road is driving around looking for a parking space. This is a created problem that now we're being asked to pay for. And it's fundamentally unfair. Um, you know, we are talking about people who need money to feed their families. Manhattan represents a massive portion of everyone's income when you live in the greater New York City area. And we can't be held to account for poor planning on the part of the city government. Um, you know, we can't continue to hold basically a war on the middle class. Um, you know, if you want to free up parking then fewer people would be driving around looking for a parking space. If you maybe audited the bike lanes to see whether or not anyone's using those 350 miles of road at a volume that justifies the amount of squeeze that's been created for all the cars that you're now saying are congested, maybe you'd discover that it was actually not a good use of the space. I'm not anti-bike. I have a bike. I love to ride my bike. But the fact is, I know when I'm driving through Manhattan all the time, that those bike lanes are empty and every block is two fewer parking spaces and two fewer parking spaces is two more people circling the block all day looking for a place to put their car where they wind up settling it into a lot where I'm going to go ahead and assume that part of that tax base for the MTA too. So ultimately, this is about blaming the wrong people and holding people to account who don't have the money. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Evan Furrer, followed by our 20th speaker on the list, Stephen Salveson. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Evan. I am a lifelong Manhattan resident. This is my second time testifying on behalf of the Central Business District tolling, which Manhattan so desperately needs. The fact is there are too many cars on the city streets. I live and bike on Manhattan Island and I can testify that the bike lanes are full. There are plenty of cyclists. Whatever the previous guy just said is absolutely untrue. In fact, sidewalks are so congested that I regularly see wheelchairs and, and elderly and disabled people in the bike lanes. In fact, we should be widening sidewalks 
We need to take space away from the cars. We need to fundamentally change how we think about transportation. I'm sorry, not everyone needs a car. There are good doctors in Queens. There are good doctors in Brooklyn. And there are plenty of business opportunities in those boroughs and north of 60th Street as well. I, I, we need this congestion pricing. Please don't give in to these people. Please, we need it, okay? And in fact, I, I'd go as far as to say that the good people of the Bronx, Fordham Road, they could use congestion pricing. What about Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn by, by the Barclays Center? <laughs> people that live there could probably use a road diet and, and congestion pricing as well. So please, we need this. We need it badly. We needed it yesterday. We needed it years ago. So I'm begging you, don't listen to these people. Please give the people of Manhattan what they need. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Salveson, followed by Mingyi Smith. Our next speaker is Mingyi Smith, followed by Quentin Gilbroner. You may begin Hello. your remarks. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mingyi Smith. I am a resident of Lower East Side, Manhattan. I am also a mother of two children, and I am part of a commute group that unfortunately, the Department of Education has not been able to offer our children a ride up to their school. Our children were accepted, um, so I represent three other, fam three other families. Our children were accepted into Tap Young Scholars, which is on the Upper Manhattan. It's a public school. And because we live outside of the transportation zone, we have to actually take our children to school every day by ourselves. The DOE has failed us. I have appealed many times. <laughs> Even though we live in the same district, we cannot take our children on the school bus. So my children, to rely on us to go up and down every day to go to school. This is only just for going to school. So by by charging us this extra congestion pricing, it's just, it's um it's an extra tax on um, again. This is middle middle income families just because we live on Lower East Side. I think you're missing the point of where the wealthy people are living. They're on the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side. They're the investment bankers. We are just regular people. Secondly, my husband's also just, um, he's an artist. So he relies on driving with his equipment um, to film sets. Again, he leaves, where he's, he has to leave, this, leave the city, leave where we live in order to commute to work. So all this tax is doing is just, um, it's, it's, it's just taxing us for no reason. We didn't choose, we didn't choose to move to Lower East Side before this happened. And now this is forcing everyone to pay an extra fee. Secondly, when I was looking at, and there are two points I wanna make. One of the speakers from Queens was excellent on point. Uber is the reason for congestion pricing. Anyone can become an Uber driver or a Lyft driver. If you really wanna restrict traffic, that's where you need to really focus on. Secondly, when I was looking at the presentation earlier, it has said that the you know, maybe there's a thousand people that has really chimed in. We live in an eight million people city. This is not some public outreach. You're failing on public outreach if you're really looking to hear from hear back from from everybody. One thousand out of eight million. That's less than zero point zero one percent. So this is not a public hearing outreach attempt at all. You're not in New York City, certainly not to the people who live here. I appreciate your time and thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Quentin Gilbroner, followed by Leslie Stevens. Our next speaker is Leslie Stevens, followed by Sophia Kakarawa.
Leslie, you may unmute and begin your remarks. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I'm going to leave my camera off just because uh, it seems to be glitching a bit. Um, thank you for listening to my input. I live in New Jersey, unlike most people here, and I do volunteer work specifically to combat climate change in New York City. Um, just this week, a British friend who was visiting uh, visiting New York was told me she was shocked and appalled by how many passenger cars, vans, and trucks are in the city. Um, London's focus is on clean air. In fact, they have these clean air zones. They don't call it congestion pricing anymore. So to the points that some people are making about the MTA, the MTA is, seems to be focused on money as opposed to reducing pollution and, and improving air quality. So I encourage you, that seems to be like an add-on, but I think that's gotta be a very important part of this whole uh, CBDTP. I am, however, strongly recommending uh, that New York City adopt the CBDTP as soon as possible. This congestion pricing plan looks pretty reasonable to me and certainly has a first pass. And I strongly recommend, I have several recommendations. The first is absolutely no exemptions for perhaps two years so that the overall impact on congestion can be examined more across at least a couple of years. Second of all, I do, I am quite empathetic for the families with school children and for the elderly who need medical visits or uh, other people who need medical visits, um, if there is a way to make a daytime exemption for those folks for the period of time they need it, um, perhaps that would at least alleviate some of the issues we've already heard. Um, I'm also concerned number three is about <clears throat> the emissions impact on the Cross Bronx area and specifically on the, the uh, um, near environmental justice communities. Uh, number four is, uh, I also think it's crazy that we have so many Uber drivers in SUVs. I think the SUVs and the large vehicles um, should be treated as a separate category from passenger cars and taxis. Uh, so I think that the SUVs actually should get taxed until they become electric. Please conclude your remarks. Yeah, I'd really like to see um, more focus on. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sophia Kakarala, followed by Brian Fritch. Our next speaker is Brian Fritch, followed by Rocco Lacertosa. Hi, my name is Brian Fritch. I'm a resident of Brooklyn uh, and the father of a three-year-old and 11-month-old who does not own a car. Uh, as such, I'm extremely reliant on our subway system for moving around the city. Hauling two car seats and a stroller into cabs and taking other modes of transportation, simply not possible for me when I'm parenting alone, which has made me dependent on subway stations with elevators, of which we have far too few across the city. Clearly, these accessibility issues are not new and ones that thousands of New York uh, area residents deal with on a daily basis mostly in far more complicated situations than mine. Uh, that's why I was pleased to see uh, building new elevator service in a wide range of stations is a key part of the current MTA capital plan that congestion pricing will help fund, and also that the MTA is committed to making nearly all their stations ADA accessible within the next few decades. I'm also pleased to see signal upgrades, electric buses, and new trains included alongside uh, exciting projects like Penn Station Access. Many of these improvements could significantly be delayed without congestion pricing, and we must invest in public transit now. 
As we near the one year anniversary of, her, of uh, Hurricane Ida tomorrow and the 10 year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy in October, I'm also very hopeful that congestion pricing will help New York City be more environmentally sound and a healthier city that elevates mass transit over polluting cars. This will help improve our air quality and reduce asthma rates for our children, help us achieve with fewer traffic and pedestrian fatalities and reduce emissions that will help us reduce our carbon footprint overall. We desperately need a city, region and world that will ultimately be a healthier place for my kids to live, more resilient to the storms that we are likely to come to see more frequently in the future and one that is more equitable for the millions of New Yorkers that don't own a car and rely on our subway and rail system. That's why I strongly support congestion pricing to help make that vision a reality. Thank you to the MTA and the state uh, for your work moving this project forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rocco Lacertosa, followed by Edward Chiani. Rocco, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, members of the Traffic Mo Mobility Review Board. My name is Rocco Lachertosa. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the New York State Energy Coalition. We serve as the voice of the renewable biodiesel and heating oil industry uh, in the five boroughs of New York City and Nassau and Suffolk counties. I'm testifying today to express the grave concerns among my membership regarding the Central Business District Toll Program, the different tolling structure scenarios for commercial vehicles and trucks as outlined in the environmental assessment and the impact it would have on our industry and by extension, our customers. My members make multiple trips in and out of Manhattan all day long, every day of the year, uh, and it goes up ex exponentially in, in the wintertime during the heating season from October through April. Uh, we deliver with large trucks. We send in service vans to, to uh, uh, repair and replace heating equipment. And again, these are multiple trips uh, every day of, of the year here. Uh, these multiple trips through the Central Business District would equate to increased costs to our companies, which would thus have to be passed on to, to consumers, which no one really wants. This, of course, this outcome benefits no one and certainly is, is not one we wish to implement at a time when the cost of living and the cost of goods are certainly exorbitantly high. We urge the Traffic Mobility Review Board to consider alternative tolling structures for commercial vehicles and trucks who are passing through the CBD for work-related purposes, including but not limited to credits, reasonable and fair discounts or exemptions. As I mentioned, we represent companies that engage in time sensitive emergency work in a timely manner for consumers who are experiencing issues for both commercial and residential locations, similar to the way Con Edison performs emergency work throughout the city for electricity, gas, and steam work. We have performed this work at a number of city and state owned locations, including nursing homes, hospitals, schools, low income housing complexes, and many other facilities that are heated during the cold New York winters. It is our understanding that under Section 1704-A, subsection 3A of the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act, the Tribal Bridge and Tunnel Authority can implement the plan for credits, discounts, and exemptions for tolls paid on bridges and crossings informed by the Traffic Mobility Review Board's recommendations. We respectfully request that the board consider our, rec our request to <laughs> the importance of our work, particularly during emergencies as temperatures become more extreme and deadly and consider exemptions for emergency vehicles and for heating oil, bioheat, and biodiesel trucks to be considered emergency vehicles for the purposes of the CBD tolling program. I thank you for your time and appreciate the opportunity to give my testimony today. Thank you. Our next speaker is Edward Chiani, followed by Arnold Hamilton. Hello, good evening. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, I had a whole bunch of stuff to talk about, and I've been watching for the last couple of days, and there's nothing I'm going to say that you haven't already heard a million times over. So 
I just got to bring up a few little things to reiterate. Uh, there was a guy before that said, don't listen to us, the people who don't, who are against it. And I'm here to say, listen to the people who are for it. Because nobody can give you a better reason of why this is wrong than those people right there. Those people who are for it, that all say go for it, either aren't impacted, or people who hate cars, who walk around five feet from them, they don't work, or they do work, and they work down the block from where they live in the city. I can't afford that. I had to leave the city and come back into Queens for my office because I couldn't afford, well, during the uh, riots, no, I'm sorry, peaceful protests, most of the places I worked had to close down. So now I'm home. I go into the city to do work when I need to drive. I work on computers and networking for small companies. I can't afford the big people. And now I'm gonna have to pay how much more? You got to, to come into Queens, then I might have to go to Brooklyn, then come back into Queens and then into Manhattan. Every time I do that, I gotta pay. I do that on the bridges and the tolls on the tunnels. But you're taxing me to use something that I already paid for. Isn't that a double tax, a triple tax? Isn't that taxation without representation? Because the money's not going to me, who's a car driver, it's going to the MTA. The same people who are going to monitor whether or not I'm driving around and keep me going and, and then turn around and, and I'm going to trust these same people to monitor that. They can't even monitor the subways, right? The switches and everything else. New Yorkers want to help. We, we, we all work together. You want to give more money from us? No problem. When I go register my car, put a surcharge on top of it, but don't charge me every day, every time I drive. And the other thing, really, you want a million dollars? Go ask the Brazier where he put that 1.9 million nobody can find. Or his wife who stole the $850,000. Maybe you should use that to build up your thing. Just think about what you're doing. The MTA doesn't have the right to tax. It says it right there. Let's be reasonable about this. Find other ways to build Please everybody. conclude your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Arnold Hamilton, followed by Peter Treestman. Our next speaker is Peter Treestman, followed by our 30th speaker on the list, Gerald Adams. Our next speaker is Gerald Adams, followed by Michelle Petil Petilke. Gerald, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. <clears throat> you may I want to thank everyone. We can hear you. Good, good morning. I want to thank the panel for the work that they put into the into the assessment and its tenants and what it would produce and the hypotheses behind some of the positive things that could come out of this. However, um, as a Yonkers resident commuting into Manhattan every day, uh, naturally I'm going to be against this, right? This is another cost or another charge that I have to pay. So I'm just trying to look at it from a positive lens. Um, in my last call, I asked that you provided some sort of a discount for electric vehicles, since they do um, honor part of the initiatives or, or, or promote some of the initiatives that you're putting forth, which is noise, uh, noise reduction and uh, you know cleaner air, right? L less CO2 emissions, right? At a rate of 50% 50, 50 for crossing those tolls. 
for electric vehicles. By doing that, you will be promoting electric vehicles. Um, you'll also be um, broadening the horizons of the MTA to, so they could say, hey, look, we're promoting greener skies, right? But I, I challenge you to look at this uh, skeptically, right, or critically, rather. So one of the tenets of congestion pricing is that it will reduce traffic. We do not know that. We don't know that definitively. Your hypothesis is that traffic will be reduced, but you don't know that um, simply because you're, you're not able to get into the minds of the riders. Many of the people will still continue to come into New York. They will. I would get, I, I'm figuring over 95%. So it, it's, it's, it's not going to be a rate at which it's going to actually be influential in the way that you're hoping it would be. Another tenet of congestion pricing is that it will create cleaner air. We also do not see the science on how that will come about simply because if the toll is paid at the same amount or the same amount of vehicles are passing through the cordon zone or the, the zone to be tolled that are already passing through today, then it, there will not be cleaner air. It will simply be the same amount of gas vehicles going through there. So another tenant is that congestion pricing will raise money for the MTA. And that is true. That's exactly true. And you can expect that there are going to be many lawsuits. This congestion pricing will not go into effect until two, three years after you put it through because of the disparate impact on people of color, disabled people, and so many other people uh, that unfortunately this will not be able to move forward. Please conclude your remarks. So thank, thank you. you so much. Our next speaker is Michelle Pedaliki, followed by Andrew Grossman. Michelle Pedaliki. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. My video for some reason is not working, so I apologize. But good morning. My name is Michelle Pedalitsky, and I own Panorama Tours, a small woman-owned bus company in New Jersey. We're located in Bergen County, which is triangled exactly 10 miles from the George Washington Bridge and 10 miles from the Lincoln Tunnel. I'm testifying today to ask that while working out the parameters of this program, that you recognize that all buses, both private and public, are a part of the solution to the goals you wish to accomplish, such as reducing congestion and improving air quality. Buses are not contributors to the, pro to the problem. Therefore, I ask that an exemption for all buses be built into the final CBD tolling program. Let's talk about congestion. I took this opportunity to put together for you real data from my small company. Although we predominantly service a New Jersey market, in a 12-month time frame, Panorama took 533 unique trips, averaging 47 passengers into the CBD. If each passenger decided to drive themselves into the CBD for their trip for that show or for that restaurant, it would have been an additional 25,051 vehicles in the district. The demographic of those 25,051 passengers stretched across all socioeconomic classes, all races, and all religions. It included all ages from babies to seniors, and because our fleet consists of ADA accessible vehicles, we were able to bring disabled passengers into the district that otherwise may not have been able to get there. We transported residents as well as visitors, both domestic and international, without adding additional cars or worse yet, drivers that may be unfamiliar with driving New York City streets. If an additional expense such as a toll would be added to private buses, the cost may not be advantageous to the riding public, ultimately deterring them from using this service. Now let's move to air quality. Buses today are very different from what they were 20 years ago when I entered this business. Buses have always been recognized as being one of the most fuel efficient modes of transportation, getting approximately 280 passenger miles per gallon versus a car that gets approximately 30. Today's buses, however, include technology that does even more. Every bus is manufactured with an engine that requires diesel exhaust fluid to run. This fluid breaks down harmful emissions into non-hazardous nitrogen and water, therefore reducing a bus's emissions by 90%. In addition to the DEF, every bus has diesel particulate filters designed to capture and store exhaust soot, keeping
keeping it from being expelled into the air that we breathe. These are not the old smoky buses that one may remember from years ago. To wrap up, I hope I was able to provide you with real examples of how buses, both private and public, are helpful to the success of the CBD tolling program. To, to make sure that private buses continue to be a viable service for the public, an exemption must be made for those vehicles as this program is deployed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Grossman, followed by Darren Gitlitz. Our next speaker is Darren Gitlitz, followed by Dylan Yen. Darren, you may begin your remarks. Darren, you are unmuted, but we cannot hear you. Darren, because we cannot hear you, we will move to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dylan Yen, followed by Mir Marietta Vieira. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, sorry, I can't uh, join my video. It's um, technical difficulties. Uh, I am in favor of the congestion pricing program. However, in principle, uh, having lived in London and Singapore. However, I don't believe that the implementation of this program as prescribed by the MTA is quite frankly, a great idea. Um, as a lot of the other speakers have mentioned, a lot of these middle-class families, small businesses, what have you rely on um, their cars or their commercial vehicles to come into Manhattan to perform essential services. Thus, um, and there is no other alternative. I believe the gentleman who said uh, it is illegal for him to bring a ladder onto the subway. And quite frankly, it'd be quite impractical to bring such a thing onto the subway. So in principle, I am in favor of it as I can see the results of it. However, the implementation and the infrastructure that currently exists in the city does not actually support this kind of thing. Uh, furthermore, I don't, furthermore, I think that this, I am worried that this will turn into another billion dollar slush fund used to bail out upstate ski resorts that um, has historically happened before. So in summary, I don't think that supporting this would be a good idea in principle. However, I believe that in the future, if, if we go back to the drawing board and establish the infrastructure needed to implement such a program, then I would support it. Thank you for your time, I will yield. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marietta Vieira, followed by Nicole Love. Our next speaker is Nicole Love, followed by David Gazels. Our next speaker is David Gazels, followed by Hassan El Helwa. Our next speaker is Hassan El Helwa, followed by Melody Bryant. Our next speaker is Melody Bryant, followed by our 40th speaker on the list. Sam Perozzolo. Melody, you may unmute and begin your remarks. Thank you. And thanks to the members of this panel for holding these hearings and taking my testimony today. I'm begging you to institute congestion pricing as soon as possible. It's done in other cities. New York can do it too, and we really need it. 
The planet is telling us right now that we need to do it. How many 90 degree days in a row do we need to experience? I live in Chelsea, which to me is the central living district. I'm a strong supporter of congestion pricing and would back the choice of column G in the recap of tolling scenarios. Although this would exempt taxis, although this would not exempt taxis an industry that is un unconscionably affected by the introduction of for hire vehicles, it's the most responsible environmental alternative. And it's only fair to the rest of us considering who's driving. As much as they complain, statistics have shown that drivers earn twice the amount of people riding transit. Since the MTA's own study shows that 85% of people already commute by transit, we're talking about a loud minority who drive into the city or within the city at will, or vested interests like Easy Pass, which has been trying to influence our electeds. Many outside the city can park and ride, but they choose not to. And it's ironic that their electeds whine about being in transit deserts that they themselves could vote to institute a transit for. They care nothing for the environment in Manhattan, which they are despoiling, nor the residents in it. I doubt they would welcome a million cars a day in their neighborhoods as we have. As it is, we now have 100,000 additional cars in our streets since before the pandemic. Ubers are a big part of that. And drivers are increasingly enraged and crazy. We live with this. They jump the curb on a regular basis and murder us. They run lights. They block crosswalks and drive us into traffic. And traffic deaths are higher now than they were before Vision Zero was institute, instituted. Meanwhile, the world is going off a cliff because of carbon emissions, and the greatest single percentage of that is coming from private cars. In a city with the biggest transportation network in the nation, it's absurd that we live in this scenario. The opposition objects to paying as much as $23 to enter the city at peak. We, in turn, are asking that they pay that fee to discourage their driving and mitigate a fraction of the cost it incurs on the rest of us. Asthma, lung cancer, learning disabilities from lead, stink, noise, aggression, and theft of our public space and traffic deaths. The answer is not to let these drivers steamroll over the rest of us, but to make transit so convenient and attractive that even they will prefer to use it to the hassle of driving into the city. For city drivers with kids or elderly, we have taxis, which even if you took five a day, would cost less than having a car and paying for parking and gas. Beyond carve-outs for people with disabilities, there should be no carve-outs in congestion pricing. Column G comes as close to that as possible, Congestion pricing should happen as fast as possible. Please, we need this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sam Pirazzolo, followed by Louise Torres. Sam, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Sam Pirazzolo. I'm a lifelong Staten Islander. Um, and I kind of have to chuckle a little bit when I was listening to some of the legislators speaking earlier um, today. So first, let me say thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, but I'd really like to direct my comments to my fellow New Yorkers. Um, it was funny to hear the legislators all say that they kind of want to get an exemption for their people. Um, as a future, potential future legislator, I kind of have to agree. I would like to help you get that exemption also, except I think we need to get an exemption for all New Yorkers, not just for your New Yorkers. Just like red light cameras and speed, light, uh, uh, speed cameras had nothing to do with safety, congestion pricing really has nothing to do with congestion and everything to do with pricing. You know, we're, we're talking about this MTA board, and I don't mean to insult anyone, but this MTA board is appointed by elected officials. New York City voters have the opportunity to stop this by the people that you elect. Whether congestion prices ha pricing happens or not, this is really just an opportunity to warm you up. So instead of having a $23 toll, maybe we'll have an $8 toll, and everybody should be relieved because it's not the $8 you know, or the $23 that it was supposed to be. The bottom line is congestion pricing was a bad idea 10 years ago. It's a bad idea today, and it will be a bad idea in the future. Even the MTA, I don't know the studies you showed earlier, but even um, the newspapers and the media have been saying that it does not show any effect that there's going to reduce congestion, it's going to reduce greenhouse emissions. All it's going to do is continue to pick the pockets of every New Yorker now. On Staten Island, we've lived with this plight for a long time. We've been paying a toll to go to work and come back, you know, go to and from work. This is really just another tax, just like a speed camera, just like a red light camera. 
So I want everybody to understand that this board is appointed by your local politicians. Your local politicians have the ability to stop this and you need to put the squeeze on them. Congestion pricing is a bad idea and I will fight against it every single day I can. Thank you so much. I'm gonna yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Louise Torres followed by Bill Feinberg. Our next speaker is Bill Feinberg followed by Meyer Flores. Our next speaker is Meyer Flores followed by Thomas Miller. Our next speaker is Thomas Miller followed by Cressida Connolly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm Thomas Miller. I'm a resident of Hell's Kitchen in the CBD. I've raised my family, four kids, two of whom are still at home with us here for quite some time. I do own a car and I have garaged that car ever since I moved to Hell's Kitchen almost 40 years ago or so. I think while we are very ambivalent about the congestion pricing problem, because if you walk down the street from our apartment to 49th and 9th Avenue any afternoon, you see the problem in action. Thousands of cars jammed, gridlocked streets, cross town, can't get there. It's, it's awful and it's gotten a lot worse. However, the implementation of the plan, I think is quite unfair to us residents of the CBD. So we use our car not to run around Manhattan in the CBD, but to get out of Manhattan, quite frankly. But does that mean when we come back to our home, I'm gonna be taxed or told for going the three blocks from the West Side Highway to our garage on West 50th Street? It makes no sense at all. We're already paying an enormous amount of money just to garage the car. And of course the property, uh, the city parking tax kicks in. Now there's a simple solution for exempting CBD residents like myself who garage their cars, keep them off the streets. We're not even looking for a parking space. And that is, to exempt everyone who has a New York City parking tax exemption certificate automatically. We're putting our cars in the garage during the week. We're not using them then. We're getting out of town, frankly, on the weekend, and that's it. So CBD residents, I think, should be fully exempted, and those who don't park their cars in the garage should still get an exemption, and you can easily do that by syncing up with the vehicle registration information that's already on file with New York State. Secondly, it's clear that the real problem with congestion is caused largely, not uniquely, by vehicles for hire. You benchmark 2010 as the uh, date when there was relatively little congestion compared to today. Well, guess what? In 2010, there was no Uber. It was incorporated in San Francisco in 2011. And since then, the vehicle for hire number of rides per day have gone from zero in 2010 to 600,000 per day, according to the TLC's own statistics this year. So if you walk around during a congestion, you'll see the TC plates everywhere. And we see them all the time. So the, unfortunately, while this is not a, a job protection, it's a congestion reduction hearing. Uh, Uber and all the vehicle for hire drivers uh, or companies need to be taxed more for their licenses. And Uber and those companies should provide the city with information about how much time each and every one of their drivers spends within the CBD uh, during the work week. And they know that because that's how their, their app works. They know where their drivers are at all times for how much time and the city should get that information. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, is Chrisita Connolly, followed by Muhammad Islam. Our next speaker is Muhammad Islam, followed by Gray Wolf Richards. Our next speaker is Gray Wolf Richards, followed by Nomi Castillo. Our next speaker is Nomi Castillo, followed by Navina Kasich. Our next speaker is Navina Kosick, followed by Tony Malone. Our next speaker and 50th on the list is Tony Malone, followed by Patricia O'Rourke. 
Hi, um, thanks so much for having this hearing. Uh, my name is Tony Malone. I've lived in New York City for 22 years, currently reside in Brooklyn. I'm a father of two kids in elementary school. I'm very disappointed to hear some elected officials speaking in opposition to this program, because it's clear that our city is in a traffic crisis with rising numbers of deaths and injuries from crashes. And it's clear that our world is in a climate crisis as we see in the news every day. Maintaining the status quo is not an option. If your area doesn't have good transit options, your representatives should be pushing for those, things like bus rapid transit, rather than doubling down on car commuting. I want congestion pricing because I want a city where my kids can safely bike two miles to their school, where our streets and even our sidewalks aren't choked with cars every day. I want us to meet our climate goals and to cut air pollution that causes asthma in so many kids. And I wanna reduce the thousands of horrific injuries and deaths drivers cause on our streets every year. Congestion pricing is an important step towards less driving and a more livable city for everyone. I'm still in physical therapy after a raging driver assaulted me six months ago. He ran me off the road and beat me up. I was riding a city bike and I confronted him about parking in the bike lane. I don't recommend confronting drivers. I should have filed a 311 report from a safe distance instead. Um, the cops never caught that driver because he had one of those opaque license plate covers um, that drivers use to beat speed cameras and tolls. That's another problem we need to solve. Um, but back to congestion pricing, for the few people who actually need to drive to lower Manhattan, like a plumber, a carpenter, a professional harpist, um, they probably come out ahead too under this program um, because they'll be able to book more work and have more free time um, when we reduce congestion and travel times and get solo commuters um, to use other options. And with the money congestion pricing raises, we can improve MTA service so the majority of New Yorkers who don't own cars can get around more easily. Um, I owned a car the first 10 years I lived in New York City. Um, I thought I needed it as a freelance musician, but my life improved so much when I got rid of my car. I saved money and now I never have to worry about where I'm gonna park and when I need to move the car. Um, my neighbors benefit too from a little less pollution and a little less congestion. Um, it's hard to give up your most expensive personal possession, which is also a status symbol in our culture. But if we want a safer, healthier city, we need to use every tool to discourage driving and car ownership. And we can't give except exceptions to city workers' personal cars. Um, our city should set an example by starting with its own workforce and discouraging driving. Congestion pricing is an essential step to getting us to a better future. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patricia O'Rourke, followed by Stephen Graham. Our next speaker is Stephen Graham, followed by Jonathan DeCamp. Our next speaker is Jonathan DeCamp, followed by Alberto Alamo. Jonathan, you may begin your remarks. Uh, good morning. My name is Jonathan DeCamp, and I'm the vice president of DeCamp Bus Lines in Montclair, New Jersey. DeCamp Bus Lines provides motor coach commuter services to Northeast New Jersey and New York City residents. Prior to the ban pandemic, we carried over 6,500 daily passengers between New Jersey and the Port Authority bus terminal. In addition to motor coach commuter services, we also provide motor coach charter services, taking groups to the many tourist attractions in and around New York City. First, I would like to say that I support congestion pricing. I support anything we can do to reduce the number of individual cars on the roads in New York City streets. However, I do not support tolling buses. Buses should be exempt all buses at all times should be exempt from congestion pricing. Buses do precisely what the law intends to do. They take cars off city streets, reduce the carbon footprint, all without compromising economic benefits. Stockholm, London, and Singapore congestion pricing programs recognize full-size buses as part of the solution and not a part of the problem, and therefore exempted from paying the congestion pricing fee. I urge the panel to follow their lead. We should do everything within our powers to incentivize the, incentivize the uses of buses and encourage commuters and visitors to New York City to leave their cars at home. 
The last thing we should be doing is discouraging the use of mass transit by adding burdensome new costs of bus travel. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alberto Alamo, followed by George Stonebelly. Our next speaker is George Stonebelly, followed by Elizabeth Adams. My name is George Stonbelly. I've been involved in the business, political, cultural, philanthropic, and civic life of New York City for more than 70 years. As an automobile driver in our city for more than 50 of those years. In spite of that, I'm very much in favor. I'm very much in favor um, of uh, congestion pricing. Before I present my comments about congestion pricing, I'd like to share a few observations with the committee. One, since the early 2000s, New York City has added almost 30,000 new black cars, yellow and green cabs to our streets, most of which wind up in the CBD. At the same time, the bottom has dropped out of, out of any enforcement of double parking, no standing in bus lanes, the commercial vehicle ban on certain avenues and roadways and the blocking of intersections, blocking the box. <clears throat> Why have these measures been taken? And, and, and they are certainly in conflict with the effort to reduce traffic congestion in the CBD. So it would be very important uh, along with uh, uh, implementing uh, congestion pricing that we go back to the basics of enforcement and, and look at reducing the number of black cars um, uh, that, that, uh, that, are, that are clogging our streets. Um, I'm strongly in favor of congestion pricing with some caveats. I believe that the boundaries are going to create significant problems of pollution and congestion in the fringe areas surrounding the 60th Street zone in the north. I believe that a more equitable and realistic zone should be the entire island of Manhattan, or at least a buffer zone starting at 96th Street in the north uh, from east to the west side. All, uh, all bridges currently free should be tolled and drivers from those boroughs and the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut suburb should receive a credit uh, on their congestion pricing fees. Thank you very much. By the way, I've been very impressed with the quality of the, the speakers that have uh, uh, that have uh, uh, made their comments and the civility uh, and the tone of them. And I want to congratulate all of them, as well as the committee for, for paying attention and listening to uh, all their concerns in the great New York tradition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Adams, followed by Kiala Montgomery. Good morning, I'm Elizabeth Adams with Transportation Alternatives. For cleaner air, safer streets, and better transit, we need congestion pricing to be implemented as quickly and efficiently as possible with minimum exemptions and factoring in environmental justice needs. I wanna be clear about who is currently bearing the brunt of our city's transportation challenges. The vast majority of New Yorkers, millions of people every day from every borough trying to get to work or school or the doctor, have to deal with waiting for a bus that is stuck in traffic congestion or a subway that has lost service or has no elevator access. This is about rebalancing the scales for all of us. We are a city of almost 9 million people. We simply cannot base an entire transit system around cars. It is unsustainable, especially in the age of the climate crisis. New Yorkers deserve service they can count on, yet our policies have prioritized cars over the basic needs of transit riders, putting us behind in critical investments for better bus, subway, pedestrian, and biking infrastructure. We also cannot be short-sighted about the environmental consequences here. Transportation is the number two source of emissions across New York. 
The only way we'll effectively meet our mandated climate change goals is by dramatically shifting off our current reliance on vehicles and making it possible for all New Yorkers to access affordable, reliable, and sustainable transportation. Without congestion pricing, the consequences to New Yorkers are severe. We would see more subway fare increases and transit delays, even greater pollution and asthma rates as extreme weather and heat intensifies, and even less repairs and upgrades that New Yorkers need. It is imperative that the state implement the program quickly and with minimal exemptions in order to maximize effectiveness. Carving out city employees, for example, would not even make the program legally viable. It is also critical that plans center communities that have faced the brunt of environmental injustice in its solutions. Congestion pricing can have a significant impact on reducing congestion and emissions in our city if it's enacted effectively, and it must be part of a larger plan to incentivize more sustainable transit methods and deprioritize unnecessary car usage. Congestion pricing is not a be all and end all solution. Its success will depend on our ability to fast track infrastructure for alternatives to driving. This must include more bike share docks and connections to transit, protected bike lanes and greenways, and dedicated bus only lanes to improve speed and service. With major reductions in congestion, the possibilities for a public space are significant. Our city can and must reimagine the 6,300 miles of streets and 3 million free parking spaces for better public space, transit, health, and climate uses. And that is how we support the needs of all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kiala Montgomery, followed by William Delaney. Our next speaker is William Delaney, followed by Rosemary Chatterton. Our next speaker is Rosemary Chatterton, followed by our 60th speaker on the list, Cullen McGraw. Our next speaker is Cullen McGraw, followed by Adam Alberin. Our next speaker is Adam Alberin, followed by Dario Cremades. Our next speaker is Dario Cremades, followed by Daryl G. Fulton. Our next speaker is Daryl G. Fulton, followed by Donovan Hunt. Our next speaker is Donovan Hunt, followed by Craig Hudson. Our next speaker is Craig Hudson, followed by Haydar Akbar. Our next speaker is Haydar Akbar, followed by Jonathan Tinio. Our next speaker is Jonathan Tinio, followed by Warren Green. Our next speaker is Warren Green, followed by Jonathan Marcus. Our next speaker is Jonathan Marcus, followed by our 70th speaker on the list, Kevin Ritter. Jonathan, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. Um, you may have something else connected to your audio. We cannot hear your remarks. We'll have to come back to you because we can't hear your remarks. Our next speaker is Kevin Ritter, followed by Rodney Hughes. Our next speaker is Rodney Hughes, followed by Deborah Baldwin. Our next speaker is Deborah Baldwin, followed by Eric Diaz. Deborah, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hi, my name is Deborah Baldwin. I live in Midtown East, and during my 20 plus years on East 36th Street, I've watched a once quiet residential Murray Hill 
turn into a noisy gridlock mass of hot, snarling, bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. The streets are meaner, less safe than they used to be. Come by some morning, and I'll give you a tour of Midtown East's new signature attraction, the Blocked Box. Pedestrians have learned to thread their way between clashing bumpers and fuming tailpipes. As congestion builds along major corridors like 3rd Avenue, you can feel the tempers and temperatures rising. New Yorkers need relief from the crushing congestion we see not only in Midtown, but throughout Manhattan, from the narrow, congested streets of Chinatown to our formerly splendid avenues, which have now turned into gridlocked highways. I'm here today to urge Governor Hochul and our transit leaders on behalf of citizens like me and on behalf of the organizations I support, Riders Alliance, Transportation Alternatives, and others who have worked so hard to help make New York a smoother running city to help make the safe streets safer, greener, and more fluid. I'm here to urge, urge every one of us to create a forward-looking city where all New Yorkers, not just drivers, are comfortable using the streets and where buses and bikes, as well as pedestrians, can travel quickly and safely. Congestion pricing has an impressive track record, and the concept is simple. When it comes to taming traffic, nothing else has been shown to work as effectively as a no exemptions, pay as you drive policy. Please make it possible for New Yorkers to walk along streets where the heat, honking and air pollution thrown off by vehicles are brought down to bearable levels where traffic jams and crashes are the exception, not the rule. Think of the heat and gridlock we just saw this summer. Do we want our city to be greener, healthier and better functioning next year or noisier more congested and even harder to navigate. With revenue from congestion pricing, fewer vehicles to block the way, buses could finally fulfill their potential as one of the nimblest and most cost-effective forms of mass transit we have. The subway system could benefit from 21st century technology. Is there a valid argument against congestion pricing? I can't think of one. Thank you for listening and thanks in advance for joining the fight to make New York a cooler, greener, more livable place for all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eric Diaz, followed by Michael King. Our next speaker is Michael King, followed by Rachel Minter. Our next speaker is Rachel Minter, followed by Jody Stewart. Mute. Okay, I got that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, no cameras. Too bad. I'm, I'm losing all the effect. Okay, my name is Rachel Minter. Um, I grew up in New York. I lived in four of the five boroughs. I have no organizational um, affiliation, except I guess I'm here as a crip, which is less politically correct than saying a person with a disability, but it kind of cuts to the chase. Ah, there I am. Um, you might be surprised then if I'm gonna say that I really support the goals of the program to cut auto emissions, to raise funds, to work on the infrastructure of public transit. I grew up taking public transit and I'm a great believer in it. We also need to replenish the fares that were lost during COVID. And it is a great goal of this program. Having said that, however, when you become disabled, you give up a lot of things, you have no control over your day-to-day -day life and you don't have the luxury of taking principled positions about things if it's going to really affect you personally, physically, financially. And that's how I find myself in this situation. I have MS, multiple sclerosis, which is a debilitating neurological disease. I walk with a cane because my left leg drags behind me. Um, I lose my balance. I have cognitive impairment. I haven't worked in five and a half years because I can't really um, deal with complex information. This is making me very like, agitated trying to do this. I used to do this for a living, but I can't do it anymore. Anyway, originally I was gonna come in and what I wanted to talk about was the enabling legislation, the statutory language about qualifying vehicles, transporting people with disabilities. 
because I didn't see anything about them. Then last night, I found the assessment. I found all these interviews, and I realized that there have been some stabs at trying to define what that's going to mean. Obviously, it's going to be an accessory, but there were also a couple of footnotes and places where they talked about state disability license plates. I don't have one. I better find out. But I'm so alarmed at where this is going, and particularly people say no exemptions, you know, no prisoners. Um, I'm going to explain how transportation choices are kind of influenced by MS. It's an unpredictable disease. You don't know how you're going to feel until you get up in the morning. Some days it is such an effort to get out of bed and take a shower, rub a washcloth all over me that I don't even go down to the mail. Oh shit. All right. You can't use accessory if you have MS. There is too, there are too many rules. You have to wait 45 minutes. You can't just go to the pharmacy and pick up a prescription because you have to wait 45 minutes for a return trip. If I go into Manhattan to see a doctor, I combine it with a trip to the supermarket or to pick up a special product that I need. If I had to do that with accessory, it's three trips, there and back, there and back. So I'm actually contributing to emissions. Plus, Please there conclude is your data. remarks. Oh, okay. Never enough time. And you know, do you get to put things in writing or I sort of shot it by this? Too much to say, too little time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Assemblymember Harvey Epstein. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. You can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, thank you for taking the time to, to do these, all these hearings and to, to, to really focus on the needs of New Yorkers as an assembly member who I represent the 74th Assembly District, which is the east side of Manhattan. My district's entirely within the congestion zone and I voted for congestion pricing and I support this moving forward. I think it, the, it's critical now that you know, we need to deal with the traffic and the environmental crisis we're living in right now. And I, you know, I really urge you to just to consider a few things as you move forward this and things that we had understood when we voted on this legislation. One is uh, around the, the time period and really to stagger the cost related to rush hour and non rush hour traffic. There's a lot, I hear a lot from talk from constituents who live in the district and they're going away, potentially they may have a vehicle and they're leaving on the weekends. And the cost shouldn't be equal coming into Manhattan during rush hour and trying to come home at the end of the weekend. So we should, uh, whatever tone we put together for congestion pricing should really reflect that reality. In addition, we've heard a lot about parking outside the congestion zone and that people may end up parking in lower in Brooklyn or above 60th Street in Manhattan. And we really need to think about ways to avoid people trying to park, quote, for free on the street with alternate side street parking outside of the congestion zone in an attempt to avoid it. Uh, I, I, I will work on and encourage you to look at uh, residential parking as a tool to combat that problem. In addition, I know in the legislation that we passed, we had a residential exempt exemption for people who make less than $60,000. It's really critical for our, our low income residents to be able to, if they need a vehicle to be able to pay, uh, uh, be free and for paying, but I also push for a residential exemption that wasn't outside $60,000. To be honest, I think it, it's really regressive because $60,000 for a family of four, very different for $60,000 for a single adult. I encouraged us then, I will continue to fight for tying uh, the residential exemption to an area median income that reflects the diversity and you know for different family sizes, it's really critical. Um, and it's really overall the responsibility of all of us to ensure that we reduce traffic and really come to the terms with what we passed with the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. I really believe that congestion pricing will uh, reduce the traffic flow into Manhattan and hopefully reduce the traffic flow around the city. And if we need to do more to reduce the traffic flow outside of the congestion zone, I really will encourage and work for all of us to do that together. I believe this is a really important tool in our tool belt, and we have a lot more to do to deal with our climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jody Stewart, followed by Christine Berthe. 
Our next speaker is Christine Verte, followed by Juten Horstman. Hello, I'm Christine Verte. Can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I represent Check Peds, a 15 year old nonprofit focused on pedestrian safety on the west side of Manhattan. We fully support congestion pricing. Our neighborhood of Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen experienced the third worst air quality in the city, right behind the Bronx. And this is due to the volume of Lincoln Tunnel traffic that spills over daily in our, in our area. In 2021 and again in 2022, Manhattan Community Board 4 requested that drastic measure be taken to alleviate the extraordinary traffic congestion and air quality due to the considerable increase in Lincoln Tunnel bond vehicular volume since the beginning of the COVID recovery. Every day, seven days a week for a total of eight hours, morning and evenings, the community endures gridlock, honking, and LC hair. Businesses, instead of welcoming traffic, are negatively affected as no one will sit outside in the open restaurant along our main street, the Ninth Avenue corridor. And the bus line that serves thousands of low-income New Yorkers on Ninth Avenue is extremely slow and unreliable because of the Lincoln Tunnel traffic. The M11 won the Pokey Award. So it is critical that the congestion pricing scheme includes sufficient fees to reduce the number of New Jersey drivers. Clearly, this is not double tolling since the tolls apply to different stretches or road. No credit or low crossing credits are the best and perhaps a compromise would entail the Port Authority to raise toll and dedicate the funds to improving mass transit in New Jersey and Rockland County. It would be deeply inequitable if congestion pricing improved the east side, but not the west side. Our population has increased by 50% in 20 years. We beg you to give serious consideration to this issue. Our 130,000 taxpaying and hardworking residents must be able to use their streets without being choked or run over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Juten Horseman, followed by Jim Wright. Good afternoon. My name is Juten Horseman, Director for Planning and Development, and I'm speaking on behalf of Bronx Borough President Vanessa Gibson, which I'll read a letter that will be entered as testimony. The CBDTP, better known as congestion pricing, will be a benefit to the greater New York City metropolitan area. The overall impact of the CBDTP will be positive and will ultimately cause uh, for an overall reduction of mobile air toxins across the greater New York City region. However, the program proposed program does increase air pollution within an environmental justice area of the Bronx. As the Bronx has taken steps forward with reducing carbon emissions, this is a step back for the neighborhood surrounding the Cross Bronx Expressway due to the increased air pollution from vehicles on the highway. The MTA's report notes an overall decline in air pollution across the city and region, but an increase for the Bronx. This is primarily due to increased vehicle miles traveled on the Cross Bronx Expressway, and the reality is there would be an additional increase on other highways, including the Bruckner Expressway and Major Deegan through secondary transportation pressure, even if the methodology, methodology doesn't show an increase. The CBDTP is therefore an issue affecting health, equity, and environmental justice issues for these communities, which have taken on more than their fair share for decades. In order to have my support for the CBDTP, these Bronx neighborhoods need to see direct benefits that will result in a reduction of mobile air toxins. The best solution would be prioritizing the capital funding for the Capney of the Cross Bronx Expressway. Money was allocated as part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill as Senator Chuck Schumer and Congressman Richie Torres were both instrumental in getting passed, but the project may need additional resources and it should be prioritized by the city and state. It is also important that the deck on top of the Cross Bronx provide additional long-term benefits, such as providing green space or by creating a public transportation light rail line. This line could provide an east-west railway link stretching from Washington Heights to Parkchester, creating connections across eight subway lines and serving nearly 600,000 people that live in adjacent neighborhoods. In addition to fully funding the Cross Bronx decking, further priority should be given to projects that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions, such as providing free buses across the entire 
our city, or at a minimum within Bronx environmental justice areas harmed by the CBDTP to further incentivize public transportation options for residents that need it the most. The city should also pass electro electric vehicle support legislation that will remove hurdles for where electric vehicle charging stations can be located and provide opportunities for electric vehicle investment across the city. This will encourage the transmit transition of ele to electric vehicles, which will be key to reducing emissions within the city. Other ways the city can support these environmental justice areas include prioritizing and further incentivizing renewable energy bonuses for building upgrades, the Bronx's many buildings with low income residents, and the city needs to support inv improvements to these buildings in order for the building upgrades to happen. For NYCHA buildings, the city needs to prioritize and fully fund conversions to pact in the RAD programming while also providing enough capital to add renewable energy upgrades. Well, I want to focus uh, my testimony on the Cross Bronx. I also want to acknowledge the impact this will have on many uh, workers such as livery, taxi, and cab drivers since inter Manhattan and shouldn't be penalized for it. I acknowledge the CBDTP will be a benefit for much of the city, but the Bronx has been burned by the Cross Bronx since its construction under the notion that is good for the region as a whole. With the CBDTP Please adding your remarks. to the historical burden, it is time for the Bronx receives major capital improvements that will provide real health benefits in these environmental justice communities. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jim Wright, followed by Hindi Schachter. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, my name is Jim Wright, a transportation architect, testifying on behalf of the American Institute of Architects, New York, also known as AIA New York a professional organization that represents New York's architects employed in government agencies, private firms, and academia. AIA New York has supported a central business district congestion relief program since it was proposed in 2007, 2008, and advocated for passage of the current program by the New York State Legislature in 2019. Several alternatives have been evaluated in the current environmental assessment, including no action, of these, the, only the Manhattan CBD zone-based tolling program, option T4, meets the objectives mandated by the legislature. AIA New York supports option T4. We further support minimizing exemptions to the tolls as, as was recommended by the legislature, only for emergency and service vehicles, public transit, and licensed ADA handicapped vehicles, which will keep the daily toll costs lower while generating the required minimum revenue for the MTA. We also support variable pricing strategies that calibrate toll prices according to travel demand. These strategies have proven to be the most effective way to control congestion and its associated negative impacts. We recognize the environmental assessment identified several adverse impacts to low-income drivers, as well as envir environmental justice neighborhoods that need to be addressed for the CP program to be fair and equitable. The legislature has provided that households with an annual income less than 60,000 would be eligible for a state tax credit to offset the cost of tolls. We support this approach to reduce adver adverse impacts to vulnerable populations. The EA also projects that the CP program will result in additional trucks traveling through the South Bronx, especially on the Cross Bronx Expressway. Inexplicably, the EI then concludes there will be no adverse effects from truck diversions so no mitigation measures are needed, merely calling for an air quality monitoring for two years to determine if the projections are accurate. We strongly disagree with this passive approach, given the long history of polluting emissions caused by non-destination traffic through the South Bronx that negatively impacts the health of surrounding neighborhoods, it is imperative that effective traffic mitigation measures be implemented at the start of the program. Finally, we want to highlight several MTA capital programs that will be funded by the 1 billion per year revenue generated by congestion pricing. Funding the MTA system-wide ADA accessibility commitment to make 95% of non-compliant stations accessible by 2055, accelerating the signal replacement program, expanding and improving bus service to underserved neighborhoods, and accelerating the transit transition to zero carbon Please energy. Please conclude your remarks. We appreciate the opportunity to express our members' support for the congestion pricing program and look forward to the many benefits that were result from its implementation. Our next speaker is Hindi Schachter, followed by our 80th speaker on the list, Siva Giamaras.
Hindi, you may begin your remarks. Great. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. I'm Hindi Schachter. I'm a steering committee member of Families for Safe Streets. I enthusiastically support a congestion pricing program that will work to have fewer tragedies on our streets along with a rejuvenated mass transit system. How do we get there? We don't simply get there by having a lukewarm diluted congestion pricing program. And therefore, I will spend my brief time debunking the need for certain exemptions. One, as a senior citizen, cyclist, and pedestrian, I shout out, stop stereotyping old people. Stop talking as if all old people will be moribund if they cannot bring their cars constantly into Manhattan. Think about the plurality of the senior citizen community. Many senior citizens, senior citizen cyclists, the vast number of senior citizen pedestrians are actually going to be the people who benefit most from a saner traffic system. Two, let's not give exemptions to people who live in the congestion pricing district. They too are going to be among the most important beneficiaries of this program. I live on the edge of what will become the congestion pricing district. And right now, we are inundated with cars. As Debbie Baldwin pointed out, there are no crossing spots. People cannot cross the street because the cars take up the spot where uh, a human being able to walk. So I see that I have 27 seconds left. I will leave it here and give those seconds to other people. My parting words are a strong system will get the, re the results you want. A system ladled with inconsistent un unnecessary exemptions is simply counterproductive. We need- Please conclude things. your remarks. Concluded. Thank you. Our next speaker is Siva Giamaris, followed by Gordon Watt. Our next speaker is Gordon Watt, followed by our 82nd speaker on the list, Polly Brewster. Our next speaker is Polly Brewster, followed by Donna Bartolini. Our next speaker is Donna Bartolini, followed by Michael Goals. Our next speaker is Michael Goals, followed by Beta V Desai. Our next speaker is Beta V Desai, followed by Peter Dinalfo. Our next speaker is Peter Dinalfo, followed by Teo Ejapan Yamoa. Peter, you may begin your remarks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pete Dinalfo, and I'm a commuter and business owner. I oppose this plan and urge decision makers to conduct further review of the many factors not fully considered in the assessment. To be clear, I support the premise of upgrading our city's public transit system. Where I draw the line, however, is expecting individuals and businesses to foot the bill in such an arbitrary manner. Taxpayers have already been pushed to the brink over the past few years, with many of us leaving for good. This plan will only serve to force out the most vulnerable of us remaining and severely disrupt countless more. As other speakers have noted, 
the congestion problem is at least partially self-inflicted. Bike lanes are underused and routinely abused by cyclists with no regard for traffic laws. Parking cutbacks and outdoor dining spaces have only exacerbated the problem. More money is not the answer. Smarter policies are. This plan will create many losers, but none larger than the residents and businesses located within the zone. As long as the goods and services we rely on for everyday life come into the zone on a vehicle, and much of it does, all within it will be paying more for them. Businesses will simply pass on these increased costs to their customers. This means pricing for most necessities will rise. Service-based companies will be forced to increase prices when entering the zone, and in response, demand will decline. Economic activity within the zone will decrease while the cost of living will simultaneously increase. This relationship between prices and supply and demand is covered in most Economics 101 courses. The assessment's conclusion that economic activity will not be negatively impacted is simply not compatible with this proven principle. Many have spoken about exemptions if living within the zone or if under a certain income. These ultimately do not address the inevitable cost of living increases this plan will bring. There are no free lunches and everyone will bear the cost of this plan one way or another. Prior speakers have commented on the plan's potential negative impacts on the real estate market this warrants further review as New York's crown jewel is its real estate sector, and any short sightedness here may prove de detrimental. As for commuters, certain areas of New Jersey, Connecticut, and outer boroughs lack efficient modes of mass transit. Why must commuters now have to choose between paying a premium to drive versus extending an already long commute? Why are commuters being asked to subsidize a service that will likely never be a viable option for them? The ripple effects for those who wish to circumvent the toll also require further study. The GW, BQE, and other major roadways will see a surge in traffic that they have already proven they're not equipped to handle. This plan amounts to a shell game where the vehicles will simply be concentrated elsewhere with neither a net reduction in total vehicles nor carbon emissions, which are two stated goals of this plan. The sponsoring agencies have simply not finished their homework. I implore them, go back and consider these and other factors more thoroughly. This plan does not operate in a vacuum. Actions have reactions, some foreseeable, but others less Please so. Please conclude your remarks. Please don't take this responsibility lightly and listen to all these objections raised by the majority of the public. Thanks Thank for your you. consideration. Our next speaker is Tayo Ajapan Yamoa, followed by Sophia Feist. Our next speaker is Sophia Feist, followed by Gerson Fernandez. Our next speaker is Gerson Fernandez, followed by our 90th speaker on the list, Adam Ahmed. Gerson, you may begin your remarks. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good day. My name is Gerson Fernandez. I belong to New York City Taxi Workers Alliance. Our leader is Ms. Baravi Desai. I am a New York City yellow taxi driver, medallion owner. As a medallion owner, I manage my own business, whether profit or loss. The MTA should manage their own business or agency. Please don't use us for your bad management. That's all I have to say. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak out my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adam Ahmed, followed by Mario Asaro. Our next speaker is Mario Asaro, followed by Anonymous Speaker One. Mario, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Good morning. I'm a lifelong auto borough resident and a 30 year plus civil servant. I'm an avid bicyclist, and but as a resident of a double fare zone in Queens County, I've been an active driver in this city my whole life. I'm keenly aware of the need to better share our roadways and make them safer for all, as well as the need to improve public transportation. However, much like the city's ramping up of its overzealous campaign of double taxation of drivers through their aggressive camera ticketing program, 
the threat of further billing our city residents through the broad implementation of congestion pricing needs to take into account the millions of lower and working class families who rely on their vehicles to go to work, shop, visit New York City cultural institutions and parks, or otherwise get from point A to point B, especially during off peak hours. As the city considers congestion pricing for Manhattan, I urge our elected leaders and MTA to not make New York City become a playground for the rich. New York City taxpayers should not be double taxed to travel into their own city, whether it's for work, to frequent shows, theaters, museums, parks, restaurants, or any other economic and cultural generator. If congestion pricing is to be implemented, New York City residents and taxpayers need to be reduced during business hours and most importantly, deserve and need free access to their city after hours and weekends. Congestion pricing should be designed to focus on commercial traffic during peak business congestion hours. To charge residents an additional hefty tax to travel to their own city outside these hours is disturbing and grossly unfair. Businesses and cultural institutions rely on clientele from outside Manhattan to support their establishments. People, regardless of where they live, should be able to access Manhattan, especially after peak hours and weekends to frequent and support them. Consider a family of four from East and Queens thinking of going to Central Park for a Sunday picnic followed by a trip to the Met. First, they would need to pack their strollers, lunch, to a car or bus and get to the rail station, then unpack onto the railroad and finally onto the subway when they reach Manhattan. The commute would cost them $50 or more and the extra time would be at least two hours to a simple outing to our own city. For most families that would just dissuade them from ever going to Manhattan. As a child, my dad put us to work at a family restaurant in Upper East Side. I grew up in Central Park and all the museums and cultural institutions surrounding it. Later, I would take those Sunday trips with my own family. Families in the outer boroughs deserve the right to enjoy and share our city parks and cultural institutions and the thousands of other benefits that we already subsidize with our tax dollars. In closing, our taxes pay for the right to use and travel within our city without undue restriction. The dollars we spend on maintenance, insurance, tolls, gas, and tax revenue it provides contributes greatly to the city's economy and infrastructure. I said this in my previous testimony, but it bears repeating. Restricting Manhattan from those of us who live in the outer boroughs with further tax taxation, specifically during non-congestion hours and weekends, is elitist, immoral, and just plain wrong. We must not create further walling off the Isle of Manhattan only for the rich and those who can Please afford to live or travel there. I urge the MDA and our elective officials to grant fair consideration to outer borough taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Anonymous Speaker One, followed by Council Member Gail Brewer. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, Okay, thank you um, for giving me this opportunity to speak. I wanted to take the time today to explain why tolling of the cars getting into Manhattan is a bad idea. A little bit about myself. I am a first generation immigrant who came here with my family with a hundred dollar bill and a couple of suitcases being all and only possessions we were allowed to take with us. We came here back in 1989 to avoid persecution in my home country and to make a new life for ourselves. I work currently in a hospital in Manhattan and I live in Brooklyn in an area that has no train next to it. My commute to work is long as is, but without the car, it would be even longer requiring multiple transfers. I have tried it and timed it. I need to work to live, yet this unjust stalling would put incredible hardship on my family. Car ownership doesn't make one rich or entitled. It simply excludes people who are working and have to pay for everything and are already attached to the brink from working in the city or even taking a family out into the city to enjoy what it has to offer. It prices out New Yorkers who live and work here from New York. Subways right now are extremely unsafe. I know a lot of people, myself included, who are scared of using the subways, especially those who have been crime victims on the subways, as well as those who know people accosted on the subways. Telling them you're priced out of working or enjoying Manhattan is discrimination. They are already traumatized and are scared. How can you look them in the face and say we don't care about your trauma? Don't come into Manhattan. Don't live in New York City because you can't afford to drive in anymore and you can't take the subway either or for the people with special needs. I have a special needs child whom I take to multiple doctor's appointments during the day in different parts of Manhattan. And for various reasons, I cannot take him by public transport. Again, 
Now we will be priced out of our healthcare if we can't reach the doctors we need because we have to pay through the roof to get there. If you are someone who comes into Manhattan once in a while, an increase of this type may slide. However, for someone who lives in New York and is commuting daily into Manhattan for work or healthcare, or even for family outings and for various reasons can't use public transportation, which is at this point a super unsafe with crimes happening daily to begin with, in addition to paying for gas and parking, which both have increased substantially, paying for getting into Manhattan makes it completely unaffordable and shuts a huge amount of population out and is discriminatory. So I beg you to be fair to all New Yorkers, to consider all of us who have to live and work and use our healthcare here and don't force us to run away from New York City. Don't fail us. Don't discriminate against us. We are a vital part of this community and New York City needs us too. Thank you very much. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Our next speaker is Council Member Gail Brewer, followed by Constance Stellis. Uh, thank you very much. I am Gail Brewer. I represent the Upper West Side in the 6th District, and I'm just going to summarize some of the points. Um, as a council member in 2008, I voted for congestion pricing, and as Manhattan Borough President, when it was going to be happening, we held a hearing on residential parking. Very, very controversial. Um, I mentioned that because I think we have to consider it. I don't know what's right or wrong, but during that discussion, what we learned was something that I would like to see in some places where congestion pricing has gone into effect, the subways and the buses are already going, I don't know if it's six minute intervals, which is what I would suggest, I would love, but the public can see before congestion pricing goes into effect, what their changes could mean positively for them. I think that's really, really important. I wanna say also in anticipation, just the other day, we had a meeting on the Upper West Side that I convened, Community Board 7, the Business Improvement Districts, all local hospital staff and stakeholders and all the elected officials. And this is what came out of that discussion. Obviously, um, what we're concerned about is the 60th Street cutoff. Obviously, Roosevelt slash uh, Mount Sinai West is concerned as all hospitals are about their night workers they feel strongly that they should not have to pay a toll because it is so hard to get night public health workers, period. Um, secondly, uh, on the disability front, we know that if one has a current license plate indicating disability, you will be exempt. But there are others, as you heard earlier, going to the hospitals. We have to, I think, uh, make that discussion and definition of disability larger than just those who have the license plate. I wanna also talk about the nonprofits. I think you've heard all of this many, many times, but um, recently I went from uh, 49th Street to 94th Street delivering food for the homeless, homebound in particular, I'm suddenly homebound. And all of those uh, nonprofits that do that need to figure out how they can continue to either have the money for the toll in their contract with the city, state or federal government or be exempt because they are not gonna be able to do every single trip. Um, on 60th Street, one of the problems I think is that the traffic currently where there are challenges within that area is going to be a problem for DOT to uh, review and it has to be looked at very, very carefully. Um, I also just want to say also about that area, the uh, panic with, uh, of people will be parking in that area. I don't think they will, but I know that the bids are looking at the parking garages. I know that if you are in the area, you're panicked that somebody's going to be circling and looking for parking. So we have to look very, very carefully at that situation. I support congestion pricing, but there are thousands Please of issues include your remarks. to get it right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Constance Stellis, followed by Richard Kuzami. Our next speaker is Richard Kuzami, followed by Adelgisa Piero Diara. Richard, you may begin your remarks. 
Uh, yes, I am Richard Kazami of the Old Astoria Neighborhood Association. I'm also on CB1 in Queens. I'm speaking as president of the Old Astoria Neighborhood Association, not CB1. I'm a disabled driver. I happen to be driving right now, um, so that I hope I can get through this. Uh, uh, and I greatly appreciate the exemption proposed for those with disabilities. However, um, I have one observation regarding the administration of the dis disability exemptions. Many years ago, exemptions were given to the disabled to utilize permits in state parks. Uh, however, the system was abused by Long Island Railroad workers who had doctors create phony disability permits. Uh, regretfully, when this was discovered, the state started restricting the exemptions for all disabled pe people. Uh, we don't want a similar situation to happen here. Uh, we think that it's imperative that it be avoid avoided. To this end, we ask that the New York City issue disability placards be honored as they're confirmed by city doctors. The state issued hanging placards should not be honored because they're so easily falsified. Uh, we would ask that some sort of streamlined process be created to issue exemptions to holders of state issued hanging placards, regardless of what state issues them. Uh, this would involve confirming the diagnosis and perhaps in some sort of legal notarized statement from the issuing doctor so they are held responsible or through confirmation by a city doctor. And perhaps neighboring states such as New Jersey and Connecticut can utilize their health system to issue confirmation of diagnosis. I also, um, we greatly support the uh, utilization of residential parking permits. We're in the Astoria neighborhood and we are quite worried that cars will drive in there, park their cars, take up our local spots and try and take in public transportation from there. To guard against this, I think that our residential parking permits will be essential. Uh, we appreciate, I appreciate the time given and I hope you consider our, my remarks and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adalgisa Payero Diara, followed by DG. Adalgisa, you may begin your remarks. Hello, uh, my name is Adalgisa Pallero Diara. I represent Utani, one organization based on the Bronx for taxi drivers. Also, I'm part of the coalition of Justice for Apps. Um, we um, oppose this proposal of the congestion fee because this is going to kill our taxi industry. Um, we have been paying a congestion fee since 2019 of 275. We have given the NPA about a 1 billion in earnings. Um, we are on board with helping the congestion and, and green environment, but we believe that the proposal needs to be reevaluated and the NTA needs to find a different way to help the congestion. If you want um, your clients to come back, New Yorkers to come back to use the system, you should improve the system, the subway, make it safe and more reliable for the New Yorkers. That will also improve the, um, the congestion. We believe that um, you have to find a better way because this is only going to create a domino effect in the economy of New York. The taxi limousine service um, is going to get affected in the way that all drivers will start losing their earnings. Um, we need for you to reconsider if the drivers are not bringing the people as we have always done. We move a lot of citizens of the New York um, along with the NTA and the subways is gonna hurt the businesses in the central area. Um, if you consider all the people that come from different areas of New York, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, they're gonna get affected. If they have to pay the $23 fee on top of the economic crisis that we have right now with the pandemic, most likely is gonna reduce the traffic 
into the city, but it's going to hurt all the businesses in this area. And that's going to end up creating a more critical economy in the New York than is going to resolve. Uh, we think that you should reevaluate the proposal. And if it were to pass all taxis, all taxis from taxi limousine service should be exempt of paying the toll. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is DG, followed by Thomas Gretsch. Hi. We can hear you. Okay. Hi. Um, I live in downtown Manhattan in the congestion tax zone, and I'm completely against this new congestion tax. I say this both as a driver and a pedestrian, that it is arbitrary and unfair and places an undue burden on people like me who can least afford it and just happen to live downtown while not solving the real congestion issues. Downtown is not just a business district, is a residential district like any other around the city. We are no less a residential district than the outer boroughs or the Upper West Side, but everything gets dumped in our neighborhood and it's not fair to impose this congestion tax alone on us alone as well. It's easy for MTA executives and city council people, people getting six figure salaries to make pronouncements about how people with cars can afford this new tax of yours, but you're out of touch with working people like me and no one is voicing what this congestion tax will do to people like me because make no mistake, the cost of this arbitrary congestion tax will push me out of my home. I have a car because I need a car. It is a tool I need for my work and life. I don't have it because it's a status symbol. And my car is not causing congestions. I do not drive around the city. I drive out of the city and back in. I drive from my apartment to the tunnel and coming back from the tunnel to my apartment. And I park in a garage that I sacrifice to pay for. My car is not on the street. But according to your congestion tax plan, I am not only going to have to pay your tax when I'm using my car, but because I live in the tax zone, I'm going to have to pay every single day, even when I'm not driving. Even though I only use my car to drive out of the city once or twice a week, I'm going to have to pay your congestion tax every single day that I'm just remaining in my apartment and my car is sitting in the garage that I already paid to keep off the street. How is that fair? If you're truly concerned about congestion, stop creating more. Overdevelopment, the 90,000 Ubers, restaurant sheds, out of control bikes and e-bikes are four things that cause tons of congestion and safety issues. In fact, I'd say that's what caused most of the congestion along with the tourists. But you're ignoring that congestion and all those safety issues and putting all the blame on cars, especially in my downtown neighborhood. Here at home in the city, I'm a pedestrian. I walk everywhere. I don't drive. I rarely take subways anymore because due to poor management by the MTA city council and mayor, they are unsafe. But even if I did use the subway, it would not alleviate my need for a car because I'm only using my car to go places with no public transportation. To alleviate congestion, get rid of the restaurant sheds with also cut down on visibility when crossing the street, cut the number of the 90,000 Ubers who are the worst drivers who drive everywhere while on their devices, double parking, causing congestion, crack down on the bikes that run red lights, and run up on the sidewalks, require license plates that can be read on traffic cameras and send them tickets. Also, the city is creating more congestion, trying to build a new cluster of high rises near Madison Square Garden, adding extra burden to an already overdeveloped, overcrowded neighborhood. The developers will no doubt make billions of dollars on this. Why not get the MTA the money it supposedly needs from them? Development creates congestion and development should pay for the congestion or tax the tourists, not the people who live here. But we know it's not about congestion. It's about you wanting a more pot, a bigger pot of money. Your remarks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thomas Gretsch, followed by Eric Dorfman. Our next speaker is Eric Dorfman, followed by Sarah Hughes. Our next speaker is Sarah Hughes, followed by our hundredth speaker on the list, Mollen Mehta. Our next speaker is Mollen Mehta, followed by Anna Champany. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Mola Mehta and I wanna thank you for the opportunity to pro provide comments today. I'm a Queens resident and I'm here to show my support for congestion pricing. There are two reasons that I put, throw my support behind this program. First is the need to fund public transportation. As a resident of Forest Hills, I'm fortunate to have access to many modes of transportation. 
We have four subway lines and the Long Island Railroad that helps us get into Manhattan in 20 minutes. But not everyone in Queens is so lucky. We have a number of transit deserts with residents forced to take multiple transfers, transfers and modes of transportation to get around the city. Moreover, how we travel has changed. We all know that getting in and out of Manhattan is just simply not enough. The announcement of the Inner Borough Express is exciting for Brooklyn and Queens residents who will be able to travel across the boroughs quicker, saving time and opening up new possibilities. We need more projects like this that will expand our transportation network and connect more communities. As a relatively new father, I have a six month old, I also look at our transit system differently now. I'm fortunate to have an elevator at my nearest subway station, but not everyone is as lucky around the city. A few years ago, a young mother tragically lost her life falling down the subway stairs carrying her baby in a stroller. We need the MTA to complete capital projects that will create a fully accessible system so that tragedies like that don't ever happen again. These efforts only happen if we fund our transit system. Congestion pricing will provide billions of dollars for projects that will expand access and accessibility, things that are especially needed outside of Manhattan. The second reason I support this is to actually fight congestion. I am a car owner and travel frequently to visit friends and family outside the city. I know firsthand how congestion in the core can create massive headaches for drivers when it seems like pedestrians are able to move faster. But what about all the people who live in communities that have to deal with that congestion on a daily basis? When the Forest Hill Stadium near where I live has a show, we do get a lot of congestion, but that isn't every day. The idea of having that type of congestion around my family day in and day out is hard to imagine. Our city also has one of the highest rates in the country of hospitalizations and deaths of children and young adults due to asthma. What we do to reduce emissions and get people to ditch their cars in one part of the city matters for the rest of us. Around the world, we have seen examples of how congestion pricing gets cars off the road and improves quality of life and health. We have an opportunity before us to improve lives, connect people, and build a better future for the next generation of New Yorkers. Let's make sure we get congestion pricing right and deliver all that it promises. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Anna Champany, followed by Susan Albrecht. Good afternoon. We can hear you, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Anna Champany, the Vice President for Research at the Citizens Budget Commission. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. CBC has long supported congestion pricing to reduce traffic and emissions while generating revenue critical to supporting the MTA's capital plan. Our recent report reinforced the importance of CBD tolling revenue to ensure the transit system is brought to a state of good repair. CBC also articulated recommendations for CBD tolls in getting the pricing right. Specifically, CBC rec recommends that the MTA vary tolls based on the time of day and day of week, prioritize both raising revenue and reducing congestion and emissions, best achieved by higher tolls at the most congested travel periods, the limiting exemptions to those specified in the law and perhaps to poor hire vehicles and taxis, do not provide credits for MTA or Port Authority tolls. Proliferating exemptions or far-reaching credits would increase the toll other drivers would have to face in order to generate $1 billion in annual revenue. While toll shopping among bridges and tunnels should be addressed, doing so through credits to the congestion charge would increase the program's complexity and may even create new toll shopping incentives. The environmental assessments models clearly demonstrate that CBD tolling can achieve the program's goals and that exemptions and credits for some would increase the cost for others by between $5 and $14 for a car. This significantly higher toll could both weaken support for the program and put revenues at risk. CBC also recommends that the MTA clearly communicate tolls to enable drivers to modify their trips accordingly. Dynamic pricing where tolls change spontaneously during the day based on the level of congestion was not modeled and is not recommended since it would add significant complexity uh, without the without potentially uh, the necessary behavioral change. Secondly, uh, sorry, monitor and report on congestion pricing operational metrics to inform future policy adjustments. While the EA models are sophisticated, the program's actual impacts will be different. Adjustments should be considered at regular intervals to ensure the program is meeting its revenue congestion and emission goals. 
Furthermore, public reporting of the data will provide transparency, accountability, and facilitate buy-in. Effective congestion pricing implementation targets congestion emissions and revenue together, not just revenue alone, in a fair and sustainable manner that limits credits and exemptions and maximizes social benefits. CBC supports speedy implementation paired with ongoing monitoring and continual improvement to reduce congestion and emissions and improve transit for all future New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Susan Albrecht, followed by Talia Crawford. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Susan Albrecht. I'm a 40 year resident of New York City and I live in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. I acknowledge the need for some sort of congestion pricing to address climate change and to help the fund, fund the MTA, but not one that discriminates against the heavily taxed and heavily taxes outer borough residents. Uh, I have three things I wish to say. The first has to do with the rich and diverse culture of New York City, the environmental impacts do not measure the cultural impacts or the impacts on cultural institutions. Many outer borough residents like me occasionally drive into the city to participate in cultural events, doing all those things that make our city so great. Taking the subway for those occasions is not always practical. Coming home late in, in the evening is often a long drawn out, exhausting and risky prospect. Without a doubt, congestion pricing will impact the culture of New York City and the capacity of outer borough residents to enjoy that culture. My second point is the lack of transparency of the MTA plans and budgets. To the average New Yorker, the MTA budget is a big black hole. Sure, we need some changes and we need some improvements, but where is that money going and what are the plans and timelines? From the past experience, we know the mitigation plans to add a select stairs and escalators and other improvements will take years to install and renovate. My third point is to respectfully ask the commission to cut a break for the millions of outer borough residents who will bear the brunt of this new tax. So many lower and middle income New Yorkers are being heavily hit by exorbitant rent increases and by inflation. Can you please consider some plan like maybe some free crossings into the city or a reduced rate for outer borough residents. In closing, I ask you to remember that this will significantly change the lives of so many of us in this city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Talia Crawford, followed by Rachel Weinberger. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Good afternoon. My name is Talia Crawford. I'm the campaign organizer for Tri-State Transportation Campaign. Uh, Tri-State is a nonprofit policy advocacy organization uh, dedicated to fighting for improved mobility, accessibility, and livability in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Uh, today, I will join those in support of congestion pricing and will continue to support congestion pricing as a bo both a rider and a proud New Yorker. Uh, congestion pricing is expected to generate $15 billion, allowing the MTA to complete its essential capital program um, to improve longstanding issues that have plagued our public transportation systems. As someone who grew up in New York City, I've never had a driver's license or even a permit, so I rely on the vast amount of public transportation options available to me. And I know I'm not the only one out there whose mobility is dependent on mass transit. So a swift implementation of congestion pricing is key to ensuring safer, more reliable, efficient, and accessible public transportation. And from an environmental perspective, it is the key to cleaner air and less traffic congestion. That said, after reviewing the recent draft of the EA, we call on the USDOT, the state, and the city to act swiftly to mitigate any potential negative impacts that congestion pricing may have on the environmental justice communities located in New York City's outer boroughs. Uh, we urge the MTA to be cautious when considering any discounts or exemptions. Each exemption would be less effective to the reduction of potential traffic, and more exemptions can lead to increased traffic, traffic diversions in areas surrounding the CBD, including increases along the Cross Bronx and the Staten Island Expressway. Uh, we urge the MTA to carefully consider how to mitigate and monitor any adverse effects 
uh, from changes in traffic patterns as it creates and implements the final program. This is imminently possible and should not become a reason to bring congestion pricing to a halt. I strongly support uh, implementing congestion pricing in combination with swift prioritization of mitigation measures in any areas identified to have any potential negative impacts. This policy is a huge win, not just for Manhattan, but our regional transit system at large. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Weinberger, followed by Imani McKinnon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Rachel Weinberger. I'm a resident of Brooklyn, the mother of a seven and a 12 year old, and I own and drive a car. I have a PhD in urban planning and a master's degree in transportation engineering. I also teach transportation planning at the university level. In these capacities, I've given a lot of thought to the region's transportation system and to congestion pricing in particular. Today, I want to praise the legislature for having passed this landmark bill and the MTA for their efforts to implement it effectively. I also want to talk about how to make the CBD tolling program the best it can be to meet the dual goals of reducing traffic and raising money for public transit. I want to talk specifically about toll shopping, and I will start with a personal story. Recently, I was driving my mother from Long Island to her apartment in Chelsea. We were on the LIE, and at some point in Queens, my mother said, we usually take the Williamsburg Bridge from here to save the toll. The detour would have added 10 minutes and two miles. I checked this morning on Google Maps. My mother would have driven 10 minutes to save $6.55. That is equivalent to paying herself $39 an hour. Not bad. What my mother's calculation does not take into account is the delay she imposes on other drivers, the damage she exacts on the environment, and the inefficient use of the public right of way. My mother, like most other people, wouldn't think to consider those costs because they are completely invisible to her. In my research for a report called Reimagining the BQE, I learned that 25% of AM peak vehicles on the BQE west of the Free East River crossings are heading to Manhattan via those two free crossings. 25% of vehicles on that overburdened and crumbling part of the BQE had bypassed the Hugh Carey Tunnel a potentially shorter, more efficient route to their destination, but saved themselves $6.55. They, like my mother, have no way to assess the full impact of their decision. The time delay they impose on themselves is also imposed on other drivers. Because they take a longer route to save money, they use more street resources as well. That is, the city builds and maintains more roads than would be needed to serve the trip if it were taken more directly. Toll shopping as traffic, pollution, and carbon emissions that we have never thought to quantify. But today, we know at least that 25% of AM peak travelers on the BQE would go out of their way to save a toll. We can assume there are many more travelers like them. We can assume they will do the same to find a lower price route compared to a higher price route with the CBD tolling program. It is the government sector that set up the incentive for my mother and thousands of people just like her to toll shop. The same problem exists on the way out of the CBD. If the cost of crossings is not equal, many drivers will look for a bargain, adding time and distance to their trips, multiplying the extra time across all the drivers in the system, and ultimately defeating the goal of reducing congestion and its collateral benefits of reducing Conclude pollution. Conclude your remarks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Amani McKinnon, followed by Sandra Voss. The next speaker. Sandra Voss, followed by Daniel Love. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Sandra Voss, and I'm a resident of Harlem. I'm a strong supporter of congestion pricing. The issue of prioritizing people over cars is one that is close to my heart, because my brother-in-law Charlie was killed while riding his bike in 2020 when a driver hit him when he had the right of way. I miss Charlie every day and almost every week I hear of another New Yorker who has been injured or killed by a driver. In order to reduce and eliminate the rising number of traffic related deaths in our city, we need to begin prioritizing people over driver's convenience. 
But even if no one was being killed by cars, there are so many reasons why we need congestion pricing. The majority of NYC residents do not drive or own a car. The majority of us take public transit to get places. It is unfair that New Yorkers who don't drive are forced to put up with the pollution, noise, and danger caused by the small minority who do drive. I've heard some people claim that congestion pricing will hurt low-income residents who live in the outer boroughs, but the fact is that low-income New Yorkers are even less likely to own a car than the average New Yorker. According to a 2017 report based on U.S. Census data, in NYC, car-free car households earn 52% less than households with vehicles. Median incomes of zero car households are lower than overall median incomes, while median incomes of households with vehicles are higher than overall median incomes in all five boroughs. A recent study also found that 96% of outer borough New Yorkers wouldn't regularly pay a congestion charge. Let's stop catering to a small minority of wealthy commuters and have our city reflect the actual needs of the people who live here. Congestion pricing will provide essential funding for our public transit system, which is in need of a lot of improvements. Looking at cities in other countries that have trains that run on time and buses that can move quickly through express lanes, it's an international embarrassment that we don't prioritize our transit system more. We need to join the 21st century and do our part to reduce climate change by prioritizing transit, walking, biking, and people over driving. Every time I see an ambulance or fire truck that can't get through because of traffic, I think about how much we need to reduce the number of cars on our streets. I think about the person inside the ambulance whose likelihood of survival might be reduced because of traffic, and I think of their loved ones. Even up here on 116th Street in Harlem, gridlock can be extreme. It seems almost laughable that it's controversial to consider congest congestion pricing that's only being proposed below 60th Street. It's clear that we need to do something to reduce the number of cars throughout all of NYC, and the congestion pricing plan is the start that we need. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Love, followed by Jordan Force. Dan, you, you may begin your remarks. Hello, I'm sorry, I, I can't get my video going, um, but I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify on this very important issue. My name is Sproul Love. I also live in central Harlem on 124th Street. I'm a father of two school-aged children and uh, I do own a car. Uh, my family and I uh, use bikes extensively, both for errands and getting to work, as well as for pleasure getting down to Central Park. We also rely on the subway heavily. I drop my daughter off at school every day on the subway, and we use it for errands. Uh, I want to just first say I'm strongly in favor of implementing congestion pricing as soon as possible. Uh, I agree with all the arguments made in favor. And I wanna thank the MTA for putting together an excellent, well-researched, data-backed presentation. Um, I, I wanna distill this issue down to two simple facts, which I don't think anyone can argue with. One is we have too many cars and traffic in New York City. The other is we have a subway that's the lifeblood of New York City. It's one of the top reasons I live here and it's in a financial crisis. Um, this program addresses those two issues. And of course, a lot of special interests, namely entitled drivers, uh, are arguing for exemptions and special treatment, but they're the minority. Um, you know, when we say streets are for people, we mean they're for drivers, they're for cyclists, they're for pedestrians. Um, and I, I just want to leave it at that. I'm going to see the rest of my time. I'm strongly in favor of this program, and I hope it gets implemented as soon as possible. And it would be great if we could raise the, the cordon, northern cordon barrier uh, up into my neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jordan Force, followed by Erica Schwartz. The next speaker, the 110th person to sign up is Erica Schwartz followed by Wendy Brauer. The next speaker is Wendy Brauer, followed by Ahmad Kayum. The next speaker is Ahmad Kayum, followed by Linda Baran. 
The next speaker is Linda Baran, followed by John Corlett. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Linda Barron. I'm the president of the Staten Island Chamber of Commerce here on Staten Island. Um, first, I just want to uh, comment that, you know, entitled uh, drivers, uh, I, I take offense to that. On Staten Island here, we have very, very limited transit options. So people don't drive as a luxury. They drive because they don't have other choices. So I just wanted to kind of just reiterate that because it, it isn't the case for everyone. Uh, you know, we're uniquely positioned here on Staten Island between the cash strap MTA and the cash strap Port Authority. We have four bridges and we pay some of the highest tolls in the nation already. Uh, in the seven uh, CBD tolling scenarios, I noticed that there is a uh, credit, there is a possible credit uh, to include drivers coming over area bridges, but it does not include uh, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. So that's something that I picked up. Um, for businesses here, the cost of doing business is extremely high, uh, especially post COVID, or I, I would say in the recovery process, it puts our businesses at a competitive disadvantage with the other four boroughs with thin profit margins and the cost of goods. Uh, it, it's added cost to get into the CBD district is only going to multiply and it's going to be passed along to the consumer, as everyone else is saying here. I heard uh, Jessica Walker from the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. I do suggest that there in an, an economic impact study be done to see what the actual economic impact is going to be, especially as we're trying to get out of COVID and we, we see what impact it's having not only on our businesses, but on our residents as far as inflation and everything else. Uh, there are a couple of things in the actual assessment um, that I wanted to bring up. Well, I do believe that congestion pricing is an admirable proposal uh, to reduce traffic, reduce pollution, and, and offer reliable mass transit. Uh, some of the things that I, I that I would like to just comment on is regarding reducing traffic. The environmental in impact statement shows tolling scenarios that have truck traffic being diverted to the Staten Island Expressway. The Staten Island Expressway already experiences major traffic snarls and delays daily, spilling over onto our local streets. The westbound HOV lane on the Staten Island Expressway ends at Victory Boulevard and does not continue to the Gulf Coast Bridge. While we have requested state DOT extend the lane, there has no concrete plans to do so, and congestion on the Staten Island Expressway remains is a chronic problem. Uh, reducing, uh, um, regarding reducing pollution, increased truck traffic will intensify emissions and affect our air quality. As a car dependent borough with limited <laughs> options, people will continue to drive here. And just regarding mass transit options, there's been very little investment in Staten Island. And in order to get people, you know, into mass transit, we don't have a direct connection to Manhattan. We have problems and delays with our ferry system. Uh, we, the express bus is the only option that people take it. It's $13, $13 plus a day. So we'd like to see some plan for, you know, while, while investment, while congestion pricing is a laudable goal, we'd like to see a plan to ramp things up before anything like this is even. Your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is John Corlett, followed by Faraz Qureshi. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. My name is John Corlett. I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Traffic Safety Services for AAA Northeast. I'm speaking on behalf of AAA Northeast, which, which serves more than 6 million members in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire. Uh, nearly 2 million drivers in New York City and the surrounding metropolitan area are AAA members as a significant stakeholder in the implementation of a workable central business district tolling plan AAA Northeast has identified several key issues for consideration. Firstly, we are grateful to federal, state, and local, local officials for the opportunity to comment on the environmental assessment. This is certainly a step in the right direction to ensure the public has had an opportunity to be heard. Nonetheless, we respectfully request that the MTA and other government officials continue to hold public forums, community meetings, to, to provide updates regarding the progress of the program in the year ahead. Social media posts, press releases, and public notices should be frequent and provide clear communication to ensure the public understands what exactly is being implemented and when. 
In addition, uh, continuing to engage stakeholder groups like AAA, local business improvement districts, and the trucking industry will go a long way towards successful implementation. Uh, secondly, because the central business tolling program aims to relieve congestion in the zone, drivers should be provided the cost savings incentives to, to drive at the least congested times of day. A toll structure that imposes a reduced cost at the least congested times of day will enhance the fairness to drivers by giving them an opportunity to shift their schedule to lessen the impact of the charges. We also strongly discourage the use, the use of real-time variable toll structures, such as those that now uh, used down in I-66 uh, in Virginia. A driver should be able to plan and weigh the cost benefit of driving into the CBD before they leave home and should be provided advance notice well in advance of any price difference to the extent practicable. Indeed, if the MTA chooses to impose higher tolls on specific days when congestion is expected to be worse, such, uh, such as gridlock alert days or air quality alert days, such changes should be clearly communicated to the public well in advance. Um, I'm just gonna skip ahead. I did submit this to the um, uh, Federal Highway Administration this morning. Uh, I, I would just like to uh, skip ahead here a little bit. I only have 30 seconds. Uh, finally, we respectfully request an exemption for emergency roadside service vehicles. Uh, the CB district tolling leg legislation exempted all vehicles defined as emergency vehicles, but did not include all vehicles defined under the state's move over law. Emergency vehicles, tow trucks, and light duty service vehicles all provide essential safety functions in New York City. And in fact, in, Lon in London, all vehicles classified as recovery vehicles are eligible for a 100% discount because they, uh, those vehicles can facilitate flow of traffic by aiding or removing disabled vehicles. So thank you for the uh, opportunity to comment. Our next speaker is Faraz Qureshi, followed by Chelsea Dowell. The next speaker is Chelsea Dowell, followed by Dennis DeVertuil. Good afternoon. My name is Chelsea Dowell. I'm a staff member at Open Plans, a nonprofit dedicated to building a more livable city for all New Yorkers. I'm also a resident of Brooklyn 17th Street, and I live directly across from an on-ramp to the Prospect Expressway. Every day I see and hear firsthand just how damaging car culture is to our city's livability, safety, and health. My neighbors and I need noise machines to fight the engine sounds at night. We witness gridlock and road rage. We keep our windows closed no matter the temperatures outside. And even so, we often smell exhaust inside our homes. I often think of how lovely, how quiet and peaceful our block would be if the city hadn't carved a, a highway through the neighborhood in deference to car culture. But this isn't about me or my block. This is about how increased congestion has created these conditions and much worse in neighborhoods across the city and it's impacting a vast majority of New Yorkers who do not own cars. People whose streets and sidewalks are clogged, polluted and deadly because of the small minority creating a very large problem. Lives have been lost, lives are being lost, health outcomes have been diminished. These compromises, these sacrifices to car culture are not acceptable. Congestion pricing is our chance to prioritize people over cars to prioritize public transit over private vehicles. Congestion pricing is proven to reduce driving and having less cars on the road means less crashes. It means improved health and well-being for the vast majority of New Yorkers who, again, do not own cars. New York City is a public transit city. It's part of what makes New York the greatest city in the world. And now we need to invest in that system that, again, most New Yorkers are using to enter and travel within the Manhattan core as well as across the entire city. There are issues with our transit system, as some speakers have mentioned, especially in areas farther from the district in question, but the future of cities is not CART. We can't fix the issues by doubling down on a problematic situation. I urge that we implement congestion pricing quickly with limited exemptions and consideration of mitigation in impacted areas. Let's put a stake in the ground for the future and begin to imagine a more livable, safer, and more accessible city now. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dennis Davertool, followed by Andrew 
Greenblatt. Hey everyone, my name is Dennis DeVerte. Um, I'm a resident of South uh, Slope, Brooklyn, and uh, I work in Lower Manhattan. Uh, honestly, Chelsea gave a really good support to all this, so I just would like to say uh, I would like to support whatever uh, everything that she said. Um, and because, like, I am a father of two. Uh, and I rely heavily on the transportation system. Um, I am a cyclist and I use it every day. My family uses it every day. Um, it is the lifeblood of the city and I fully support the congestion pricing program. I can see the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Andrew Greenblatt followed by Carol Parker. Um, hi, my name is Andrew Greenblatt and I'm the National Policy Director of the Independent Drivers Guild. Thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, the IDG is a nonprofit affiliate of the International Association of, Mach of Machinists and our organization represents over 140,000 drivers throughout New York State. I'm here today on behalf of New York's four hire vehicle rideshare drivers to implore you not to add a second congestion tax on these drivers. Black and yellow cars in New York City have been generating a third of a billion dollars per year since the congestion pricing surcharge was first levied in 2019. To date, None of the other classes of drivers in Manhattan, that's private cars, buses, commercial delivery, et cetera, have paid a penny into this program. Why drivers who are overwhelmingly low income and 91% of whom are immigrants were the only ones whose labor was taxed for the last three years is a conversation for another day. Today, we ask why in a process that for the first time is meant to have other drivers start carrying their share of the billion dollar burden, would this panel increase the burden on those least able to pay, those who have already paid the most, and those who would otherwise continue to pay a third of the billion dollars you're trying to raise here today. The original congestion pricing fee of $2.75 per trip was at least designed in a way that could be passed on to passengers, though any tax ultimately does hurt drivers through fewer rides. The newly proposed fees, however, would fall squarely on the shoulders of drivers. Let's take, for example, the idea that if you imposed a $23 once a day fee uh, onto drivers entering the zone, which passenger would pay that? The first passenger of the day? The last passenger of the day? The middle passenger of the day? Obviously, only the driver would be in a position to pay that one-time fee. And $23 a day is a devastating amount for this population. Working just five days a week, 50 weeks a year, a driver would have to pay $5,750 a year just to work. For a typical driver making $40,000 a year, that would lower their income by 14%. That's right, this board is considering imposing the equivalent of a 14% income tax increase on some of the most vulnerable workers in the city. So let's not impose one of the most regressive taxes in history on the only group already paying more than their fair share. Let's let everyone else start to chip in first. The environmental assessment points out on page 4A, page 46, that scenario D can be designed in a way to achieve the $1 billion goal without imposing a second tax on FHV drivers. To do anything else would be nothing short of a moral. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Parker followed by Christopher Sanders. Our next speaker, the 120th person to sign up is Christopher Sanders, followed by Isabel Verderi. Our next speaker is Isabel Verderi, followed by Lena Melendez. Hi, did that work? Yes, you may proceed. Cool. 
Uh, my name is Izzy. I've lived in New York the past four years and in the proposed congestion pricing zone for all of those four years. Um, in my opinion, New York really urgently needs congestion pricing both to combat climate change and improve quality of life for all New Yorkers. Uh, without making driving more difficult, to put it simply, people will continue to do it. And restricting vehicle traffic into the center of the city will contribute to better public transit and more vibrant streets for all New Yorkers. Um, I encourage the MTA and all policy makers to make a wholesale shift in prioritizing public transit users and cyclists and pedestrians and make large scale changes to accommodate this move instead of incremental changes designed to placate all stakeholders to streets. When London implemented congestion pricing, the city saw a 20% reduction in traffic and an 83% jump in cycling. Um, and the people who would pay more to drive into the congested parts of Manhattan are disproportionately wealthier. Just 4% of all New York City workers who live in the other boroughs commute into Manhattan by car. I would also like to address those who said they should not be charged for driving out of town um, into Yonkers or Westchester into Long Island. Um, I have to pay the fare every time I would like to go to those places if I take the Metro North or if I take the Long Island Railroad. Um, I would also like to join with the other testifier, Sandra Voss, in calling for reduced traffic deaths by cars and improving safety on our streets. The last few years, especially since COVID, have been extremely deadly for pedestrians and cyclists, and I believe that congestion pricing by taking cars off the road will contribute to the city's Vision Zero initiative, which it has currently not been doing so well at. Um, congestion pricing should be implemented as soon as possible after years and years of delay, and I believe that after we do this, we will wonder why we did not do it sooner after seeing the incredible benefits that it will bring to our subways, our buses, and our qualities of life. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lena Melendez, followed by Christian Aru. The next speaker is Christian Aru, followed by Danny Sena. The next speaker is Danny Sena, followed by Douglas Desir. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so as stated, my name is Danny Senna. I'm the director at Agape Transportation. We are a non-emergency medical transportation company uh, serving the New York City metro area. Uh, we've been in business for 10 years. Our founder was once an FHV driver, uh, and he's my father, uh, who was moved here as an immigrant. He is the epitome of, of what it is to move to New York City without a degree and get working and get to where you need to get to. So I'd like to uh, first bring up the need for some kind of concession uh, or a complete exemption for FHV drivers uh, across the board, uh, as most are minorities. Most have uh, either lower income or immigrants or come from places where maybe they don't have the opportunities that others did. Uh, so an, exempt, a, a, an additional toll for this population would be just devastating. Uh, but beyond that, the population that our company serves are primarily Medicaid and Medicare recipients, uh, as well as generally elderly people or sickly people who live within the, the, the new congestion zone. Uh, this toll would create just uh, chaos for many of them, as this, this cost would either need to be absorbed uh, by themselves as, as older uh, in New Yorkers or by Medicaid and Medicare, therefore exasperating the budget even more than it already is. Uh, so I request that it, it be highly considered that for Medicaid uh, medical transportation, non-emergency medical transportation, uh, just like Accessorite, it's the same service as Accessorite, uh, a blanket exemption is made as this is, sort of, these are, this is a service that needs to be provided to those New Yorkers. Throughout the pandemic, we were considered uh, it was exempt, um, an exempt service, uh, and I think that should continue. Uh, because again, without our service or services like ours, not even just our company, but this service is necessary for many New Yorkers living within the congestion zone. So non-emergency medical transportation should be added in as an additional exempt group. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Douglas Desir, followed by Michael Huarachi. The next speaker is Michael Huarachi, followed by Vishan Chakrabarty. Michael. 
Michael Hurachi. Michael, please unmute and begin your remarks. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please begin. Hi, yes. Hi, yes. Um, I would like to um, suggest that we move away from uh, criminalizing poverty in our transportation system. I would rather have two boarding doors uh, than criminalizing the poor of our community. Black and brown, or brown dial, or being on a bus, they cannot afford to pay. I think that a hundred thousand police more case is uh, abomination. It is a waste of taxpayer dollars. Um, I can't say this enough. Police do not produce safety. Uh, bus, reliable, efficient public transportation does. Um, housing. Healthcare um, education is beyond the scope of the what the MTA can do, but what the MTA can also do is stop catering to the white rage that is reinforcing this narrative that the public transportation system in our city is unsafe. It's probably one of the best public transportation systems in regards to safety that I've been in in the Western world. Um, I've never experienced this. Um, our public transit system in New York City, I cannot say the same for Europe, much of France, Germany, England, Amsterdam. You may I'm not sorry, the in, I'm uh, sorry, the interpreter cannot hear. I'm, I'm assuming that the stenographer cannot hear clearly as well. Can you hear, can you hear me? I cannot so, hear. Yeah, we'll come back to Michael if you can get to a better spot and give you your remaining time. The next speaker is Vishan Chakrabarty, followed by John Jedrosic. The next speaker is John Jedrosic, followed by Alice Mock. The next speaker is Alex Mock, followed by Patricia Cowley. Hello, everyone. My name is Alice Mock. I represent my company, Wonton Food Inc. We have been an Asian food manufacturer in New York for nearly 50 years, serving restaurants, food service organizations in the city, and more. We have plants in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Long Island City, and Plainfield, Long Island, as well as a wholesale division in Chinatown. Implementing the congestion pricing will affect our business or similar businesses in the following ways. Number one, due to high rent in Manhattan, Many businesses in Chinatown have a small footprint. They require multiple deliveries from their vendors to support their business for the community. It will add cost to our business and many foods and small companies that make daily deliveries to Chinatown. Needless to say, we are already suffering from the increasing cost of labor, transportation, and raw materials of running a small business in New York City. Besides, it will add cost to our vendors who make deliveries to our wholesale division, and in the end, add more costs on our shoulders. Furthermore, it will affect our business because customers may discontinue using our products due to the expense of picking up in Chinatown. Lastly, it will heavily impact the restaurant business in the CBD, which are already struggling due to the pandemic. That's all I want to share. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker, the 130th person to sign up is Patricia Cowley, followed by Michelle Grossman.
Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Cowley. I'm the executive director for the Greater New Jersey Motor Coach Association, as well as the Pennsylvania Bus Association. I'm speaking here today to request a full exemption to bus and motor coach private companies in regards to the congestion pricing tolling. Our members represent over 100 motor coach operators who bring commuters and tourists to New York City. Although we support efforts to address congestion in the city, we are extremely concerned by the options proposed in the environmental assessment and the limited time available to review the documents and participate in this process. Because New York City is a national tourism and commuter destination, any suggestion, any congestion relief or pricing models need to take into consideration the concerns of all stakeholders involved. We understand several options proposed in the New York Central Business District Tolling Program include tolling of buses and motor coaches that serve the city. This is counterintuitive to providing congestion relief. Motor coach travel is one of the most green, fuel efficient modes of transportation by getting approximately 280 miles per gallon. Not only do our members reduce traffic congestion on our roads and highways, but just one coach has the potential to replace up to 50 cars. So we are taking cars off the streets, lessening the carbon footprint, and our members do this all while providing significant economic benefits to the city. Further, motor coaches are often the only form of transportation available to low income and underserved communities. By assessing fees of the buses on the buses, there will be no other choice but to raise fares to cover the extra expense. I think this will impact commuters and of course will impact the significant revenue we bring to the New York City landscape. Simply put, motor coaches are a solution to your problem and need to be treated as such. Therefore, we respectfully request you to take these points into your consideration and offer private motor coach companies full exemption from the congestion pricing plans being developed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Michelle Grossman, followed by Caspar Lant. The next speaker is Caspar Lant, followed by Kate Brockwell. The next speaker is Kate Brockwell, followed by Jane Selden. My name is Kate Brockwell, and I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets, a group of people who have been seriously injured or lost loved ones to traffic violence. Congestion pricing has made streets safer where it's been implemented. In London, crashes fell nearly 50% in the congestion pricing zone with a 15%, sorry. Um, oh, um, congestion pricing will make streets safer for all road users. Implicit in the testimony of virtually every opponent is the assumption that when someone gets in their car, they will be able to get home in one piece. I want that to be true, but for far too many drivers, it is not. Before I was hit by a car more than four years ago, I understood that I could be. Three of my great grandmothers were killed by vehicles. When I was hit, I was walking in the crosswalk and had the light. The driver failed to yield, causing serious knee leg and wrist injuries and PTSD. While I couldn't have done anything differently to prevent my being hit, congestion pricing will encourage drivers to reconsider non-essential trips in Manhattan. We have to design transit with the expectation that humans will make mistakes. We know how to and we must design roads so that those inevitable mistakes are not deadly. Congestion pricing will deter some drivers from getting in their car when they could make the trip by subway, bus, or train. We need to reduce the number of car trips to reduce the number of crashes that are killing our neighbors. There are important considerations in how to implement congestion pricing, but it is the only reasonable first step to take in addressing a planet and obvious crisis and streets so dangerous that drivers are killing and severely injuring people who are standing on sidewalks, babies in strollers, and 99-year-olds. It is our most vulnerable who are most likely to be injured and killed by traffic violence. The youngest, oldest, people who cannot work from home, commuters who travel at night, 
people with disabilities and people who drive for their jobs. That change is uncomfortable, makes it no less essential. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jane Selden, followed by Munib Rahman. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jane Selden. I'm a retired educator, a longtime resident of the Central Business District, a bus rider, a subway rider, and a climate activist. I fully support the CBD tolling plan because it is an important step towards reducing the city's greenhouse gas emissions and improving the health of our local communities. With record-breaking heat waves, severe droughts, unprecedented flooding, and uncontrollable wildfires, both here and abroad, we are already witnessing the deadly effects of the climate crisis. According to the UN IPC's latest report, we are rapidly running out of time to take the steps necessary to avert climate catastrophe. In New York City, the transportation sector contributes 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, with emissions from cars and trucks being the largest contributors. The path to reducing these emissions is clear. We need to reduce the number of vehicles entering the city and provide the much needed funding to modernize, expand, and speed up public transportation, thereby incentivizing more sustainable alternatives to car travel. Reducing these dangerous emissions will also improve the health of our local communities. Our city now experiences the worst traffic congestion in the nation. This congestion results in more vehicles idling and more stop and go driving, which increases tailpipe pollution. In fact, idling engines emit twice the amount of toxic pollutants as a car in motion. These pollutants include carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, and small particulate matter that have been linked to higher rates of heart and lung disease and cancer, as well as higher rates of hospitalization and death from COVID-19. These adverse health effects disproportionately impact low-income communities and communities of color. We know that implementing congestion pricing has direct health benefits because we've seen this happen in other cities. For example, according to a Johns Hopkins study in Stockholm, there was a 15% drop in particulate matter and the number of hospital visits by children with severe asthma went down by nearly 50%. Regarding exemptions, I support exempting vehicles that transport disabled people. This is fair, but adding more exemptions will significantly increase the toll, resulting in more people seeking alternative toll-free routes, including the Cross Bronx Expressway, increasing the pollution for Bronx residents who already suffer from some of the worst air quality in the city. The congestion pricing um, tolling program is a crucial first step in addressing multiple urgent issues in our city, uh, the climate crisis, the, the public health crisis and the traffic congestion. It's working in London, it's working in Stockholm and in Singapore and in other cities around the world. There's no reason it can't work here. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Munib Rahman, followed by Michael Prisco. The next speaker is Michael Prisco, followed by Mitch Watson. The next speaker is Mitch Watson, followed by Tracy Annunziato. The next speaker is Tracy Annunziato, to be followed by Joanne Simon. Hello, can you see me? Yes, you can see and hear you. Okay, perfect. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you for allowing me to speak. I spoke last night, but I also wanted to speak again. My name is Tracy Nunziato. I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I was just recently approved for permanent disability a year ago, as I have a very chronic, painful chronic pain condition that affects my legs, back, neck, shoulder, my entire body. I also possess this New York City handicap parking permit, which is very hard to get. And I just had to renew it and went through it and tedious process of having to send so many doctors reports just to renew this handicap parking permit that I've had for years. Um, I feel like this congestion pricing 
is really a hardship for people with disabilities and people like me and the elderly that have and rely on their car. The handicap parking permit is given to us because we have these severe disabilities and we require the use of our personal cars. Um, this handicap parking permit is a hardship because I cannot ambulate the subway systems at all. Number one, not everybody gives you seats on the trains. Um, number two, the steps are impossible. I cannot walk up steps alone, never mind carrying the walker that I ambulate with up the steps with me. Number two, I see various doctors in Manhattan. And I also, I travel through the Hugh Carey Tunnel when I go to see these doctors and now having to pay an additional money just to use my car because I'm using my handicapped parking permit in order to go see these doctors. I just think that if you have this New York City handicapped parking permit, we should be exempt from paying this ridiculous extra toll. Um, it's just tedious. Please just consider exempting the New York City handicapped parking permit holders. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Our next speaker is assembly member Joanne Simon. She'll be followed by Christine O'Brien. Hi, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm assembly member Joanne Simon and I represent downtown Brooklyn and most of the neighborhoods surrounding the commercial core. Um, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of congestion pricing today. Uh, I was a co-sponsor of the congestion pricing bill and done right congestion pricing will increase the use of mass transit and fund keeping it in a state of good repair. And two, it will reduce the gratuitous traffic over the free bridges. Um, after engaging with communities throughout the Gowanus Corridor in the 1990s, we learned that much of the traffic uh, in the corridor was induced by two things. One, the free Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges, and two, the now eliminated uh, one Zano toll. And we fought for and got a downtown Brooklyn transportation blueprint study uh, where we learned uh, uh, two things. And here's the blueprint study right here. 50% um, of the traffic in downtown Brooklyn was through traffic over the free bridges. That congestion pricing was the only way to disrupt the unequal tolling policies that it created that polluting pathfinding through the area. And that residential permit parking was needed to eliminate the major park and ride problem that existed. Uh, that study was finalized in 2006 and, and demonstrated unequivocally that RPP was justified in the area. And the main point I wanna make is that this is about reducing congestion, not just because it's costly, but because traffic congestion significantly contributes to climate change. Reducing congestion pre protects the health and safety of all of us, even if you disagree. And yes, it will be a pain in the tuchus for New Yorkers wanna be able to go where they wanna go, when they wanna go. Uh, they wanna see the USA in a Chevrolet as it were, but not being able to breathe and increased flooding is so much much more of a pain for so many. Studies have shown that we have to reduce vehicle miles traveled uh, by 20% before 2030. So we just have to reduce VMT. And uh, that is without regard to the electrification. Now a word about exemptions. I agree with the previous speaker that people with disabilities must have an exemption because the transit system is not accessible. Moreover, they're overwhelmingly underemployed or living on a fixed income. Not allowing exemptions for people who need to get in and out of Manhattan uh, or below 60th Street and who cannot reliably take public transportation deserve our consideration. The subways are marginally accessible. The buses don't go over the bridges except for a few and excessive ride is an unmitigated disaster. I've received many calls from people who have conditions who need medical treatment um, and just can't sustain doing this either physically or financially. Um, yesterday, there was an op-ed in the, in the Daily News. I agree that we need to mitigate those impacts to environmental justice communities, such as those along the Ross Bronx. Um, and in some, I think the balance to be struck is a delicate one. We all have a responsibility to be part of the solution. And I thank the panelists for taking on this very difficult task in the public's interest. Thank you. Speaker is Christine O'Brien, followed by Walter Iwachu. 
The next speaker is Walter Iwachu, followed by Sheila Pierre. Good afternoon. Please proceed. Yes, I'm here representing the uh, $8 million, 8 million citizens who ride the subways. Uh, we had a contract that was stolen by MTA staff. They reworked it to appear to come from Transit Wireless. Part of that contract was basically to provide nearly free subway service to all the residents of New York City. Now, that would have encouraged people to ride the subways and would have alleviated the problem. Additionally, the uh, MTA did a bus crash on me and I was injured in the bus crash and they submitted a false accident investigation done 30 minutes after. Uh, now, as far as the Environmental Review Board uh, survey here, it looks like the new IRA bill has not been uh, discussed in the proposal environmental impact statement. I submit that this should alleviate the congestion, the issues with the environment and the MTA should not be grasping for some additional funding. Uh, it's already been investigated and found that there is infiltration of the MTA by organized crime. Uh, Jane knows about it, Governor Hochul knows about it, and I've asked President Biden to make an investigation. So I'm asking the US Department of Transportation to also carry on an investigation. I would recommend that the board members also look into it because if this is a money grab, it shouldn't happen. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Sheila Pierre, followed by Donald Ronschti. The next speaker is Donald Ronschti, followed by Chris Castillo. Hello. We can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Donald Ranchi. I'm Executive Vice President of the Building Trades Employers Association. The BTA represents 100, I'm sorry, 1,100 construction managers, general contractors, and specialty trade contractors operating in New York City, who have put in place over $65 billion worth of public and private construction work in New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the, of the plan, which unfortunately we have to oppose, and in the alternative would request an exemption from. Our research shows that in London, Milan, Stockholm, all, all of those plans have existed, existing lim listed exemptions based on the needs of that city. <clears throat> and also London, Milan, Stockholm, Singapore, have a have attributed a higher cost of living to uh, as opposed to New York, based partly on congestion prices. The object of the plan is to raise over a billion dollars for public transportation and to alleviate traffic in the central business district. Unfortunately, caught up in this plan is a myriad of small businesses that use commercial vehicles to move necessary supplies, tools, and materials to the hundreds of public and private work sites in Manhattan. Like many other small businesses that have already testified, the costs of this tax on contractors will be such a burden and so cost prohibitive for their clients that many contractors will simply continue, discontinue working in Manhattan. This would negatively impact not only those tall, glorious projects that we see coming up out of the ground in Manhattan, but school construction, road work, pipe and electric gas work, needed infrastructure, 
renovations for homeowners, repairs, remodeling for homeowners, adding exorbitant costs to each of these projects. In fact, on public projects, the cost of congestion pricing on construction contractors would simply be passed along to the public owner. And for the MTA, as a client, higher construction costs on the very projects that the MTA is looking to raise money for by implementing the plan. All construction vehicles should be exempted. Without this exemption, the MTA would net zero dollars or more likely lose money on each toll charge to a construction vehicle entering the zone. We would be happy to engage you further on this. <clears throat> uh, and and uh, quickly, the BTA recently undertook an imp economic impact study that showed that for each billion dollars in construction spending, more than one dollar was returned to the city in terms of taxes, uh, payroll, and, and localized spending. So this could potentially uh, raise a billion dollars for the MTA, but tangentially cost and, or, or even show losses of implementing the plan overall in New York City. Thank you. Next speaker is Chris Castillo, followed by Caswell McLean. The next speaker is Caswell McLean, followed by Alfred Lynch. The next speaker is Alfred Lynch, followed by Connie Zambianchi. The next speaker is Connie Zambianchi, followed by Cecilia Guerra. The next speaker is Cecilia Guerra, followed by Brett Burke. The next speaker is Brett Burke, followed by Philip Shinilev. Good afternoon. My name is Brett Burke, and I'm the Vice President and General Manager for the Coach USA Suburban Facility located in New Brunswick, New Jersey. We have been a staple in transporting passengers to New York City for more than 80 years. Our New Brunswick facility alone operates over 350 daily trips between points in central New Jersey to and from New York City and more than 8,000 passengers per day rely on our service as it is a reliable and low cost form of transportation for them. The pandemic was an extremely difficult time for everyone and while many businesses were able to keep operating by having their employees work from home, Coach USA was out there providing transportation to those who needed to get to and from New York City day in and day out. We received hundreds of phone calls and emails from our passengers thanking us for providing service as they would not know how they would get to work otherwise. We continue to be a very good and reliable partner with New Jersey Transit since the agency's inception in 1977. In my 13-year career at Coach USA, New Jersey Transit has relied on us to provide emergency service to public transportation riders during natural disasters such as Superstorm Sandy in 2012, as well as other unexpected weather events. We've also assisted in large planned events such as the Super Bowl in 2014 and the Pope visit in 2015. Additionally, we operate local contracts for New Jersey Transit throughout the state. From an operational vantage point, any additional charges to our company will place extreme pressure on us to increase our fares, which we do not wish to do. The traveling public has endured much stress over the last couple of years and utilizes our service because it is an affordable alternative to driving their own vehicle or using other transportation options. Our service has been part of the solution as to why this tax is being proposed in the first place, minimizing the amount of vehicles on the road and lessening carbon emissions. As mentioned by my colleagues previously, by the tens of millions each year. As a result of the program, Coach USA believes that ridership of buses will increase, therefore further decreasing the number of passenger cars on the road. But to make the program successful and to anticipate this increase in ridership, more suburban park and ride facilities are needed outside of New York and in New Jersey. Existing park and ride facilities, including those in Rockland and Orange counties, as well as those along the New York Thruway and New Jersey corridors, commuter park are not adequate to receive increased transit activity and need expansion. Coach USA also believes that rapid bus lanes into New York City should be created that will allow for more efficient transportation to and through the congestion district. We also support enhancements to monitor use of current bus lanes and support enforcement against individuals and businesses that impede use of the bus lanes. We're seeking to have what has already been well established in London, Singapore, and Stockholm. These cities embrace bus services as a major way to address their congestion issues, as well as a way of lowering carbon emissions. I respectfully request that this board's recommendation be of providing an exemption to all bus operators at all times. 
Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. The next speaker is Philip Shinolev, followed by Jorge Urena. The next speaker, the 150th on our list, is Jorge Urena, followed by Andrew Stern. The next speaker is Andrew Stern, followed by Olivia Lai. Hi. Uh, as a resident of Lower Manhattan, I would like to urge the MTA and the state to deliver congestion pricing soon and without exemptions. This would allow the MTA to fully fund its capital program, which millions rely on. We need the benefits that will be enabled by a fully resignaled subway system, the Interborough Express, the completed Second Avenue subway, Penn Station access, and accessibility upgrades. This is not a regressive program. Only 2% of outer borough New Yorkers in poverty drive to Manhattan for work, and drivers to New York are disproportionately upper class. With congestion pricing, our bus system, which middle and lower class New Yorkers ride most, We'll be able to run faster on less congested streets, and I urge the MTA to invest further in more frequent bus service, particularly for outer borough transit deserts. I live and work in lower Manhattan, and I deal with the impacts of congestion every day. My risk for asthma is elevated, and if I had children, theirs would be as well. I am more likely to be hit by a speeding car, and the car congestion makes our streets difficult to walk, bike, and live on. For those requesting exemptions, I would point out that the exemption to congestion pricing is simply taking the train or the bus. For those requesting exemptions for medical appointments, I would point out that currently the MTA provides no fare exemptions for those taking the train, which is often upwards of $20. So it's not clear to me why these exemptions would be granted for those taking cars. Many hospitals in Manhattan, including the VA, already provide compensation for travel expenses, and I assume this would be extended to congestion pricing. Congestion pricing is a way to formally price the negative externalities of driving, and it is crucial that we limit any exemptions. Regardless of why someone is driving into the CBD, they are still imposing those negative impacts on the people of lower Manhattan, not to mention everyone else driving. Congestion pricing has been proven as effective in cities around the world, but in the US, New York's program is the first. It's crucial that we do this right, do this soon, and with as few exemptions as possible to show Americans in cities around the US that congestion pricing works and it can be done here. Thank you, and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. The next speaker is Olivia Lai followed by Krishaveni Drummond. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Hi, can you see me? Yes. Yes, please proceed. So I live in lower Manhattan and I walk and take the subway every day. I'm also a driver, and not only would I be happy to pay the congestion pricing toll, but I also ask that there be no exemptions for drivers who live in lower Manhattan, because the sheer number of cars makes it impossible to safely walk and bike around my neighborhood. Right now, just outside my apartment, the congestion created by cars is making my street dangerous and inhospitable to me and my neighbors, and generating intense smog and noise that are detrimental to our livelihoods. Congestion pricing would mean fewer cars on our streets, safer air, and less noise pollution. I would like to ask the MTA to limit any exemptions as these would weaken congestion pricing's ability to keep our streets livable. It's also important that we implement congestion pricing as soon as possible, so the MTA has the funds to improve their bus and train network, which I and millions of other New Yorkers rely on every day. Thank you, and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. The next speaker is Krishaveni Drummond, followed by Raul Rivera. The next speaker is Raul Rivera, followed by Peter Costello. The next speaker is Peter Costello, to be followed by Elizabeth Larkin. The next speaker is Elizabeth Larkin, to be followed by Patricia Keenan. The next speaker is Patricia Keenan to be followed by Irving Lee. The next speaker is Irving Lee, followed by Beatrice Chisholm. Hi, this is Irving Lee, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I just wanna say that um, let me, let me get my act together because you caught me. I've been waiting for a long time. You kind of caught me. Um, all right. 
Okay, I'm gonna start my video. All right, so I just want to say I'm a, I'm a congestion. I just want to say that congestion pricing is a very bad idea. Its proposal is highway robbery. The MTA presentation is a now and biased analysis and not speaking with the communities affected, including Chinatown, except that they so-called environmental justice groups. As a lifelong resident of Chinatown and Two Bridges community, the proposed congestion pricing will have devastating economic consequences for my community. The toll will deter many who normally shop and eat in Chinatown to go elsewhere and will drive Chinese mom and pop business operations out of business. Trucks coming in to supply food will be taxed and the cost will be passed on to the consumer. The targeting of CBD for congestion pricing is fundamentally racist. Chinatown is an important food resource for working families. We are an economic engine that provides an important tax base for the community. Congestion pricing is an existential threat to Chinatown. Congestion pricing will accelerate gentrification of New York City and will undermine the diversity the city has long been known for. The $60,000 cap is a joke. No serious exemptions for those who live in the zone, unlike the London Central Business District that's being proposed right now. Um, there's been flawed studies surrounding congestion pricing. The fundamental flaw in the studies of congestion pricing is its failure to examine or even mention the primary factors leading to the heavy congestion in lower Manhattan, especially on Canal Street. The tolls at the Verrazano Narrows Bridge force many vehicles, including trucks, to avoid going through Staten Island into New Jersey and pay a toll instead of, instead of going to Manhattan to New Jersey by utilizing the Free Holland Tunnel instead. Congestion in lower Manhattan as a result of these policies the city has enacted. Lyft and Uber and other car services has been given the green light creating much of the congestion. And of course we may face blowback as New Yorkers. Other issues including traffic and parking issues outside the zone and potential retaliation from other jurisdictions in responding to our tolls with the, their own tolls to New Yorkers. Congestion pricing to finance MTA appears to be a worthy goal. Providing for mass transportation is environmentally important and the most efficient way in transporting to New York City. The problem stems from the lack of accountability on how the MTA spends its money, especially the capital projects. This includes the 4.3 billion on just three stations for the Second Avenue subway line. Accountability first before any consideration of, for any we fair- include increase. your remarks. I would say that congestion pricing has nothing to do with reducing congestion and more determining factor yeah. for transforming and gentrifying lower Manhattan. Thank you. Our next speaker is Beatrice Chisholm, followed by our 160th person on our list, Dana Matarazzo. The next speaker is Dana Matarazzo, followed by Leo Strauss. Hi, not entitled driver here. My name is Dana Matarazzo and I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and why I vehemently oppose this most egregious insult to the hardworking citizens of this city and our suburban neighbors. The absolutely preposterous term car culture makes me cringe and roll my eyes like any real New Yorker would. I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I grew up in Park Slope in a house that was in my family for almost 100 years. I now live in Dongan Hill, Staten Island with my husband and three children in a home that has been in his family since it was built 68 years ago. My heart bleeds for the city. I'm actually on the West Coast right now. I've been up since 6.47 a.m. Pacific to talk to you people. I joke with my children that I grew up on the F train, which is true since I didn't get my driver's license until I was 25 years old. I walked everywhere, took the train or bus, and if that wasn't an option, called a car service before Uber. It's sort of ironic considering where I'm speaking now. I battled the stairs daily at the R train when I was in high school and still have family members who call the trains by their proper names, the C Beach, the IND, or the BMT. I'm a pediatric hematology oncology nurse and work on an inpatient unit in Manhattan where we take care of babies, children, and young adults undergoing cancer treatments and receiving bone marrow transplants. I've been a nurse there for the last 12 years. I've taken care of patients from as far away as South Africa and some as close as my own neighborhood. Patients and their families come to us to receive world-class medical care. Coming from the outer boroughs and commuting to the Upper East Side, my transportation options are limited. 
Like most healthcare workers, I do not work a conventional schedule and often work weekends. I work 12 and a half hour days. Using public transportation would triple my commuting time. There is only one bus line I could take on the weekends. During the work week, there are two buses I could take, one of which stops running at 7 p.m. My shift ends at 7.30. On a good day, I am out of work by 7.45, 8 o'clock. Most days, I often work late due to our patient security and our staffing needs. Those with opposing thoughts will say, nurses can work anywhere. You can work close to home if you don't like to commute. My rebuttal will remain that this is not my job at my calling. I love what I do, I'm good at what I do, and I can do what I do. If you've ever given chemotherapy to a baby, you know what I'm talking about. Some years back, I did actually try commuting in. The price of the parking garage had gone up, so I gave it a go for a few weeks. Obviously, I stopped because it took exponentially longer than driving to get home, and it was not feasible on the weekends. I noticed that when I rode the M15 Select, not one MTA employee collected a fare. Perhaps actually collecting fares on select buses would create revenue that the MTA so desperately needs. They might also considering prosecuting criminals who beat fares or look elsewhere, such as overt abuse and overtime pay and other sources of wasteful spending instead of hitting hardworking employees, uh, instead of hitting hardworking people where it hurts the most. As one who sits in Gowanus traffic at 5.50 a.m., I am not driving for pleasure. It is a necessity. If congestion pricing passes, I can guarantee this will be the final nail in the coffin for our formerly great city. The increase in costs alone would cripple my family personally and many, many others. Nightmarish traffic to surrounding neighborhoods would be the understatement of the millennia. All the money in the world will not improve or update the subways until Albany gets realistic about the rampant crime in this city. The repercussions will be felt for years to come. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Leo Strauss, followed by David Schroeder. The next speaker is David Schroeder, followed by Catherine Myers. The next speaker is Catherine Myers, followed by Amanda Friedman. The next speaker is Amanda Friedman, followed by Charlene Burke. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you everyone for providing me with the opportunity to speak in favor of congestion pricing. Driving a personal vehicle into a dense urban area is not a right, but a luxury and it should be priced accordingly. In our city, traffic violence is at an all time high and I'm in favor of any measures necessary to get cars off of our streets. As a cyclist, I look forward to experiencing a city with safer streets for cyclists and pedestrians and fewer traffic deaths. I implore you to implement congestion, congestion pricing with as few exemptions as possible, and especially not for groups like police officers who have made a habit of illegally parking all over our city's sidewalks and bike lanes. I believe that this program will give New Yorkers the push they need to reorient their lives around transit rather than car dependency. And I look forward to living in, a, in the world that this program will create. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Charlene Burke, followed by Charles Yu. The next speaker is Charles Yu, followed by Eric Schall. Our next speaker is Eric Schall, followed by Scott Henry. All right, my name is Eric Schall. I'm unaffiliated with any organization. Uh, I've seen the congestion pricing issue from a few sides and I wanted to comment. First of all, I lived in downtown Manhattan for over 20 years and I would never have dreamed of owning a car there. That's the first thing. Now I live in Rockaway Beach in Queens and I own a car. I hardly support congestion pricing. And uh, there are a lot of us who are willing to make small, small sacrifices for the good of the, of the city and for some semblance of a climate policy. And we've heard from some of them today and I'm another, I wanna add my name to the list. We rarely drive to Manhattan, my wife and I, we work from home. We may be going to the city four or five times a year. This won't have a big impact for us as far as the tolls go. However, I do worry about the public transit options for people who commute from Brooklyn and Queens. As it stands, bus and subway service is is bad and is on the weekends is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, so normally I work from home, but when I do commute to work on projects, I can spend up to two hours going to downtown Brooklyn or Manhattan via subway and bus. That's about 15 miles. And many of my neighbors 
who work and commute have to do that, especially on the weekends when I guess we pretend like people don't work and you know the, the transit system goes local. So, I mean, if you're worried about the impact on businesses, and I think you should, you absolutely need to improve public transit options for people in Brooklyn and Queens. As for exemptions, I've listened to many people's testimony, and I, I've some of it's convincing for people with disabilities. I believe yellow taxis should be the only exemption. I mean, over the city, I've watched, uh, over, I'm sorry, over the past decade, I've watched the city allow Uber and Lyft completely clog the streets and pump untold amounts of carbon pollution into city air, I mean, unchecked, right? 80,000, something like that vehicles. I mean, Uber claims to be essential to riders and transit deserts in the outer boroughs. So in that sense, they agree. They're essential in that boroughs and they have little to no place in Manhattan. If someone wants to take a Cadillac Escalade or Lincoln Navigator, basically a private limousine, if they wanna take that across town to go to brunch or something else, then they should have to pay an appropriate toll. I think that's only fair. And finally, I just wanna mention coordination. Um, you know, as there's so many agencies I see before me and I've dealt with various city agencies on this on similar problems in the past. And if you are not coordinated, this is absolutely not going to work. And if you're not demanding that the NYPD write tickets for people blocking bus lanes and other traffic violations, this will not work. I'm surprised there's no one from that agency here today. Anyway, I wish you the best and I hope it does work. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Scott Henry, followed by Michelle Winfield. The next speaker, the 170th on our list, is Michelle Winfield, followed by John Rummely. The next speaker is John Rummely, followed by Carl Wojciechowski. Good afternoon. I'm John Rumley, and I am a resident of Washington Heights, where I have lived with my family since the 1980s. Uh, we frequently, we are car owners. Uh, we also are, are frequent users of mass transit. And after thinking about it uh, at great length, we, we are in complete support of uh, congested pricing. Even though, and and in, and frankly, we're fully aware that we will end up paying for it um, um, because we end up driving periodically down to Lower Manhattan. Um, uh, the example that I give in terms of um, uh, changing my habits, and there are a lot of people that need to change their driving habits if we're going to uncongest Lower Manhattan, is um, um, the the cameras that they put around schools. Um, when those were in, uh, put in place, uh, I, I got caught speeding uh, around schools, uh, not excessively, but uh, enough that it was uh, deemed dangerous and I paid a toll. Uh, I stopped uh, speeding. I was very aware of, of, of what I was doing then. And um, I, I, I changed my habits. Uh, I expect congestion pricing will change our habits uh, and those of, of, of many others who decide to go down there. Uh, occasionally, I'm gonna end up paying it and I will uh, happily do so. One of the advantages, I think, of an uncongested lower Manhattan will be um, if um, I can drive around, get my uh, chores done, and then come home without having to sit in traffic. And, and uh, if, if this works, uh, I will be much happier. It'll be worth it. Uh, and I, I really uh, uh, greatly support it for that reason. Um, thank you very much. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. The next speaker is Carl Wojciechowski, followed by Mamadou Diallo. The next speaker is Mamadou Diallo, followed by Gady Perez. The next speaker is Gady Perez, followed by Gordon Lee. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm a resident of Manhattan. I live about 20 blocks outside of the congestion pricing area on 83rd Street. I think this is a terrible idea and it's an extra tax for the residents of Manhattan. You already took our parking away um, about two years ago, um, making us have to pay now for, for parking. In addition to that, you took away traffic lanes to give them to um, bicyclists that don't use them or abuse them and don't follow traffic laws. So a two lane street became a one lane street because now trucks and cars are parked on one of the lanes. So in addition to making life harder for us, now you're gonna make it more expensive. I work in Lower Manhattan and I have to leave work to pick up my daughter uh, on 92nd Street and go back to Lower Manhattan because she has special needs and she needs services in Lower Manhattan. This will tax my family $12,000 a year, just going one way. So this is wholly unfair, those of us that pay the taxes in Manhattan and that live in the area. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Gordon Lee, followed by Cynthia Nwamara. The next speaker is Cynthia Nwamara, followed by Shane King. The next speaker is Shane King, followed by Judy Densky. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I live in Central Harlem and work and start my video. Apologize for that. I work. I live in Central Harlem and I work in Midtown. As such, congestion pricing won't affect me because I commute by bicycle. Even so, I want to make the case for exempting motorcycles and scooters from congestion pricing, as most other congestion plans in the world already do. Doing so would have benefits and con for congestion, pedestrian safety, and I want to make make the case for why any plan must include residential permit parking as a necessary component. I support congestion pricing because there is simply no other way to dissuade people from driving into Manhattan than to make them pay for it. And it isn't hard to see that a lot of the commuters are drive SUVs and pickup trucks. These larger, taller, and heavy vehicles have had a devastating toll on pedestrian safety. As vehicles get safer and safer for the occupants, they become more and more deadly for pedestrians, cyclists, and smaller vehicles. The increased weight and taller, flatter grills are signif significantly more likely to cause fatal injuries than lighter cars or, um, or shorter cars. We are facing both a congestion issue and a safety issue. On, on average, a pedestrian is killed every three days in the city by a car, truck, or bus. In contrast, it's been five years since a single pedestrian has been killed by a motorcycle in Manhattan. When it comes to congestion, many more motorcycles can fit on the road than a car, SUV, or pickup three or four motorcycles can fit into the parking spot of a single car. Motorcycles get better gas mileage than any non-hybrid vehicle and scooters even more so. Motorcycles have virtually no impact on the roads compared to the wear and tear caused by the ever increasing weights of SUVs and pickup trucks. Many people already own motorcycles and that they don't even consider driving to the city. Exempting them will get some people to consider driving their pedestrian killing trucks in our crowded streets of our city. We should also consider returning the motorcycle only parking spaces that the city removed during the Giuliani and Bloomberg years. Anything that encourages smaller, more practical vehicles should be encouraged. An additional consideration when implementing the congestion pricing program is residential permit parking. Neighborhoods like mine in Harlem will become inundated with commuters searching for free parking once the congestion pricing takes effect. This is not acceptable. This is not fair to the residents and this is easily avoided. Permit parking like there is in virtually every other city in the country must be enacted. Is there any doubt that these commuting residents of Westchester, Long Island, New Jersey, and Connecticut would not tolerate their neighborhoods being overrun with vehicles searching for free parking? And parking shouldn't be free anyway. Why do those of us who own our vehicles think we are entitled to store our personal property on public streets at no cost. Permanent parking will have the added bonus of cracking down on stop laws who do not register the vehicles in New York and help alleviate the scourge of phony temporary plates that has infested New York. To sum up, motorcycle and scooters are part of the solution and to congestion and pedestrian safety and should be exempt from these congestion charges. Adequate parking should be allowed for motorcycles and encouraged to encourage their use. There is no implementing a congestion charge without residential permit parking, lest the neighborhoods outside of the congestion zone become a free parking haven for commuters, punishing the residents of the neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next speaker is Judy Densky, followed by Valentina Jones. Our next speaker is Valentina Jones, to be followed by our 180th person to sign up, Roberto Rodriguez. Are we up to me? Valentina? Okay. Yes, Valentina, My name is yeah. Valentina Jones. I'm a member of the Lower East Side Power Partnership. I'm speaking as an individual. I live in Manhattan. Oh. I live in Manhattan Community District 3, which is in the CBD tolling zone. I'm a senior citizen. I have several concerns, the majors being the present public health crisis. According to the Centers for Disease Control, early data suggests older people are twice as likely to have serious COVID-19 illness. This may be because as people age, their immune systems change, making it harder for their body to fight off disease and infection, end quote. According to WebMD, quote, researchers do know that a varied diet full of vitamin and mineral rich foods like fresh vegetables and fruits helps your body, including your immune system function at its best, end quote. After reading this, I take vitamins, eat vegetables, and fruits daily. It should not cost me or other seniors more to decrease risk of, COVID, uh, decrease risk of serious COVID-19, purchase fresh vegetables and fruit, enhance our immune system. My understanding is the other places that have implemented con congestion pricing did not do it during a global health, health crisis. I think that one of the approaches would be exempting trucks that bring vitamins and fruits and vegetables to Manhattan Community District 3. I think present public health crisis needs to be considered. According to the map, uh, figure 17-2, most of Manhattan Community District 3 is identified as environmental justice area. Manhattan Community District 3 is not a central business district. According to a slide presented on Saturday at this hearing, Southbound, quote, southbound slash northbound FDR Drive between East 10th Street and Brooklyn Bridge, quote, would experience adverse effects in the form of increased delays. This area is in Manhattan Community District 3. From 10th Street to the bridge of, to Brooklyn Bridge, Community District 3 are several New York City Housing Authority, Mitchell Lama, and affordable housing developments. My assumption is delays means congestion, Congestion eliminates the benefits such as better air quality stated for the central business tolling program for the residents of community district three who live next to the FDR. One of the things that health crisis has emphasized is that approaches in CD3 need to be reviewed before implementation occurs. One benefit stated is promoting equity across transit system. Presently, East Broadway and Delancey Street F stations, both in CD3, are not accessible. One thing to do would be to uh, accessorize these stations before congestion pricing is, in, is implemented in, com in Manhattan Community District 3. Once again, I urge, please look at uh, the health crisis and consider Good it. Thank remarks. you. Thank you. The next speaker is Roberto Rodriguez. We followed by John Similo. Hi, everybody. Hello, please proceed. Yeah, um, I need a, I need a, um, I need a translator in Spanish, please. You hear me? Translation services available in real time. Okay. Okay. Mi nombre es Roberto Rodríguez. Soy un taxista de la ciudad de Nueva York. Estoy aquí para oponerme al precio de la congestión en el distrito de negocios de Manhattan. He sido un taxista licenciado desde 2007. Soy originalmente de la República Dominicana e inmigré a la ciudad de Nueva York hace 20 años. La industria libre ha sido el sustento para mi familia. Hemos trabajado bien fuerte y me gusta brindar un servicio seguro y confiable de transporte a mi comunidad. Ser taxista en Nueva York conlleva a un conjunto de procedimientos, incluyendo pruebas de drogas, huellas dactilares, completar un curso de 24 horas, completar un curso de manejo defensivo de 6 horas y completar el curso de orientación para tráfico sexual. 
Además de cumplir con todos estos requisitos de la TLC, también tenemos que, que, que pagar por un vehículo, ya sea propio o alquilado, ponerlo en las mejores condiciones para el, tra el, el transporte de personas. Hago mi trabajo porque amo lo que amo como contratista independiente. Esto me brinda la flexibilidad de llevar a mis niños a la escuela, establecer mi propio horario de trabajo y decidir cuándo descanso o cuándo trabajo a tiempo completo. El precio de la congestión tiene un impacto peligroso y, ne y negativo en mi habilidad para ganarme mi sustento. Hasta el estado de Nueva York entiende que la medida causará mu que muchas personas no viajen al Distrito Central de Negocios de Manhattan. Esto significa que mis compañeros y yo no podemos transportar a los pasajeros en sus citas médicas. Pasajeros que van a tomar diálisis y que no pueden llegar a la parada de autobuses o, en el peor de los casos, no pueden viajar en el tren. Esta medida no solo es cruel para mí y mis compañeros, sino que es una ley despiadada para los inmigrantes como yo y para los inmigrantes de comunidades de color que no poseen recursos u otras alternativas. Sin temor a equivocarme, el precio de congestión me sacará de la industria y me dejará a mi, comu a mi comunidad desamparada. Una preocupación de nuestra industria es el aumento de la criminalidad que cada día me amenaza más. Muchos de nuestros compañeros han perdido la vida, pues los pasajeros se niegan a pagar y han reaccionado de manera violenta. Cuando tengan que pagar 20 dólares adicionales, nuestra seguridad también se verá afectada. Ya pagamos 2.75 dólares de sobrecargo para ir al distrito de negocios bajando la 95. He escuchado que el Estado propone facilitarnos el proceso de aplicación para convertirnos en empleados de la NTA. Si no nos queda, si nos quedamos sin trabajo, esto para mí es un insulto al esfuerzo y al proceso y al cumplir los requisitos que conlleva ser un taxista de la ciudad de Nueva York. Gracias. Ok, gracias. Your comment, your comment will be translated, indexed and responded to as part of the process. The next speaker is John Samillo, followed by Tinatin Charges Shavili. The next speaker is Tinatin Charges Shavili, followed by Pierre Benjamin. Next speaker is Pierre Benjamin, followed by Tal Barcelai. The next speaker is Tal. Barcelai, followed by Donna Myers. Paul, if you remove, take yourself off mute, we can hear you to begin your comments. You're still on mute. We cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. We will come back to you, Tal. The next speaker is Donna Myers, followed by Amanda Levine. The next speaker is Amanda Levine, followed by Bradley Hershenson. Hi, everybody. My name is Amanda Levine, as stated. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Manhattan, going on almost 50 years now. Um, my family actually on both sides arrived in New York in the mid-1800s. I actually took my permit test, my driver's test at school, um, and I currently live on 107th Street off of Broadway, and my dad lives on 42nd Street on the west side. 
Um, we both are on fixed incomes. My dad is now 77 years old, and along with his um, general aging health issues, he's a part of the Twin Towers Fund, where he incurred massive and life-altering health problems due to working down in that area during the attacks. Um, he's forced to participate in daily health care and constant doctor visits due to his issues that he occurred from 9-11. I am his sole caregiver. Um, I not only have to visit his home several times a week to ensure that he is taken care of in his daily life, but I am the one that drives him to all of his med medical appointments, which are multiple in number and several times per week and growing um, in the number of times he has to go. Um, um, and if this toll is put in place and charges are put in place, I don't know what I'm going to do. I own a car and drive happily in New York City. I'm proud of that. Um, and I'm scared and concerned and angry. Um, in all honesty, what are my dad and I going to do? Wow, we can not afford this charge. Sorry, I'm getting emotional. And who will care for him if not me? He needs to go to all of his medical appointments and I need to drive him to and from and wait for him um, from these appointments um, and each one of them. Um, we are not wealthy, nor are we even close to wealthy and we get by living in, in the city and barely get by as is. Um, I implore you, absolutely implore you, do not do this. Think about me, my dad, and the other people like us um, who live in the city here um, and need cars and cannot afford to pay these tolls and live here. This is just one of the issues concerning um, the congestion tolling for me, but this was the most important one and the one I chose to express to you because it is the most important to me and my dad, and this is what I wanted to focus on. Again, I implore you, and I'm actually quite begging you, which is something I don't do, to not put these in place. Um, I'm going to kind of give over the rest of my time um, to other people because I know you know this is time consuming, but I really appreciate it. And I, I truly hope that you will care for the people that actually live here and have lived here for the lifelong amount of time and really need to survive and drive. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Bradley Hershenson, followed by Kurt B. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. It's only been, what, six hearings in a row for eight hours a day. So now you know what it's like to be a student nowadays, especially on Zoom. Um, so my name is Brad Hershenson. Um, I'm a resident of the Upper East Side, and I've lived here my whole life. I'd like to speak against congestion pricing as it's outlined, and I'd like to just raise three points. So one, I want to say what message are we sending to seniors and those who are disabled? Uh, many of my neighbors have doctor's appointments, uh, particularly below 60th Street, and they can't use bikes or buses or subways to move around the city. Many people live on fixed incomes and they just simply can't afford $23 multiple times a week just to go to the doctor or go out the door um, for whatever the reason is. Second, I wanna mention that I'm concerned about the area like directly outside of the zone in terms of parking. And with such a high density, cars might be circling around for 30, 40 minutes, an hour, maybe even more, which is basically what it's like anyway right now, trying to find parking. And that higher VMT equals lower air quality. And we have many parks in my neighborhood where people are playing basketball, pickleball, they're running, jogging, walking their dogs. And something has to be done with respect to that, thinking about air quality. And lastly, if you're trying to solve a congestion problem, I don't think we should be attacking cars. I think we should be enhancing public transit and bike infrastructure. And I challenge anybody on this call to ride a bike right at the base of the 59th Street Bridge. It's really, really scary. If we make the infrastructure safer and better, more people will probably ride their bikes and walk around there. And fixing the infrastructure of the city for transit riders and bikers, pedestrians, I really believe is the solution. So to sum it up, and I'll save a minute of everyone's time, I don't think we can implement a plan that aims to relieve congestion while creating a handful of economic, social, and environmental hardships for our city's residents. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Kurt B, followed by Anna Packman. The next speaker is Anna Packman, followed by the 190th person to sign up, Brian Freeman. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Packman and I'm here in my personal capacity as a person with a disability who has lived in the congestion zone for the past 24 years. 
I do not own a car or drive, so I don't have a license plate. I'm also not able to use most public transportation because the system is largely not wheelchair accessible and Access Ride is often unreliable, has no same day service and uses routes that add hours to trips, leaving me exhausted to the point that it becomes difficult to do anything else. Instead, I rely on taxis, Ubers, Lyfts, friends and family to either get around or to get things to me. Congestion tolling will have an adverse impact on my life and those of thousands of numbers of New Yorkers with mobility disabilities because both the direct and indirect costs of getting anywhere will go up exponentially. Ubers and Lyfts are the most reliable on-demand wheelchair accessible services in the city, and they're already expensive. An additional surcharge would make them financially unattainable. This holds true for travel and personal cars too. So for example, my brother lives in a town in New Jersey that has no accessible transportation, so he drives into the city to pick me up. That's the only way I see my nephew. I'm also concerned about the cost of deliveries going up driving um, as I rely on delivery services for a lot of essentials. On top of that, there's the indirect impact that will result from neighborhood businesses raising their prices. All of this serves only to further isolate people with disabilities. Finding an affordable, accessible apartment in the New York City area is as common as finding a unicorn. So no, I can't just move, nor should I have to. Because of the outsized negative impact on the disabled community within the zone, which is already subject to a higher cost of living because of the various disability expenses that the non-disabled community doesn't even need to think about, I oppose the plan as is. Despite best intentions, it will only make life more difficult for people who cannot afford to shoulder this burden. There are other ways to raise the funds the MTA needs to raise other than taxing the very community that the MTA has continued to treat like second-class citizens since the 1990 passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Maybe try taxing all the billionaires who don't even live here instead. Thank you, and I speak the rest of my time. Thank you. The next speaker is Brian Freeman, followed by Robert Brisman. The next speaker is Robert Brisman, followed by Ariel Shafir. Good afternoon. And uh, on behalf of the Bus Association of New York, BANI, our membership and our millions of passengers, we appreciate the opportunity to provide comments on the environmental assessment, analyzing the impacts of the tolling plan. It's quite an undertaking and it's, in, and it's been quite impressive. Our membership strongly supports the CBD TV's goal and contributes daily to the Central Business District primary goals of reducing traffic congestion, mitigating carbon emissions, and generating revenues for the region's public transit system. I only have a short period of time and a few words to express strongly how important it is for us to all consider that buses, large buses, are the most efficient forms of mass transport for all passengers and minimize congestion. A single bus with 55 passenger often replaces 55 automobiles, therefore, therefore reducing congestion mitigation. And ironically, the more successful that these buses are in reducing congestion by taking cars off the road, the higher the tolls they and their passengers will be subject to pay if included in the Central Business District's tolling plan. A bus is environmentally clean due to the new uh, technology and engine emissions. Upon this review, it would be seen that bus travel through the central business would be encouraged, not discouraged by tolling it. Bandy believes it's to be mentioned that all transportation sectors have been negatively impacted by the pandemic. It is particularly disheartening that New York is even considering having its private motor coach companies further subsidize the MTA. Through the three pandemic federal stimulus acts, the MTA has received direct operating grants totaling $14.5 billion, while New York's motor coach companies continue contributing millions of dollars annually directly to the MTA's operations and maintenance. The EPA, the EA, excuse me, the Environmental Assessment Projects created, creating a tolled central business district will reduce vehicle congestion by as much as 20%. That's what they pro are projecting. If this is accurate, shouldn't the EA tell us if, they, if these drivers now 
go to the public transit or will they just not come into the CBD, further slowing the district's economic recovery. Finally, if the goal of the central business district tolling plan is to reduce congestion, then the use of privately owned motor coaches should be encouraged, not discouraged. One 55 passenger bus takes up to 55 cars off the road, utilizes less street space than 55 bikes, and emits less carbon monoxide than either commuter or inner city rail. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide testimony, and we look forward to working together through this review process. Thank, Thank you. you. The next speaker is Ariel Shafir, followed by Steve Azor. The next speaker is Steve Azor, followed by Carl Mahaney. The next speaker is Carl Mahaney, to be followed by LD. Hi, can you all hear me? We can, please proceed. Wonderful. My name is Carl Mahaney. I live in Manhattan and I fully support the implementation of congestion pricing with very limited exemptions. I'm an architect, a livable streets advocate, a husband, a father, a neighbor, a colleague, and a proud New Yorker. I believe in this city's ability to adapt, to evolve, and to lead. Congestion pricing is the law. It's happening. Decades too late and not a moment too soon. Your job now is to implement this program quickly in the most effective and fair way possible. Effective in raising desperately needed funds to improve public transportation and in reducing the harms wrought by an unchecked flood of vehicles on our streets. Fair to the majority of New Yorkers who rely on degraded and underfunded subways and buses to get around, who suffer from noise and air pollution and the loss of dignity and freedom because of the ever-present threat of traffic violence. Freedom means choice, not the choice to drag a multi-ton piece of heavy machinery along with you to your job in Manhattan, or to leave a polluting metal box on the street while you take in a Broadway show. Freedom is the choice to breathe clean air, to have a quiet conversation with neighbors on the street, to take a swift and reliable bus to the doctor, to ride your bicycle to middle school, these freedoms, these choices are denied to far too many New Yorkers by the status quo. Congestion pricing disrupts that harmful status quo. Congestion pricing is leadership. This program will work. It will be popular and it will expand in the years and decades to come. There will be tweaks along the way and that's good, that's progress. But let's start with the most robust scheme we can implement. The one that does the most good for the most people. We're so close. Let's stay focused on the goal. Less congestion, better transit, more choices for more New Yorkers. We need congestion pricing now with very limited exemptions. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is LD followed by Henry Ward. The next speaker is Henry Ward followed by Veronica Mosey. The next speaker is Veronica Mosey, followed by Lee Arthurs. The next speaker is Lee Arthurs, followed by Mick Wynn. The next speaker is Mick Wynn, followed by Mary Lou Avanzino. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Michael Nguyen and I live in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn. I'm a writer and comedian. As a comedian, I fear for the future generations of the city should we pass congestion pricing. I fear that with congestion pricing in place, my children will be robbed of that God-given birthright of every New Yorker, that of complaining loudly and frequently about the MTA. I, for one, love being able to lament the conditions of our crumbling infrastructure. In, fast, in fact, <clears throat> the vast majority of my comedy routine is dedicated to living in a city where public transit fails. If we support congestion pricing and public transit, what will I joke about now? The airport? LaGuardia is pretty nice now. The MTA needs to consider that failing public transit, in fact, creates jobs by giving comedians fertile ground for new material. Every time the Long Island Railroad train is canceled, every time the F train refuses to show up, every time there's a track fire, Every time we decide not to invest in sustainable transportation uh, in a sustainable transportation future, 
that's not just a mild inconvenience or short-sighted decision-making, that's comedy gold. I shudder to think of a future where our progeny can enjoy efficient, effective, and inexpensive public transit. What will they complain about? Surely the Mets will continue to disappoint, but what else? I look forward to a time in the future when sea levels have risen, extreme weather conditions are commonplace, and our city, city infrastructure has collapsed. A time perhaps three, four, maybe even five years away when we can look back on this day at this meeting when we decided not to rob our children of that bleak future. A future that, while well, perhaps a living nightmare to live in, gives them something fun to talk about at cocktail parties. That's, of course, assuming that anyone can get to cocktail parties because of the aforementioned collapsed infrastructure. Please think of the children. Thank you. I see you the rest of my time. The next speaker is our 200th person to sign up, Mary Lou Avanzino, to be followed by Carrie Flaherty. Thank Mary you for Duke. that. Yes. Ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mick, for that humor. It makes this whole event that much more palatable. Good afternoon, DOT and MTA staff, and, and hello, support staff making this meeting possible. I appreciate the work you are doing to make the Central Business District more livable. I am a pedestrian and a bicyclist in favor of congestion pricing because moving around Manhattan can be a dystopian experience because too many vehicles are trying to use too little street space. Doing nothing is not an option. But after listening to scores of citizens' concerns, I do sympathize with their fears. You, MTA staff and DOT staff, have your work cut out for you to appropriately soften the effect of what congestion pricing will have. But the fact is, if nothing is done, the quality of life in Manhattan will continue to deteriorate. I wanna highlight, what I wanna highlight is enforcement or more accurately, the lack of enforcement. Currently vehicles all over the city double park obstructing flow of traffic with impunity. Vehicles shamelessly block bike lanes. I rarely see traffic officers enforcing parking ordinances Today, I read that the MTA loses 144 million to bridge toll evaders, evaders. I'm not sure of the accuracy of that number, but I'm sure it's a lot of money that MTA loses. When there's a problem, when there's, then there's the problem of drivers who purposely deface or obscure their car license plates or use false placards. If MTA continues to not address these problems, how can MTA ex be expected to successfully implement congestion pricing? It's important for MTA to get a handle on the rule evaders for the public to have confidence in the fairness of the system. There, that, that's a lot of money for MTA if it actually collected fees and tolls lost to lack of enforcement, evasion of tolls and placard falsifications. If this money could be added to the projected congestion toll fees to be collected, then congestion pricing tolls wouldn't have to be so high, perhaps. Once again, I'm in favor of congestion pricing. If we maintain the status quo, we will, we will be putting our heads in the sand and traffic conditions will worsen. Thank you for taking my comment into consideration. I yield my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carrie Flaherty, followed by Juan Carlos Marin. Our next speaker is Juan Carlos Marin, followed by Emma Cintron. Our next speaker is Emma Cintron, followed by John Rosmus. Our next speaker is John Rosmus, followed by Denise Hebe. Good afternoon, everybody. Can can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry about the video. Uh, my camera isn't working today. Um, 
I, I am an outer borough resident in Brooklyn, and I, and I oppose this congestion pricing. Uh, as I walk through Manhattan, all I see are Uber, Lyft vehicles, city vehicles, MTA vehicles, and trucks. Um, I don't understand why everybody is being punished by this congestion pricing when Uber and Lyft are making up the majority of the traffic. The studies even showed from 2010 that Uber and Lyft and all these ride-sharing companies are causing most of the traffic in Manhattan. How come they aren't part of the medallion system where we can limit some of these cars in Manhattan? That, that would be a better solution than punishing everybody. Um, I, I also wonder where this could, this surcharge when I when I use an Uber, for example, well, like wh where is this coming from to the MTA? How is the MTA using this money? Uh, the MTA also got a federal bailout recently. Well, where where is this money going to? I, I I just don't understand why the MTA needs more and more money when service is still bad. Um, furthermore, um, congestion is caused by the sheds, for example, the open streets, the plazas. There, there is no room for cars to drive anymore. And all this stuff is making streets more dangerous. When I walk on the street, I don't even have a car, but I don't feel comfortable with, with these new projects that are happening everywhere in the city. Um, and that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Denise Hebe, followed by Joan Kimmel. Our next speaker is Joan Kimmel, followed by Michelle Coopersmith. Our next speaker is Michelle Coopersmith, followed by Carolyn Protas. Michelle, you may begin your remarks. Michelle, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. You may begin your remarks. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, great, thanks. Good afternoon, thanks for your time. My name is Michelle Coopersmith. I'm a resident of Manhattan Community District 3 and a member of Community Board 3. I'm not here speaking on behalf of the Community Board, but I want to speak to my experience there, which has shown me that we need to implement congestion pricing immediately with no exemptions other than the ones already stipulated by the law. The law. My neighborhood, the Lower East Side, is plagued with congestion from cars heading towards the Williamsburg Bridge. For years, we have asked the Department of Transportation for solutions to mitigate the safety, noise, and pollution issues we face, but we have repeatedly been told by the agency that the only answer is congestion pricing. We have explored many options that the neighborhood has uh, suggested, that DOT has suggested, and none of them will be sufficient to keep our people safe. I no longer feel safe crossing the street with my dog because people will drive the wrong way, go around other cars, or blow red lights just in an attempt to save 30 seconds to get to the bridge. And as one of the city's oldest neighborhoods, our grid is not designed for this amount of car traffic, and we are desperately in need of congestion pricing now. I support no additional carve outs because the point of congestion pricing is to reduce the number of car trips into the central business district. Exemptions will continue to induce demand and there is a minimum contribution from congestion pricing to the MTA. So any additional carve outs will inequitably make the congestion tolling more expensive, expensive for those subject to them. So please congestion pricing now and no new carve outs. Also, it's amazing that so many people who signed up to speak here today have designated themselves experts on economic development, traffic engineering, environmental science, behavioral science. And so I please ask you to ignore that misinformation as I know that you are the experts here and do what's right, which is to implement congestion pricing as soon as possible because we need it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carolyn Protas followed by LD. Our next speaker is LD, followed by John Marcus. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Having to clean up my blood on the train was something we did not have on our agenda. A direct quote from ABC News article today, rideshare and food delivery workers protested outside the MTA during this hearing. 
of the 561 comments in a New York Times article, the top one readers picked is, nice, strike while the iron is cold as ice, abandoned storefronts, people moving out, businesses moving out, and people working from home. You could not have chosen a worse time. Your slide seven shows the analysis is flawed. Your underlying data ended in 2019, which preceded the unprecedented devastating pandemic, which created a hybrid workforce, thereby decreasing congestion. Multiple slides show you are redistributing congestion, thus redistributing the adverse effects on the environment. By no means are you improving the overall environment. You acknowledge there are adverse effects and have no proof that your mitigation will be successful. You discuss temporary disruptions. Temporary is relative. You do not address the impact of those disruptions. You have not addressed the impact on tourism, entertainment, culture. The overwhelming number of people who have spoken are against congestion pricing. These legally required meetings are addressing the MTA people who want the plan and need the money and will not stop the program, which was approved in the New York budget. The only way to impact this price grab is for people to contact Governor Hochul, state senators, and state assemblymen. The group of people who will be impacted enormously, the elderly, mostly do not use technology or own devices to enable access to Zoom. The fact was highlighted during COVID with the elderly's challenges to register for vaccines. There is an impacted community missing from these meetings. Many seniors are incapable of using mass transit. Easy Pass requires account holders to leave a $25 minimum sitting in an Easy Pass account. That is ridiculous for Easy Pass to keep $25 just to have an account open if the account is not being used. Think of the interest on the collective $25 that Easy Pass is taking, holding. What is being done with that money? There should not be a $25 minimum to keep an Easy Pass account open. For some, $25 is a hardship. People have testified your price grab will push them out of their homes. If you move forward with this plan, it will represent tone deafness. You will tear apart the fabric of New York. The exorbitant fees you propose can make the difference of people not being able to afford food, medications, or their homes. Your plan harms the vulnerable. Please stop moving forward with the in inhumane plan, which will harm and cripple everyday New Yorkers. It will have unintended consequences that have not been adequately studied. Why is the chair and the CEO of the MTA not present at these meetings? Where is the $15 billion the MTA was recently given? It is an insensitive and inhumane selfish money grab for the MTA and disproportionately and adversely affects and places an undue Please burden on minorities remark. and disadvantaged people. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joshua Marcus. Excuse me, Jonathan Marcus, followed by Emilio Estella. Hi, uh, this is, I'm Jonathan. Uh, I'm a resident of the CBD, and I'm very excited for congestion pricing. Every time I go through the city in a car, I just remind myself, you're not stuck in traffic, you are traffic. The all this congestion, that's us. That's all the people here trying to get places. And I know that if I want a better city, I myself have to like make different decisions. And so even though this uh, even though this congestion tax will affect me, I'm not here asking for carve outs. I'm not here asking for exemptions. I'm gonna take this price increase and I'm gonna go take the subway, which will run faster because of the tax. I'm gonna go take the bus which will move faster because there's less traffic in its way. I'm gonna go bike and not have to swerve around as many cars, or I'm gonna walk and inhale a lot less uh, automobile fumes. Every other mode of transportation gets better from this tax. And so that'll make it even easier for me to make a better decision, which helps everyone. And if everyone thinks the same way I do, then we'll have less traffic and the city will be more livable. Now, people are, a lot of people mentioned you know, the taxes, this is going to, you know, think of all the hard working folk. I'm a stay at home dad. My wife is an architect and she deals with electricians, carpenters, and plumbers every day. And you know what? They all have baked into their hourly rates. Their, their hourly rates are extremely high because they know how much time they spend in traffic. If they spend less time in traffic with all their tools, with their ladders, 
they could get to more job sites a day and they would make more money, which would more than offset this, uh, this, this tax. So that's the thing we all need to remember is it's about time. We're already paying for the congestion. It's just that we're paying it for, we're paying for it with in this noise and this air quality and the time we all spend to get anywhere. And if we can make our city less congested, then we all get more time and time is money. And so it all comes back to what will we individually do? We're not stuck in traffic, we are dirt traffic. Let's make different decisions, all of us, no exemptions, and let's make the city better. It's about time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emilio Estella, followed by Christopher Ryan. Our next speaker and 211th on the list is Christopher Ryan, followed by Julian Klein. Hello. You may begin I'm your own. Hi, my name is Chris Ryan. I'm a, a cyclist in New York City for almost 30 years now, but I am opposed to congestion pricing. Why? Because I am also a vehicle owner, not because I'm a masochist or anything, but because I need to get around the city as a film technician to various places all around the five boroughs, all around the surrounding tri-state area that are not served by public transportation at times that are not convenient. I'd be places at six in the morning. I'd come off of jobs at 11 p.m. I have to carry tools. I have all of these things. And most importantly, I live in the congestion zone. I live in downtown Manhattan. There are still people who live here. It is not just a tourist destination and the residents there are not just ATMs to be used for unlimited money. And there's no proof that this will reduce congestion. In London, they say it's reduced at 20%. That's still, let's say we get that great result. It's still 80%. All these deadly cars and all this demonization of people who actually use vehicles, blue collar workers. There's still going to be 80% of us out there. The city often in truck people being served who don't get served by public transportation. Seniors I have a family of four. We take our we take neighbors to medical. I take my other neighbors to visit grave sites on weekends. The car is used. It's been a blessing. I've survived 20 years without a car. When I was a single privileged person like these young people who think the whole life can be solved by just biking around, I'm not sending my girls to school on streets that are 80% full with cars that are moving faster because of this alleged congestion, lack of congestion, you know, at least things slow down for about two hours at rush hour each day. It's, um, it's not going to reduce the congestion. It's, going to, it's another tax. It's another mismanagement of money. And I implore you to make complete exemption for anyone below 60th Street in Manhattan. If we live here, we cannot be charged for the right to move in and out of our houses. Uh, not a discount, and not for a discount, people make under $60,000, which is a fraction of a percentage who has six, makes $60,000 a year and has a car. And we are not privileged enjoying our cars. It, you know, car is a major pain in the butt. And I know the people who have cars in our neighborhood, and they're not privileged people. They would have a garage if so. There's community of people who deal with the alternate side parking and all that stuff, and we know each other. And we need cars. Some people need cars. Your privileged young lives are not everyone's reality. I cannot afford this tax, no tax for anyone under 60th Street. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julian Klein, followed by Teddy Edris. Good afternoon and thank you for your time. My name is Julian Klein. I'm the head of policy at Tech NYC. Tech NYC is a nonprofit member-based organization representing over 800 technology companies in New York. 
We work with government and community partners to make New York the best place in the country to build and grow a technology company. Tech NYC supports congestion pricing. We recognize the impact it will have on reducing congestion in Manhattan and generating funding for the MTA. It will improve quality of life and make the city more attractive to workers, especially in industries such as tech. In choosing the best CBD tolling model, it is important to, to evaluate not just the revenue, but the impact the tolls will have on drivers, commuters, and visitors. The MTA should consider the consequences of excessively tolling for higher vehicles, such as Lyft, Uber, and Revel. Unreasonably high tolls will lead to higher fees for passengers, reduced income for drivers, and a poorer quality of life for New Yorkers. Currently, each FHV ride contributes a 0.3775% tax and a $2.75 fee to the MTA for rides originating, passing through, or ending in Manhattan south of 96th Street. We recommend that the MTA continue the existing $2.75 congestion, congestion surcharge for FHVs and that the MTRB and MTA choose a toll structure that exempts taxis and FHVs from any new CBD entrance tolls. Given that the congestion surcharge was intended to pay for subway repairs, we recommend that the surcharge's revenue be incorporated into the new congestion pricing program to increase bonding capacity. Because the proposed CBD tolls are higher than the current congestion surcharge, it is understandable that in lieu of a new FHV toll to enter the CBD, that the existing surcharge amount may have to be increased as well. The MTA must also assign a policy for tolls applied on share or pool rides. If CBD entrance tolls for FHVs are not exempted, we recommend that the tolls be the lowest amount possible while balancing reasonable toll rates placed on passenger vehicles. Regarding new employment options for FHV drivers impacted by congestion pricing, we also support further collaboration that expands FHV drivers' ability to accept excess a ride customers. As the number of wheelchair accessible for hire vehicles on the road has increased in recent years, rideshare platforms offer a terrific opportunity to modernize accessible transportation in New York City. Lastly, we are also concerned with the impact congestion pricing will have on truck traffic outside of Manhattan. We encourage the MTA to coordinate with the state and city on plans for encouraging electric vehicle truck usage and increasing the charging- Please conclude your remarks or EVs in the Bronx and throughout New York City in order to reduce any increase in emissions. Thank you. Changes in these. Our next speaker is Teddy Edris, followed by Richard Robbins. Our next speaker is Richard Robbins, followed by Kevin Garcia. Our next speaker is Kevin Garcia, followed by Adina Shulamson. Hi. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for your time today and your endurance. My name is Kevin Garcia, and I'm the Transportation Planner with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Uh, founded in 1991, NICHA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low-income communities of color in the struggle for environmental justice. NICHA and other environmental justice advocates have supported the concept of congestion pricing for over 15 years. However, to be a truly environmental just plan, congestion pricing cannot lead to any increases in traffic or emissions in EJ communities, particularly the Bronx. From the environmental assessment, it is projected that truck traffic and emissions will increase on some roadways in the Bronx. The CLCPA called for the identification of disadvantaged communities to properly steer 35 to 40% of the states and federal Justice 40 clean energy funds to the most climate vulnerable communities. Under the draft climate re uh, criteria released by the Climate Justice Working Group, nearly the entire Bronx qualifies as a disadvantaged community. Also under the CLCPA, DEC has embarked on an unprecedented hyperlocal air monitoring program for 10 counties across the state, including the Bronx, with the intent of identifying mitigation opportunities. In fact, in her state of the state book, Governor Hochul herself announced intention to transform Hunts Point into a clean distribution hub. 
the MTA's in intent to address increased traffic and emissions in the Bronx is woefully inadequate. The MTA and the Hoka administration have obligations and ample opportunities to not just shoot for a net zero approach to increasing traffic and emissions in the Bronx, but rather to commit to a net positive approach where the action leads to lower levels of emissions than would have otherwise occurred under the MTA's proposal. Here are some community supported policies that can reduce emissions over and above expected traffic emission uh, increases and a more com uh, comprehensive list will be submitted with our full testimony next week. Uh, first, electrifying the Hunts Point market, including eliminating the use of all stationary diesel reefer units for auxiliary storage at the Hunts Point food market and installing curbside charging stations and grid connections. Second, creating green loading zones and cool corridors. Third, replacing NIPA peaker power plants in the South Bronx with clean renewable energy plus battery storage. Fourth, uh, establish a, a marine freight terminal in Hunts Point to displace trucks. Fifth, uh, capping the Cross Bronx Expressway. We need emission mitigation policies for the Bronx that are transparent, accountable, and measurable. For congestion pricing to authentically deliver on its promise for environmental justice, it must deliver on overall traffic and emission reductions in the Bronx and other EJ communities, and not an indulge uh, in emissions accounting sleight of hand. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adina Shulimson, followed by Michael Berman. Our next speaker is Michael Berman, followed by Dominic Sinino. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Berman. I am the day and night family of companies chief operating officer. Given the ubiquitous presence of the black and white day and night refrigeration, black and white day and night HVAC, white and black all service kitchen equipment technician vans in New York Central Business District, one could say we are part of the problem being discussed today. The research, analysis, and presentation opening today's session is all very impressive. But echoing several other speakers, most notably Representative Weprin, the impressive is insufficient. My purpose attending today's hearings is to speak on behalf of the core industry the day and night family of companies serves, the very sector that separates New York City from all other cities in the world hospitality. So many of those in support of congestion spike pricing spoke about the quality of life in New York. And so certainly the restaurants, hotels, bars, venues define that quality. We have all been, every person, every sector of the economy, every institution savaged by COVID-19 right up to the present day of inflation and scarcity and everything. But none have been more devastated than the restaurants, hotels, venues. There's a very long complicated road ahead for hospitality and survival is not certain. To impose these fees at this time in this fashion would be crippling if not lethal to our great hospitality industry. Now I open by saying that the volume of our company technician vans is part of the problem. I'm participating to be a big part of the solution. Rather than imposing these fees, that will be passed through to the customers that are already burdened by everything from fuel surcharges to other uh, and financial matters they cannot handle. Let us join with you to come up with the proper solutions. The day and night family of companies, among other things, hosts an annual hospitality and food waste summit. Along with our customers, we all want to reduce carbon emissions, increase productivity, generate greater efficiency in a safer environment. Include us and we will deliver constructive, comprehensive solutions. And we will energetically get behind the right program. We all want the same thing. Let's do it together. You have my contact information. Please take me up on this. And lastly, when I do commute in and out of the city, you will find me on Metro North and the subway. I yield the remaining 15 seconds, thanking you so much. Please take me up on it. We wanna participate. We can solve it better with you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dominic Sinino, followed by Martin Lansman. 
Our next speaker and 220th on the list is Martin Landsman, followed by Jacob Yahian. Martin Landsman. Join us, panelists. You are unmuted and may begin your remarks. My business has been at the same location in Soho since 1954. New Yorkers must understand that the congestion pricing proposal presents a major tax increase that will have a direct dramatic effect on New York business and residential communities. If you think I don't have a car, so who cares about this plan, or I never drive into that area anyway, think again. The impact of this plan is massive and will affect an untold number of people in unforeseen ways. This plan, the first in the United States, currently targets what has been one of the most vital and economically productive areas in the world. But let's not forget that businesses have a choice in where to locate. From a strictly commercial point of view, why would anyone consider starting a new enterprise in an area with an extra financial liability, unlike any other locality in the United States? Many municipalities give tax incentives for businesses to open, but this plan does the opposite. Look at the increasing number of vacant stores in New York City and think carefully if this plan would hasten additional closures. Businesses would be subject to declining sales as customers decide whether obtaining merchandise directly from a location within the zone is worth the extra toll. Once this trend starts, it will be impossible to reverse. Every product and service coming into the congestion area will see an increase in cost that will be passed on to residents and remaining businesses. From potatoes and lumber to the plumber and electrician, everything will cost more as stores and service personnel pass on the cost to the end user. The proposed toll for vehicular traffic would be burdensome at best. The, the toll for trucks and commercial vehicles would simply be onerous. The cost of each product we sell will have to increase to offset the extra inbound freight charges. This type of pricing makes us less competitive in the marketplace. If our sales are affected in a negative way, the tax revenue that we send to the city will also be affected. Businesses generate sales tax that are paid to the city to support services and quality of life issues. Please do not make it harder to operate in New York City. There is no question in my mind that my long established business will be harmed by this massive, overburdened, overregulated proposal. The effects will be immediate and devastating to the business community and the city's overall economy. Uh, this plan will kill the goose that laid the golden egg. This, this, this uh, I, I, I foresee a bureaucratic nightmare that is being proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacob Gahian, followed by Alexander Ross. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jacob Yahayan. I'm the CEO of Urban Logistics Advisory Services. I'm a proud Brooklynite. My Savage and Yahayan family have been proud New Yorkers for over 100 years. And I can tell you as a business owner who has 100 people working across the city, I oppose the um, so-called congestion tax. I have lived in London and Singapore and not the uh, statistics that have been provided today are entirely accurate. First off, I wanna bring everyone's attention to that. Over the last eight years, single family residents, small mixed use property owners, property taxes have increased 100%. We are already paying various types of surcharge taxes in numerous usage of assets. And those of us individuals who essentially do have to make a trip to Manhattan are already paying upwards of 20 to 30% taxes already, including company rental cars, which come to almost a usury level of 25 to 30%. If we're really here to address the congestion and air quality scenario, the urban planning over the last 20 years have been an abysmal failure. 
particularly around Cross Bronx and particularly around Brooklyn, Gowanus, and so on and so forth. The density has become almost um, unforgivable levels. And that's really the true cause behind a lot of the air quality uh, scenarios of the poor density and poor urban planning. New York City small businesses are shutting down. Small business operators are moving out. Middle income families are moving out. The statistics that you all have been using are pre-COVID pandemic levels. And I fear uh, that we're going into a macro level of timing this additional regressive tax in the worst possible time at all. I would submit to the MTA and the DOT for every $100 million in operating efficiency you save, then come back to the business community and ask for that additional match funding to improve this type of congested scenario. Not just to blindly ask every small business owner, every New York City uh, individual who has to make that essential trip to Manhattan uh, pay the tax. Thanks very much. Enjoy the Labor Day weekend. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alexander Ross, followed by Merrick Kruzelniki. Our next speaker is Merrick Kruzelniki, followed by Francis Duffy. Our next speaker is Francis Duffy, followed by Catherine Freed. Hello, uh, my name is Fran Duffy. I am a musician. I'm a member of Local 802, the American Federation of Musicians Union, and I play Broadway shows and at Carnegie Hall, Radio City, City Center, the Domena Center, Carol's Music, Lincoln Center, and various other venues throughout Manhattan and the tri-state area. Um, I'm a harpist, and if you can see in the background, those are my instruments. Those are not instruments that can be taken on the subway or any other form of public transportation. A lot of musicians have large instruments, large musical equipment that cannot be taken on public transportation. I wish I didn't have to have a car, but I do have to have a car. And the only way for me to get my instrument into the city is to drive it in. Um, when I don't need to drive an instrument in, before the pandemic, I absolutely used to try and take the train and public transportation. It is unfortunately not reliable enough. Um, it's not acceptable for me to be late for a Broadway show. They don't hold the curtain for the harpist. So I take it upon myself to drive in. I'm usually driving in off hours. Um, if I get out of a Broadway show and I miss the train that I was hoping to get to, it's a 40, 45 minute wait for the next one in a very unsafe Penn Station or a very unsafe Port Authority bus terminal. This is not a choice that I want to make. This is a choice I have to make for my own safety. Right now, the city is dangerous. The subways are dangerous. Everything is a nightmare in the city. And unless it gets cleaned up, congestion pricing is not gonna make a difference. The only thing congestion pricing is gonna do is it's gonna price people like me, middle income, middle class people just trying to scrape a living together it's going to price us out of being able to make a living. Um, there's a the Broadway industry alone contributes over 14 billion dollars to the ec the economy of New York City. If, is this really how you want to get people and tourists back into the city, making it more difficult for them to afford to come in? And and why to use us on the backs of us workers? to improve the, the MTA and the subway. Make it safe and people will come. Improve it, people will come and they will naturally not drive. So the other issue is um, where does all this money go with the MTA? How, when is it ever gonna stop? It seems to be a black hole. All this money goes in and we never see the benefits of it. I'm a New Yorker too, I live in New Jersey. I used to live in Manhattan, but I can't afford it anymore. I couldn't afford it with my car because I have to move a harp. A lot of musicians and middle-class people are gonna be priced out of being able to stay in this area. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Freed, followed by 
Erin Tunsil. Catherine Freed. Our next speaker is Erin Tunsil. Erin, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Erin Tunza. I am a Manhattan resident. First of all, I wanna thank the panel for accepting such a daunting task of applying fairness when, uh, when with the congestion charging. Um, Again, my name is Erhan Tunsel. I'm not only uh, testifying as a New York City resident, Manhattan resident, I'm also testifying on, on behalf of uh, New York City Yellow Medallion taxi owners. I'm an owner driver of a New York City Yellow Medallion. And um, I just want to clear out a fact and urge, urge the panel not to compare apples and oranges and put them in the same basket. I um, I like to remind everyone that uh, there were 11, a little over 11,000 uh, medallion taxis serving the right in public in, uh, in New York City for 65 years until Mayor Giuliani decided to auction off more medallions. And, um, and that was followed by uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Mayor de Blasio. And each time New York City wanted to auction off a medallion, uh, they had to get permission from New York State. And a major EPA study was done by New York State uh, deeming every single medallion that's auctioned off or, or on the street serving the right in public as a non-air polluting, non-noise polluting, and not contributing to traffic in New York City streets, including the or, or CBD aka congestion zone. You have to remember that, that every yellow taxi medallion have been deemed non-congestion vehicle. They, uh, the, we are essential part of New York City transit system. We move hundreds of thousands of people every single year. And um, there is also another fact that only half of us are on the road. Currently, uh, about 13,500 medallions uh, exist, but only about 7,000 serve in the New Yorkers. I think everybody knows why and what happened. I'm not going to go there. Uh, what I'm going to go is um, we have Uber, Lyft, Via, and Rebel, and all private companies with unlimited supply of financial capital dollars. And they were allowed by the same regulators, which regulates yellow taxis, to add a force of 100,000 plus vehicles onto New York City streets, mostly cruising CBD, without much of an oversight as far as environmental impact of such a huge number of vehicles. Since then, there were many studies done showing ride share companies, as they like to Please call themselves, your remarks. as main culprits of the late traffic congestion problem in CBD. Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard Robbins, followed by Catherine Freed. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for holding this hearing. My name is Richard Robbins. I live in the Upper West Side, own a car, 
a bike, a Metro card, and many pairs of walking shoes. I know I've been on the other side of many public hearings, and I know how hard it is to listen to so many people. I applaud you for doing so. I'm going to make just three quick points. Number one, the only way that New York City functions is if most people take public transportation. If all estimated 1 million people traveling into the central business district every day took cars, whether private or taxis, there'd be complete gridlock. People who drive or take taxis are completely dependent on millions of other people taking public transportation. Number two, congestion pricing benefits the million people who take public transportation, but impacts many fewer people who, are, who drive. However, the people who drive are more vocal because they're finally being asked to help pay the costs of all those people who take public transportation, which again, as per my first point, prevents complete gridlock. In deciding whether to move forward, please realize that speakers today are part of a vocal minority, while millions of people benefit from this proposal. Number three, a report two days ago this, from Germany found that a ticket that let people use public transportation across Germany for only nine euros, less than $9 a month, prevented some 1.8 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions over the three months it was available. About 10% of a billion trips, 100 million trips would otherwise have been made using cars. With our climate in crisis, we need to make it more attractive for people to take public transportation rather than private cars or taxis. For the benefit of the millions of New Yorkers who would benefit from this, please move forward with this plan and please do not give in to the special interests that are trying to weaken this vital step. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Freed, followed by Amadeo Helen. Catherine, you are unmuted and may begin your remarks. Catherine, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hi, I don't know if you can see me. We can hear you, we cannot see you. Okay, I hit the video, but it doesn't seem to work. Oh, hi, there I am. All right, uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I've been a resident of Lower Manhattan for over 50 years. I'm a former council member and a former New York State Supreme Court judge. Um, I'll try and keep this quick because I know people have gone over a lot of these. I support the idea of congestion pricing. I just have serious questions about this. One of the things I think we should be trying to do is that, well, first I'd like to know where the money went that's already been paid into the MTA and where this money will go and if we can have some kind of auditing to make sure that we can track where it goes. I would suggest that we use congestion pricing also to change some habits, for instance, trying to get encouraged vehicles to come in at off peak hours. I would also suggest that we start not charging for electrical, especially electric for higher vehicles to encourage them to become completely electrical, which would certainly reduce a lot of the pollution. So everyone would agree that it's, uh, they caused a lot of the pollution. I'd also like to see an economic impact study because a lot of things have changed since when you did the original surveys for this because it was pre-COVID. Um, I live in a transit de desert, which is also an environmental justice community on the Lower East Side. Your own figures show that between the Brooklyn Bridge and the 10th Street will be um, adversely impacted by pollution. This is, uh, this is an area that has 110,000 units of NYCHA housing. It's over, overwhelmingly people of color and low, lower income. And, in, and so not only are we gonna to have to pay for higher services and products, but we will also not even get the benefits of uh, lower congestion and less pollution. So you've really got to look at that. Your own figures show that you may actually exceed the secret threshold for the amount of pollution that it's causing. And I don't think changing a few traffic lights around is gonna make the difference. If you look on ways that you can um, Mitigate that. Maybe you should look at covering the FDR drive and uh, stopping that pollution. 
because recently we also got our park destroyed. I would also suggest we need better bus transportation because our bus transportation sucks. And obviously we're nowhere near a, um, we're nowhere near a subway station because we are a transit desert and you should look into maybe uh, putting in elevators or escalators in the closer uh, stops at, at specifically Essex Street and Delancey Street. And finally, we don't live in the Central Business District. We're a community and it's unfair to price us in a way as though we were in the Central Business District when we get all the negatives and none of the Please positives. So how room. about a carve out? All right, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amadeo Pellin, followed by Zaire Baptiste. Our next speaker is Zaire Baptiste, followed by Wayne Chin. Uh, yes. So yes, um, thank you for having this. And uh, I first want to say, it's a bit, a bit disappointing that someone would gaslight others as unfit or not being knowledgeable to speak here and ask you to ignore them. So I would like you to ignore that. Um, the MTA is not losing money because of cars. It's losing money because of years of documented mismanagement of funds and poor overall management of their systems. It's not driver's faults. Multiple streets throughout the city have been turned into public streets, which is okay. Bike lanes such as 8th Avenue, which is a major corridor, which had its usable lanes reduce increase in traffic around MSG. Construction and development go undeterred, dining sheds, city bike docks, and the list goes on. None of this has been addressed, and that's a problem that was created, and then congestion pricing is being justified as a solve for that. Congestion pricing is based on what has taken place in other regions, and drivers are being forced to pay for a service that, for the most part, we do not use, and adding a toll will not make me make the will not make me take the train or the bus. The MTA board has said that they are basing their findings off of what has happened in other regions. If we as a city recognize that this is the most unique and diverse city in the world, how can we honestly think that the results will be the same? London's congestion pricing has always used Milan as an example of, success, of successful congestion pricing, but I recommend everyone on here to look it up. It has actually failed to deliver on its reduction of congestion or pollution and reports from their officials have said that that congestion is actually worse now than before. So here we are today to talk about whether congestion pricing is right for the city and will it inadvertently affect the residents. Everything that the MTA has published states that there is no adverse effect on most things. They just, and this, can, and this study just really started. So how is it possible in this short time that we have truly reliable data? Um, it is stated that these things won't be affected. Parking, Parking is already a problem, so I'm sure people going outside of the CBD will cause a bigger parking problem, out of borough congestion, increased environmental impact, the effect on low income and economically challenged families and individuals, and a host of other topics that have, have been reported as being unaffected. How can this be true? This is actually a false statement and we should take issue with the misleading of the public through hypotheses and guessing. Again, this feels like um, the books are being cooked to justify the need for congestion pricing. It was stated on many occasions that drivers abuse the streets but pay nothing for it. We have $600 million in tickets, $300 million in meters, motor fuel tax, registration tax inspections. Truly, the, the rhetoric should stop about drivers not contributing. And if this is truly about congestion as well, why are there tolls on the road after hours when the city is not congestion? congested. I think that we really need to look at true solutions for this and not just throwing money at the MTA or taxing the New York City residents. To Please make conclude your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is our 230th speaker on the list, Wayne Chin, followed by Jennifer MC. Hi, my name is Wayne Chin, uh, and a yellow cab driver, owner driver, and also a member of New York Taxi Worker Alliance. Um, for protests, you know, the, we've been paying NDA for 50 cents, you know, since 2008 for each ride in Manhattan. And in 2019, they added a congestion such as $2.50. So we've been paying $3 each ride to the MTA in Manhattan. And if you add another tax on the 
another tax is that the third fee on the on the tax is going to be devastating to our industry and also the writing public. Uh, we cannot afford that, you know, uh, we're going to we'll be out of business because we, the driver is struggling with the mortgage crisis, as you know, and also the competition for the app driver. So we cannot afford another fee, the third fee from the MDA. And also, you know, we have 6,000 cars in storage, not even walking on the street yet. And, you know, we, the yellow taxi, essentially about the New York City, we move the city, even it raining, shining, or even the subway not running, we are running 24 seven. Okay, we need, the, the city need our service, especially the elderly people, and people with accessibility issues, they cannot get a train, they need a door-to-door -door service. So they need a service from us. So if you add another test, it's gonna be devastating to our industry, the driver income, and then the, the rider had to pay for it. And also, you know, we are the ambassador of the New York City, where the tourists set out of the country, set out the airplane, JFA, LaGuardia, we greet, we're the first to greet them. So we don't, we cannot afford to, to have a, a, another fee, the third fee from the MTA. We already paying our share, three dollar a right in the Manhattan. So I suggest we exempt from us the yellow cab from the another fee because it will be devastating to our income and uh, the writing public, especially the elderly people and the people have with the accessibility issue. Thank you for listening to my concern. And also, please exempt us from that the tough fee we pay, gonna, gonna pay if, it, if they get official. So uh, we, you know, as as a driver, owner driver, you know, uh, each driver have a uh, 15 to 25 trade a day in Manhattan. So they be, and they've been collecting $45 to $75 each day uh, from the driver. So every year, the each driver contribute about uh, 10,000 to ND, NDA already. So if you, another fee is gonna be very devastating for us. So please consider it's only for us. So we pay our share already. Thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer MC, followed by Judy Pesson. Our next speaker is Judy Pesson, followed by Ashraf Ahmed. Our next speaker is Ashraf Ahmed, followed by Eugene Berardi Jr. Our next speaker is Eugene Berardi Jr., followed by our 235th speaker, Matt Buley. Can you hear me and see me? We can hear you and see you. Okay, here we go. Hello, I'm Eugene Berardi, President and CEO of Adirondack Trailways. Thank you for this opportunity. Adirondack Trailways, the fourth generation New York State based business that provides inner city, rural, and commuter service connecting over 100 communities within the state of New York to New York City. Um, and we do more of that service than anybody else in the state. Our customers from all walks of life, including those who rely on affordable public transportation, such as students, the elderly, the military, individuals with special needs, and others with limited means. We're part of the statewide STOA program, provide 5307 service. We provide 5311 service throughout the state. Outer Trail supports congestion pricing goal to reduce carbon emissions by having fewer cars on the road and more people utilizing public and private transit options. But what that does not adversely affect the people in the region and actually meets its goal of moving more drivers to transit. The assessment contains options that charge buses at the same rate as large trucks. Every tolling authority in the region recognizes the environmental cost benefits of buses, charging them much lower toll than large trucks. Port minimizes local community environmental and traffic impacts from street operations and provides bus passengers with direct intermodal connections to and from other inner city buses, commuter buses, and 11 subway lines. It is clear that any tolling of inner city buses 
operating out of the Port Authority terminal would reduce both motor coach and MTA ridership. We know the impact of the pandemic, so it's particularly disheartening that New York is even considering having its private motor coach companies further subsidize the MTA. Prairies and New York's other motor coach companies are already annually contributing millions of dollars directly to the MTA's operations and maintenance. Roughly 30 cents of every dollar in state taxes paid on gasoline sold anywhere in the state flows to the MTA, generating a total of 628 million for the MTA in 19 alone, plus 2 billion in tolls for drivers crossing bridges and tunnels, another 308 million from drivers through MTA aid trust revenues. Put this in perspective, in 19, Adirondack paid over 676,000 bridge tunnels and highway tolls, 139,000 in state fuel taxes, 949 in port fees, and then state bus registration fees. Um, according to the Citizens Budget Committee, the MTA is only committed 68 billion of the 20, 121 billion planned for 2010 to 24, waiving 53 uncommitted. Finally, if the goal of the program is to reduce congestion, then the use of privately owned motor coaches should be encouraged, not discouraged. 155 passenger bus takes 55 cars off the road. Thank you for this opportunity. And we tend to submit written comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matt Buley, followed by Joan Martinez. Our next speaker is Joan Martinez, followed by Aurora E. Our next speaker is Aurora E, followed by Lisa Daglian. Our next speaker is Lisa Daglian, followed by Jessica Spezio. Lisa, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hi, greetings. I'm Lisa Dagley and the Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA or PCAC. Created by the New York State Legislature, PCAC is housed within the MTA and is the official voice of riders of New York City subways and buses, the Staten Island Rail, Long Island Railroad, and Metro North. In that role and on their behalf, I'm here to speak in strong support of congestion pricing, or more appropriately, decongestion pricing. The environmental assessment shows that congestion pricing will reduce traffic, improve air quality, and raise vital funds for critical transit projects. Therefore, congestion pricing meets the goals of the environmental assessment and should receive a, a finding of no significant impact or finding or FONSI. That's what these hearings are supposed to be about. Yet I've listened to hundreds of people for countless hours, as have you, and heard so many as to be exempt from the tolls or have the lowest tolls possible. The irony is lost on them that the more exemptions, the higher the tolls. And the fact that congestion pricing has been law since 2019. I heard one speaker change his mind about supporting congestion pricing after listening to others' testimony. It's important to remember the millions of working class transit riders who depend on congestion pricing happening swiftly, but who can not afford to spend hours at these hearings. And that the loudest voices are often those resistant to positive change. And that's unfortunate because we should all support this program that will improve our quality of life, help protect us from the ravages of climate change, allow emergency vehicles to make better time, saving lives, speed up buses, and raise billions for transit and for infrastructure improvements like accessibility projects. Come on, that's Phillips Point. New signals, station upgrades, including places like Valley Stream, new train cars and electric buses, and improving equity by bringing service to areas without it via new train lines like the Interboro Express. These important projects will benefit millions of riders and support our region's economy, including creating much needed construction jobs for decades to come. More than 90% of people who travel into the CBD take transit, including people coming from New Jersey. You'd never know that to hear the testimony over the past few days. I lived for decades in Hell's Kitchen and saw standstill traffic tie-ups every day and spent hours cleaning filthy soot from cars and trucks from my windowsills. That went right into our lungs. Now I live above the Midtown Tunnel and watch a growing number of cars trying to cram into the tunnel at all hours of the day and night to get into Manhattan. I wonder how they can all fit. And that's the truth, they, they can't. Manhattan streets are, making, are, are, are overburdened with traffic 
and they are not safe for pedestrians. We, we need congestion pricing to reduce traffic, improve air quality, and raise need, needed funds for transit. That's what it will do. And that's Please why it remarks. should receive. That's why if the bondy should be uh, awarded. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Spezio, followed by Raphael Wakefield. Our next speaker is Raphael Wakefield, followed by our 241st speaker, Joseph Stoffel. Ah, hello. Good afternoon. My name is Raphael Wakefield, and I live in Jersey City, New Jersey. The word equity is mentioned several times in the environmental assessment in the context of air pollution. Maybe in some objective sense, this can even be achieved. But in a larger context, with regard to congestion pricing, equity is a slippery word that means nothing. There is no equity to some crossings in Manhattan currently being pulled and other crossings not. What's more, the concern from someone's ox being gored has been the exact logic of inaction that has led to the current dysfunctional system. For example, the idea that Staten Island is always treated unfairly was used to justify opposing the earlier move New York plan and also justify ever lower tolls on Staten Island residents for the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Yet this accommodation has delivered nothing from the perspective of the CBD, except a few thousand extra cars from Staten Island every day clogging up Manhattan streets, even as the vast majority of Staten Island travelers use transit to reach Manhattan. As the Traffic Mobility Review Board has no doubt noted, there is a correlation between the county of origin of personal cars and the availability of direct untold crossings or limited tolls from those counties. If Staten Islanders had no Verrazano Bridge discount, we can safely assume that there'd be more cars going to Manhattan from the Long Island boroughs and counties because driving for them is free and demand to enter Manhattan is high. There is no equity possible in this circumstance. One point which would argue against implementation is the general poor performance of transit today. I'm talking about the handicap inaccessibility of the subway system and the balkanized regional transit system. For example, we must pay two fares from past to New York City transit here in New Jersey. There's also the issue of the Port Authority capriciously opening and closing the bus, uh, express bus lanes at the Lincoln Tunnel, wasting bus riders' time in order to funnel more cars into Manhattan for the sake of their own toll revenue. Or the fact that dedicated bus lanes in New York City are routinely block with, blocked with impunity by cars. Or the fact that mask mandates are not being enforced on transit. Or the fact that at the MTA's bloated capital and operating costs, revenue raised by congestion pricing will not go very far. There is also the reality that illegal parking, obscured or fake license plates, and fraudulent parking placards are rampant in Manhattan, and public employees are the worst offenders. As the environmental assessment projects, simply stripping public employees of parking placards and enforcing parking honestly would actually reduce cars by a number equal to that of congestion pricing. In other words, theft of public space for free private parking is a subsidy to these people alone, with the same attitude as a revenue of congestion pricing for everyone. Given these and other factors, it may well be that CBD tolling does not achieve its goals. But that's an argument for the responsible agencies and politicians fixing these problems, not giving up without even trying. Already, the spurious demands of the federal DOT have created unwarranted delay in implementing the program. The result has been over a thousand pages of documentation as assessment created at taxpayer expense, an assessment that is unnecessary for highway expansions like the Belt Parkway widening that MTA is currently pursuing. The legislature passed this, the governor signed it. The time has passed to implement scenario A and see what happens and adjustments can be made from there if necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joseph Stoffel, followed by Randy Ketiv. Our next speaker is Randy Ketiv, followed by, by Milana Mates. Randy, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hi, my name is Randy Ketive. I live in Fort Lee, New Jersey. I'm almost 75 years old. I'm a cancer survivor. I emphasize the word survivor because of the health care I have received in Midtown Manhattan through many of your wonderful, wonderful facilities, through trials and many other medical opportunities that did not avail themselves in the suburbs or out of major cities. It will be an economic hardship for me to continue with my medical journey, both dental as well as physical medical journey between the fees for parking or share ride or a, a limo service and the congestion parking and the parking 
in, in parking facilities. I am a widow. My husband passed away. He spent over 169 days in the Midtown New York City Hospital fighting a wicked cancer. I had to go into the city every day to be with him. It would have been an economic bombshell for me if this existed at that time. Notwithstanding, I went through Bridgegate trying to get to him for six of the days that he was dying. I will not belabor my own personal issues, but it is a hardship for all of the wonderful medical facilities in Midtown and for the people that availed themselves trying to get there. And for the people on this call who said, take public transportation, my answer is when you're on chemotherapy, you take public transportation. The other issue I'd like to address very quickly is your highlights. You're gonna increase the speed of the escalators. How do you think that's gonna impact seniors? You're gonna have a lot of accidents, guys. You're gonna reduce parking demand. Well, the parking lots will just increase their prices. And in conclusion, the adverse effects, which you said would not affect industry or occupational categories. Let's look at entertainment, hospitality, theater, restaurants, hotels, healthcare, and parking garages. Not alone, when you're in a taxi cab, you're gonna pay for the taxi cab as well as the congestion pricing. I think this is a disaster and I think that we should also ask, what have you spent so far? And what, will it, what is this going to cost going forward now that we're post COVID? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Milana Mates, followed by Joshua Cintron. Our next speaker is Joshua Cintron, followed by our 245th speaker, Noah Lenovitz. Joshua, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Okay, I am unmuted, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joshua Cintron. I am from Brooklyn, New York. I work within the Manhattan CBD as an IT professional. I speak as a longtime enthusiast and consumer of the New York City subways, buses, and commute rail, and a proponent of the Interborough Express. I also find myself in a very unique position I also, speak at, I also speak as a member of the blind and visually impaired community and as a, somebody with albinism um, who operates a motor vehicle under strict qualifications set forth by the DMV. And I'm speaking against congestion pricing. I do believe that other efforts can be done to make the city safer for everybody, but it starts with taking accountability. Uh, the MTA and managing their money, uh, cyclists and pedestrians using common sense while crossing the street, um, and drivers exercising their own due care instead of penalizing the middle class, the backbone of this city. Um, Uber, Lyft, all the rideshare apps with TLC plates, maybe look into them. There was a gentleman uh, this August 27th, as a matter of fact, from Crown Heights who uh, was talking about um, how this whole thing was a money grab. And I'm unfortunately, I'm going to have to agree. A lot of the rhetoric that I've heard from proponents is damn near ageist, ableist, disingenuous, and pseudo-moralistic. I hate to say it, but that's just what it is. And the one thing that I found absolutely insulting was that we shouldn't be listened to. And I'm not going to take that lightly. I am a proponent of public transit. I am definitely an enthusiast of public, public transit. And I do want the, to see our public transit get better. Um, so much so that I wanted to take on a position as a conductor and I couldn't take it because of the crime and the other 
issues that are going on in the subway right now. Um, so I had to pass on that job. Unfortunately, MTA has been mismanaging their money for a very long time. And um, throwing money at this problem isn't going to be, uh, it's, it's not going to help. <laughs> so I'm urging the MTA and the NYC DOT to not alienate people like me. Um, you know, people who use motor vehicles, disabled, senior citizens, as a, you know, as a guise for, you know, advocating for the environment. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Our next speaker is Noah Lenovitz, followed by Jessica Spezio. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Well, my name is Noah Lenovitz. I live in lower Manhattan and work in the Flatiron District. I commute to work by bicycle and public transportation. I don't support congestion pricing and think it's a very bad idea for the city. On my commute via bicycle, I get to see large parts of the city at different times of day. I only really see congestion at the entrances and exits of the bridges and tunnels. I think the city did a great job of installing bike lanes, which provided much needed safety for bicyclists, while also deterring cars from driving into the city. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the side streets are mostly empty in the Flatiron, Union Square, and Chelsea areas specifically. Commercial parking spots are never really hard to find as there are many vacant storefronts. Adding congestion toll, especially for commercial vehicles, will increase the cost of the few businesses that are still trying to recover from the loss of office workers. These increased costs will trickle down to the everyday consumer while we are still facing unprecedented inflation levels. The MTA should look at making cuts to their bloated budgets and focus on stopping fare evasion, which is rampant and has been quoted as costing the MTA approximately 400 million per year. The MTA should also place the toll, if they do do the tolls, just on Uber and Lyft rides. There's over 90,000 cars each day and they cause most of the congestion. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jessica Spezio, followed by Israel Peskowitz. Jessica, you may begin your remarks. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Spezio, and I'm the Administrative Assistant for the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. I'm speaking today in support of congestion pricing on behalf of transit riders and drivers around the region. I live in a subway desert in Bergen Beach, Brooklyn. My options to get to work in lower Manhattan are limited. With no rail service close by, I can take the express bus, a slow local bus to a long subway ride, or drive my car. Taking transit is still my best choice because it's more affordable, even when taking the more expensive express bus and often faster than driving. My express bus commute gives me a pleasant and comfortable one seat ride into lower Manhattan or Midtown. But during rush hour, the ride can be slow and backed up due to traffic in the tunnel or on the highway. Often, an excessive number of vehicles slow down and delay the express bus, even when it's in the HOV lane. With school starting up again, my express bus ride will take even longer than during the summer with more vehicles on the road with people driving to drop off their kids. Congestion pricing would speed up my express bus commute and make it an even more convenient way for me to get to Manhattan. By decreasing traffic in and around the central business district, I'm looking forward to a much faster trip into and out of the city to and from the Southeast end of Brooklyn. Congestion pricing would even help make taking the local bus to the subway more reliable and fast. My bus options include the B41, which runs on the extremely congested Flatbush Avenue and takes much longer than it should to travel towards the two and five trains or downtown Brooklyn. By reducing traffic, our bus network will speed up and become a more dependable and efficient way of getting to work. The funding brought to the MTA by congestion pricing will go towards making the transit system more accessible and reliable for all riders. As a former subway conductor, I know how old some of the signals and systems are. 
they need upgrades and the funds that congestion pricing will bring in will help pay for them. I'm excited by the potential of projects like the Interborough Express and the future subway extensions to bring subway access to neighborhoods like mine that do not currently have rail stations. Congestion pricing will help fund these critical improvements and upgrades to the transit system, speeding up commutes for the majority of New Yorkers who travel by transit. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Israel Peskowitz, followed by Karen Schlachter. Hi, can everyone see me? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Wonderful. My name is Israel Peskowitz. I am a lifelong resident of Central Queens. I'm a fourth generation New Yorker. I live in what used to be called a two fare zone. That is, I have to take a bus in order to get to the subway in order to get to anywhere else. New York City is already too expensive. Why are you making it even more expensive? The MTA estimated that a round trip from Regal Park, a Central Queens neighborhood closer to Manhattan than I am, would cost $57. This plan was conceived and voted on in 2018, 2019. The world has changed immensely since then, and the future of Manhattan as a world center seems uncertain. Making Manhattan even more overpriced could be the final nail in the coffin. When I was a young man, I was a photographer shooting concerts by local bands. Shows it in at 2, 3, 4 a.m. Afterwards, I have to wait a half an hour for the train, take an hour ride back to Queens, stopping at all local stops, and then wait out in the freezing cold for upwards of an hour for a bus to come to get me home. Plus, I had to worry about protecting my camera, the most expensive thing I own, and if it was stolen or damaged, I'd be out of a job. But when I could use a family car, I drove, I was there within an hour, parking was plentiful late at night, and I was home in 30 minutes, and security was much less of an issue. The original point of congestion pricing was to charge people who drove into Manhattan when it was congested. Now we have a plan that would charge people like me to drive in and out of Manhattan late at night when it's not congested. I urge the commission to set minimal fees for off-peak late night and weekend hours. I urge the commission to start off-peak and late night hours at 7 p.m. when many meters turn off and many events begin. Manhattan is already in trouble. Don't kill off our nightlife. Don't make life unlivable for the younger generation, the kids going through what I went through 20 years ago. These tolls are a regressive tax. Working class outer borough people like me would not be able to afford to easily get to Manhattan in the evening. This would bring us another step closer to Manhattan being a playground of the rich, while the rest of us are priced out by tolls on top of tolls. I urge the commission to give higher crossing credits to any driver using any of the toll tunnels and buses to enter Manhattan. I urge the commission to exempt cab drivers who already pay their own congestion fee, congestion fee from being forced to pay twice. I also urge the commission to consider not tolling intercity buses. I recently took a bus from Baltimore for the first time since COVID. I discovered my favorite carrier had gone out of business and the cost of a ticket had nearly tripled. If the price is raised even higher due to congestion fees, it would become cheaper for me to drive. I also urge elected leaders to note the overwhelming outcry against this plan. I encourage listeners to look up how their elected state representatives and senators voted on this issue and vote accordingly in November. Since I still have some time left, I'd like to thank the entire commission. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Assemblyman David Weprin and Assemblyman D D Daniel Rosenthal for leading the fight against commission, uh, congestion pricing. Thank you all for your time and have a nice day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Schlachter followed by Marsha Dresden Tepler. Karen, you yes. may begin your remarks. Can you hear me? I got I want to yes. hold on a minute. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank Israel because I don't have anything prepared. I am a longtime New Yorker, having grown up in Queen in the Bronx as a child, uh, daughter of an immigrant. And I used to ride the subways day or night, but we're going back quite a while when they were safe and they were clean. And I think before we go into congestion pricing, we really have to improve a system that is not safe any longer. I drove into the city to work as a social worker in um, teaching hospitals or through the city 
to go to a position in Yonkers as a social worker in a foster care agency for over 35 years. I felt that my, I have a right to drive my car. I am not an elitist. I am not, I am on a fixed income, currently retired, and I still drive into the city. I drive into the city to go to the theater. I leave my house in North Queens at 4 p.m. because I know where to park and I sit in my car until six o'clock so I can go to the theater. I get my tickets at a reduced rate from at the TDF. And I come in on the weekends. I come in on Sundays because I know where to park and I can take advantage of all the wonderful museums in Manhattan. I really think this is discriminatory against people who either don't have access to public transportation or since COVID don't feel safe on the trains because there are no mass mandates. There are homeless people all over the trains as well as the city and it is no longer a safe place to be. As far as the people who were concerned with motorists hitting people or going on the curbs, I've never hit a pedestrian. I am a defensive driver. I don't block the box. However, I see a lot of people who don't know what yield means, who go through red lights, and I don't see the police enforcing any of these regulations. And I think that that has to be a priority. Crossing the street one day while I was in Times Square going to the theater, I was hit by a bicyclist coming around a corner, despite the fact that I was crossing at a light. He didn't stop. Myself and my friend were both knocked down. We got up, we brushed ourselves off, and we went to the theater where we, we requested ice packs for our various injuries. But I really think that this is going to be a financial burden on Manhattan, on business owners, and definitely for people who live in the outer boroughs who don't have access to, tram to public transportation or don't feel safe on public transportation any longer. So I hope you will reconsider this. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marsha Dresden Tepler, followed by Jonathan Oakley. Marcia, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hello? We can hear you. Okay, hope you have the video too. Uh, all right, hello, can you see me also? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. Uh, I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and I want to say that the MTA and the City Council are making the city unlivable for the middle class. The, the MTA is actually causing the congestion that is a problem with its bike lanes, bike racks, bus lanes, and pedestrian walkways in the streets. Highways and streets have been been reduced to one lane. In downtown Manhattan on Lower Broadway, there is one lane for traffic because there is a bike lane and a bike stand. And if passengers need to uh, be just to uh, get off, to be dropped off for a doctor's appointment, they have to get out into traffic, which is extremely unsafe, needless to say. Uh, the road, roads are for vehicles and sidewalks are for pedestrians. And I also really resent that city council members who have continued to work from home are passing regulations and telling me to take the unsafe subways. You know, my husband try, uh, drove me to work a few times, but he, had, he spent five hours looking for parking uh, on his way home. So we have to restore sanity to our streets and city and congestion pricing is not the way to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jonathan Oakley followed by our 250th speaker, Bernardo Silarino.
Jonathan, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hello? We can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to say that I hope that uh, the MTA gets everything they want. Uh, they usually do. Um, there's a lot of taxes on things already. Uh, the PLC got a fee for getting into a pro cab, got fees for getting into Ubers. There's fees on my cell phone, fees on Con Edison, fees for just about everyone on my registration, my inspection. So this should be no different. I'd like to know where all the money's going uh, with all the people that you have riding your trains, entering the Midtown Tunnel and the uh, Battery Tunnel, all of these, uh, the Verrazano, it's, it's just unfathomable what you do with all this money. I'm just, well, I'm, whether I'm a opponent of congestion pricing, I'd like to say I'm in the middle of the road. I'd like to first know, I would like to have you audited personally. Uh, I, I would love very much for an independent auditor, hopefully the federal government, because I can remember a time there was an investigation into the MTA finances and it revealed that you had two sets of books, one that said that you were in, uh, had a deficit and one that said you had a surplus. I haven't forgotten that. And I would just very much like to see a federal investigation by the Department of Justice or the FBI as to where these finances are going and whether you're the agency fit to run congestion pricing. I'd like to give it over to the Port Authority. I, I don't think that I've seen as much scandal uh, at the abuses of overtime. It's just ridiculous. And I hope that whoever's listening right now, if you're a member of the Department of Justice or the FBI, I would hope very much that one day before this actually goes into effect, that you would take the time to do an investigation into the MTH finance. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bernardo Celerino, followed by Liam Jeffries. Our next speaker is Liam Jeffries, followed by Norman Buenaventura. Our next speaker is Norman Buenaventura, followed by Osama Segol. Our next speaker is Osama Segol, followed by Wolf Hertzberg. Hi, yeah, the Zoom screen, screen changed. Hello, hi, how are you? Um, so I live in Brooklyn, New York, and with my wife and a four-year-old, a daughter. Um, so I was quite surprised that this, uh, the congestion charge came this far. I, I honestly thought it would kind of be stopped earlier. I am obviously not in support of the congestion charge with good reason. I find that it is, I'm very sympathetic to climate change and the causes of climate justice. Uh, but I felt that the environmental impact report didn't address, uh, didn't look at New York City holistically. It definitely ignored the middle class. It definitely ignored the people who were aspiring to, you know, climb up the ladder, so to speak, um, by impacting disproportionately communities that are on a lower income or lower middle class, uh, whether in the city or outside from, you know, the people on the west of Hudson, etc. So. My take is that the people who are passionately in support of, and I've been uh, here since 10 o'clock in the morning, just demographically speaking, it seems like people do want to create this barrier around, uh, around Manhattan uh, so that a lot of people who are not well off, they drive their cars, uh, they can afford to pay for cars, uh, but don't take the subway because they have kids uh, or they have health issues. Um, you know, they, they do come to Manhattan and rely on these services. They don't take the uh, the train, uh, the car every day uh, to commute to Manhattan, but they do, um, you, you know, use you. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that this is, it seems like it's very exclusionary and uh, it, there is not a whole lot of consideration that has gone into, into this. And I've also looked up, you know, the Singapore and London model or Stockholm model. And it seems that people aren't really taking into this in consideration that in Stockholm, the prime minister or, you know, half their government also rollerblades or bicycles to work. So they apply the standard equally. Um, in Singapore, it's heavily managed, like uh, there are 
racial quotas and, uh, and 80 percent of the housing there that's provided by the by the government so over here in new york is very different you know everybody has to make their own way but in, in putting this invisible barrier but monetary barrier around manhattan um that's that just sounds very unreasonable um so you know it, we are obviously we heard from people who are priced out from their health uh, health access uh, said, oh hey you can uh, brooklyn has great hospitals i'd like you to try the difference between manhattan and brooklyn hospitals i've tried them both they're very different so thanks thank you our next speaker is wolf hertzberg followed by our 250th fifth speaker david Gilda Rubio. Our next speaker is David Gilda Rubio, followed by Sudeep Upridi. David Gilda Rubio. Our next speaker is Sudeep Upridi, followed by Golem Is Istiaik. We will go back to David Gil de Rubio, who is now connected after speaker David Gil de Rubio will be Sudeep Upridi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, yeah, my video should be working, but okay, we'll start. Um, so uh, I find it rather ironic that uh, I'm being referred to as an entitled driver when I see that the majority of the people who are for congestion pricing um, are entitled white people who are probably upper income and are more prone to using Lyft, Uber, and any of these uh, services that, that are really the cause of most of the congestion. If you look back to your statistics from 2010 to 2011, when Uber was launched in San Francisco, um, if anything, this is a regressive tax uh, and it's a war on the middle class and many of the people who have said they are against congestion pricing live in the outer boroughs. Obviously, it's a Manhattan centric program because it takes place in Manhattan, but any of the fixes are going to go towards Manhattan, um, especially people who live in two fair zones. I live in both uh, the um, business district that's gonna be affected and also in Queens. So I see both sides of this. Uh, I would say that if you're insistent going forward with this plan, uh, one compromise might be to sync up when the tolling is in place to be concurrent with um, metered parking. So Monday to Saturday from 9 a.m. to either 7 p.m. or 10 p.m. because I also drive in the wee hours of the morning getting back to Queens, there is no congestion. And if anything, you wanna shift traffic, you can have trucking go overnight and maybe not incur a cost. And that way the economy is not taking as much of a hit. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I have to say. Oh, one more thing. Uh, someone mentioned something about there being plenty of good doctors in Queens and Brooklyn. And I find that absurd because if you have uh, some kind of specialized health concerns like the lady from uh, uh, New Jersey who was talking about having cancer and having to see specialists in Manhattan. I think that's a pretty um, rude and insensitive way to view things and it's really um, unfathomable to me. Further, I just want to close by saying that there are a couple of people who are talking about, oh, um, I'm having to deal with um, living by the Prospect Parkway and all the congestion and the exhaust and stuff like that, well, then don't live by there. And lastly, if we're talking about environmental impact, apparently it's only important 
if it affects people in Manhattan because people living by the Cross Bronx Expressway are gonna have to deal with that, with the increased truck traffic. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the study and the time to weigh in. Have a great day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sudeep Upriti, followed by Golem Istikyu. Hello? We can hear you. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to speak against the congestion pricing. Uh, first thing first, uh, whoever said uh, NYC subways are safe are really out of touch with reality. Uh, according to latest NYPD statistics, robbery has surged by 72% and felony assaults are up by 28%. Grand larceny is by 10%. Please tell me how subway systems are safe. This uh, statistics alone is from January 1st to April 10th of 2022. Second thing, starting uh, 2019, we TLC drivers have paid more than $3 billion in condition surcharge. Where did that money go? Who will audit MTA for the expenses? How will we, how do we make sure that MTA is accountable in expense in this money? Uh, we as a TLC driver cannot afford to pay any more surge pricing. Uh, lots of people here complained about car and said people driving are privileged and reckless. Let me make it clear, not all people driving cars are privileged. For some of them, it's a necessity to make their ends meet and make a living. I, I personally have seen lots of bicyclists driving recklessly, running a red light, driving on a one-way street, and not following any traffic rules. Like, does the traffic rules apply to bicyclists or is the traffic rules only apply to car owners? And think, uh, I do agree that there are way too much trucks and cars double parked in CBD districts. That double parking needs to be addressed. That even if we address that double parking, the congestion will be slightly better. And uh, one more question, like um, lots of Amazon trucks, they are operating in CBD district without any warehouses. They are double parked, they are blocking the parking and they deliver the stuff on the bikes to be delivered. Like, why are they not being regulated? Is MTA too scared to take a big company like Amazon? We are the TLC driver and middle-class people uh, cannot afford to pay any more extra tolls. I think during the pandemic, nine of the TLC drivers uh, did kill, them, kill themselves. And how many more suicide do you want on hand? Like this CBD toll will definitely bring financial hardship to all the TLC drivers. And like currently lots of uh, mom and pop store are hardly opening their door. Uh, so they are, okay, that's all because my time is done. It's too, it's a, it's a very less time to say lots of things. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gollum is the queue followed by Richard Chalfin. Our next speaker is Richard Chalfin followed by Howard Schaefer. Our next speaker is Howard Schaefer, followed by Rosalie Shields. Our next speaker is Rosalie Shields, followed by our 261st speaker, Jose Altamiriano. Our next speaker is Jose Altamiriano, followed by Eric Goldstein. Jose Altamariano. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Should I begin? You may begin your remarks. My name is Jose Altamariano. I am a, the president of Delivery Base Owners. We represent over 150 delivery bases in New York City, which serve approximately 150,000 New Yorkers each day. 
are based their small mom and pop businesses, which are owned and operated by immigrants and serve a largely immigrant and first generation American population of the city. Known as the community car service, our livery bases and drivers have stepped in to fill in the public transportation deserts across the five boroughs. The communities we serve trust us and provide safe and reliable transportation. While many of our trips are local in nature, our communities rely on us to travel in and out of Manhattan's central business district for a variety of reasons. Not the Jose, we lost you. We paused the timer. Are you able to? Okay. Oh, we can hear you again. I'm here. Sorry about that. Okay. I'll, con I'll uh, continue. Uh, this testimony submitted to stress the need to mitigate the harmful effects of congestion pricing will have on livery basis drivers and passengers. Specifically, we are requesting an exemption from congestion pricing. The exemption will provide drivers from what the environmental assessment describes as this disproportionately high and adverse harmful effects that congestion pricing will have on them. The livery sector of this city uh, for the for hire vehicle industry, also known as community car service, has faced serious dilemmas in the past decades. While demand has remained steady, the car service have lost both their bases affiliated drivers due to overregulation by the city, including the 2018 cap on for hire vehicle licenses. In 2014, a segment of the HAV industry operated almost 30,000 vehicles. Compare that to 2022 when we are less than 9,000. To be clear, this loss of working New Yorkers, the vehicles don't drive themselves, rather each vehicle is driven by one or more drivers that are independent contractors. In fact, the environmental assessment has pointed out that our drivers are qualified as racial minorities and that approximately 91% of them are immigrants. With on an FHV exception, this path to the American Jewel will further be closed. The passengers that we serve are not wealthy people. They are price sensitive and many pay their fares in cash. Adding another five, 10 or more than 20 surcharge on top of the regular fare will cause sticker shock and not allow these passengers to attend the central district. It's, almost, it's also important to note that the livery bases have been paying congestion fee of 275 per trip to the MTA and since phase one was in from February, 2019. We um, also reject the proposal by the MTA to make our drivers MTA employees, bus drivers. And we further urge the for hire vehicle for the exemption remarks. for the congestion pricing. Thank our goal you. of reduced traffic in Manhattan Central Bay. Our next speaker is Eric Goldstein, followed by Suzanne Musho. Eric, you may begin your remarks. Thank you to the panel for your active listening throughout these marathon hearings. I'm Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council, and NRDC strongly supports the proposed congestion pricing strategy that's the subject of these hearings. In the 1970s, our organization represented citizen groups seeking to implement New York City's transportation control plan, which would have told the East and Harlem River bridges and directed the proceeds to support public transportation. After five decades of planning, discussion, and debate, and in an era of increasing climate disruption, the time for congestion pricing has arrived. The proposed congestion pricing program, regardless of the scenario selected, will significantly benefit the region's subway bus and commuter rail system by allowing the MTA to secure $15 billion in funds for transit capital improvements. This system is the region's lifeblood and indispensable to mobility and the economy of the entire tri-state area for all residents, including motor vehicle owners. Securing these funds to help keep the transit network in a state of good repair should be one of government's highest public policy priorities, and congestion pricing is the single best local mechanism to obtain the funds needed to ensure the long-term health of our subway, bus, and rail network. 
The proposed congestion pricing program will also be broadly beneficial to the region's populace, including low-income residents. More than four out of five commuters to the Manhattan CBD take public transit and only about 11% drive to work. These percentages are essentially the same for people of color and low-income communities. Over 600,000 POC commuters travel to the Manhattan CBD via transit, and they will benefit significantly from the benefits that the congestion pricing monies bring in. In short, congestion pricing is not a tax and it is not regressive. The proposed congestion pricing program will also reduce congestion and the enormous costs of congestion imposed on the region's economy. Singapore, London, Stockholm, and Milan are among the many cities that have implemented congestion pricing programs successfully. And a 2018 report by the Partnership for New York City documented that the pollution generating, time wasting, temper raising congestion that Manhattan CBD streets face every day cost our economy as much as $20 billion a year in lost productivity, fuel, and operating costs. Finally, however, the congestion pricing strategy that's ultimately selected must address environmental justice and equities and protect neighborhoods that have for decades suffered disproportionately from the adverse impacts of pollution. Among these is the South Bronx, where 700 additional diesel spewing trucks are likely to shift to the Cross Bronx Expressway, even under at least under one of the proposed scenarios. We join with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance in calling upon Governor Kathy Hochul and the MTA to not only implement additional mitigation measures, but to commit to a broader plan to reduce emissions and enhance air quality throughout the South Bronx. We set forth these recommendations in our written statement, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is Suzanne Musho, followed by Aaron Bloom. Our next speaker is Aaron Bloom, followed by our 265th speaker on the list, Nicole Albergo. Ah, hello. My name is Aaron Bloom. I live in Brooklyn. I'm a fourth generation New Yorker. You guys are champs for listening to all of us. I'm squeaking in just before five o'clock after being here since 10. I'm here to speak on behalf of motorcyclists everywhere. Nearly every other city in the world that employs, that employs congestion pricing gives complete exemptions for motorcycles. Why? Motorcycles help to solve the problems of congestion, pedestrian safety, and pollution. Motorcyclists, like board members, government workers, and reporters are often unfairly stigmatized. Unlike how Hollywood would portray us, the vast majority of us are responsible, upstanding citizens and drivers. We are the only two-wheeled vehicles on the road who are insured, registered, licensed, and trained by law. If congestion is the problem, then motorcycles are part of the solution. With congestion, you're talking about both parking and vehicles in motion. There's a famous picture out there of two identical parking spaces. One holds a large SUV, the other has 10 parked motorcycles. In motion, motorcycles are far more fluid than cars and trucks. Think of a fish or a bird moving around obstacles. Or to use another metaphor, think of our city streets as a glass jar. Cars and trucks are large stones you're putting in, whereas motorcycles are mere grains of sand. If pedestrian safety is the problem, motorcycles are part of the solution. There's a 2019 Department of Transportation report on accident deaths in the entire state of New York. That year, there was exactly one pedestrian death resulting from a motorcycle accident in the entire state. Motorcyclists may have increased risk to themselves, but statistically, contrary to stereotypes, with motorcycles, we basically have achieved vision zero. If pollution and environmental issues are the problem, motorcycles are part of the solution. Motorcycles have extremely low or no emissions. A recent scientific study shows that motorcycles utilize the same amount of energy per passenger as public buses in transporting people. It is for all these reasons and many more that London, Singapore, and nearly every other city in the world that utilizes congestion pricing gives full exemptions to motorcycles. Please be rational 
and followed the successful examples of every other congestion pricing city in the world. Thank you so much to all of you, Richard, William, Rick, Lou, Allison, and you, oh, and Nicholas, Nicola. Thank you all so much for listening. Please conclude. You're almost through. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nicole Albergo, followed by Joe Troiano. Yes, hi. Good afternoon, MTA board. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I do not want to be on speaker on, on video. I'm just going to speak. Um, so good afternoon, MTA panelists. I live in New Jersey. I commute every day into New York City. I provide valuable services to your New York City public school students. Um, I'm a teacher. I'm on a fixed income. I'm on a salary. I'm a paraprofessional. Um, I moved out of New York City about two years ago, post pandemic when it was first starting. And I couldn't afford to live there because it's ridiculously out of control with the amount of money that you're paying in rent, paying to the MTA with your so-called fare increases on a regular basis. The MTA needs to find other ways to make sources of money rather than it taking it from me from a New Jersey resident. I don't find that very fair. Also to my parents who have to come pick me up on a regular basis to come see my grandmother who is literally dying. She is 97 years old and as a result, if you put congestion pricing into effect, that will greatly affect me because I won't be able to see my grandmother because my parents will not be able to come get me because again, they're retired, they're on a fixed income and they're not gonna be able to afford the congestion pricing to come pick me up so that I can spend valuable time with my grandmother. And not to mention that more than half of my family lives in New York City still. And I made the escape to get out, to have a better life in New Jersey, not to keep pouring money into the New York City subway system and into the MTA. That is not fair to me. That is not fair to New Jersey residents. And that is not fair to residents who commute from upstate New York. I am completely against congestion pricing. That's Manhattan's problem. Find another way to reduce emissions. Do not tax people who come in from the outer boroughs and people who come in from out of state, New Jersey, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. That's your problem that you can't afford to find money to fund your so-called MTA problem. Why don't you go ask the federal government for money? That's all I have to say. What I am going to tell you, get your act together and stop relying on people like me who provide a valuable service to our students of the New York City public school system. And uh, thank you. Our next speaker is Joe Troiano, followed by Christopher Thomas. Our next speaker is Christopher Thomas, followed by Donald Alberti. Christopher, you may yes. ask yourself. We can awesome. hear you. Hi, uh, I'm Christopher. So um, I'm definitely against um, congestion pricing. Um, I actually um, live in the Bronx and um, I, I kind of find it disturbing that you guys are going to be charging people to come below 60th Street and to hell with the people who live in the Bronx who have to breathe in the air. This is like another form of redlining, basically. Um, yes, the MTA has to have the best job in the world because I have a friend, I have a few friends who work for the MTA and uh, from what they're telling me, they, they have it very well. They get paid for eight hours and they only work four hours a day. And the rest of the time that they're working, they go underneath the ground and they sleep and then they clock out and then they go home. So if, does anybody wanna know where the money goes? That's where it goes to is because the managers for the MTA that, that watches people and they're supposed to be employing and stuff like that, they don't really care. I've never seen a company before uh, have employees that work for an eight hour shift they're scheduled for and they only work for four of those hours. And then the rest of the time they're sleeping or just hanging out in the break room um, and then they clock out and go home. I think it's utterly ridiculous. You guys shouldn't be charging us to come downtown. We get punished for having a car to come to Manhattan. That's ridiculous. We should be able to drive wherever we want to. 
We live in New York. And since when does the MTA own the city streets? I pay property tax. I own a condo in the Bronx. Since when does the MTA own the city streets? That's what I want to know because the streets are messed up, but I don't see the MTA going fixing them. So who's paying for the streets that we're driving on to come down here? The other thing is, is that a lot of the people who were speaking, they're working from home. I have to come to work every day. I take the train to and from the Bronx. But then when I want to come downtown to go out, I drive my car down to Manhattan and I park. And I, this is around 7 o'clock p.m. There's no traffic. Who are you guys taxing? Who are you guys tolling? There's no traffic. There hasn't been traffic here for three years since COVID happened. There's no traffic anywhere over here. So this looks like a, there's no traffic. I'm on Fifth Avenue. This is Fifth Avenue. No traffic. It looks like a cash grab. And we're kind of sick and tired of it. We're very sick and tired of it. So you guys really need to do something um, other than look for money. You guys need to help your employees that are currently working for you guys to become more productive in the time that they're supposed to be working. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. The next speaker is Donald Alberti, followed by Erwin Miller. The next speaker is Erwin Miller, followed by our 270th speaker, Bonnie Gallette. Our next speaker is Bonnie Gallette, followed by Catherine Plishevesky. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I've been watching this hearing since 10 a.m. and I feel as if I know each of you personally at this point. My congratulations to those of you who haven't even taken a bathroom break. Seriously, I've lived in Manhattan since 1978 and yes, I have a car. The overwhelming majority of the previous speakers have spoken eloquently about the burden this toll will place on the elderly, disabled, and others. I agree. I live just a few blocks north of the perimeter of CBD. I was a single mother and I always worked in the outer boroughs. I had to get my children to school by 8 a.m. and then get to work by 9 a.m. But if I didn't have a car, I would have had to take a bus to a subway to a ferry and then walk half a mile. I never would have made it to work on time if I did not drive. I had a government job and I could never have afforded the proposed fares. I applaud your goals to raise revenue and improve our environment, but this plan will have a negative economic impact on residents and commuters who work in the city. As stated by some of the speakers, people cannot take the large tools of their trade into Manhattan on a subway. This is a regressive tax and it will affect the people who can least afford it the most. A person who lives on Fifth Avenue and has a building named after him can afford this, but ordinary New Yorkers who make this city great cannot. We need to keep Mid Midtown financially accessible for people from all five boroughs, the greater New York metropolitan area, and tourists, and many people cannot take public transportation. For reasons including geography and physical limitations, public transportation is not accessible for many, and businesses and cultural institutions will suffer by this plan. Please note, I am of a certain age and I cannot ride a bicycle or a motorcycle. I would also like to note that vehicular traffic in Midtown changes every weekday evening and all day on Saturday and Sunday. Simply put, there is no congestion and a toll during those hours will not cure an environmental problem that does not exist. Do your research. London's pricing system is only in effect from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. According to the London website, residents and motor coaches are exempt. Their system is far more equitable. The only time we have congestion in Manhattan after 8 p.m. is when the tree is lit. And I hope you all know what tree I'm talking about. I fear these hearings are PR and the plan will be enacted despite objections by the majority and you will forge ahead with your plans. Please don't do that. Please listen to us. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Catherine Plishevesky, followed by Paige Alenius. Hello? We can hear you. Okay, great. Hi, um, I'm a mother of two living in the CBD. My husband has a disability that does not allow him to take, the public, uh, to take public transit. 
My elderly parents live in an area of Connecticut that is not accessible by public transit. We only use our car to get out of the CBD, therefore not contributing to congestion in the CBD. Yet we will have to pay to leave and come home. With the current increase in rent and inflation, it's already very challenging to stay in New York City. This would be yet another expense that we cannot afford. An honest look at this plan shows that it will not do much to decrease pollution in the long term. This is a regressive tax that is providing funding to the poorly managed MTA. If this were truly about congestion, we can start by enforcing the current laws like ticketing Sorry. Uh, and not providing corporations with discounts on these fines. Um, you can use those violation revenues to fund the MTA. More higher vehicles create much of the congestion. Decreasing their numbers would decrease congestion. I suggest an exemption or discount for CBD residents as this will be, uh, <clears throat> as they will bear an unfair burden just by the virtue of where they live. I suggest a scheme that would allow for a 10 minute grace period to leave and return to your parking spot in the congestion zone for residents. If I leave my garage and I'm on, F, uh, on the FDR within 10 minutes, I shouldn't be charged. If I get off the FDR and park within 10 minutes, I'm not contributing to congestion, so I should not have to pay. I also believe it is essential to have the ex exemptions for people who are disabled and cannot travel by public transit. To summarize, it feels <clears throat> arbitrary to be pe penalized for living below 60th Street. <clears throat> um, it would be up to the tune of $5,000 from our family a year versus someone who just happens to live above 60th Street. We did not, by when, when we chose to live in this area, we did not realize that there would be a $5,000 a year tax in order to depart with our family from the, the, from the CBD without actually causing congestion in the area. Uh, thank you for listening and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paige Alenius, followed by Morgan Adzi. Hi, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. Hi, my name is Paige Allen, and I have lived in Hell's Kitchen for 40 years. I use all forms of transit. I walk, I use the train, the subway, the buses. I have a city, bank, uh, a city bike membership and my own bike. Uh, I also own a small car, which I, I pay to have garaged. I work as an actor in television and film. Um, and unfortunately, I am aging and there is a lot less work for me than there used to be. Um, the reason that I am able to eke out my meager living and just qualify again for my health insurance is because I have my car. Production will hire me because they want the car on camera or I am able to um, self-report to a location that's inaccessible by mass transit. Now, <laughs> would I like less congestion in Hell's Kitchen? Of course I would. Um, but when I spoke at, I think it was the first Zoom meeting on congestion pricing last year, I was upset at the thought of being exorbitantly charged for a problem that I wasn't really creating because my car is being paid for in a garage. Um, but to hear now, that there is an aim to charge vehicles per day that they are in the zone, whether or not they are being driven is astoundingly wrong. It is astoundingly inequitable, astoundingly unfair. Um, and for many of us who live here in the zone, <laughs> this is going to make it extremely, uh, for lower income people, extremely difficult for us to uh, make ends meet. Um, and the repercussions of that might very well be a huge new burden on city government and state federal programs that we may need to reach out to and utilize to keep a roof over our heads. I mean, has anybody considered this? If there is not a complete exemption for lower income people, I don't mean a tax credit, I mean an exemption. 
And one of my, we've been doing this, um, my neighbors and I, and they pointed out to me the other day that if we're being gouged with a charge every single day, we may as well drive every single day to do errands or for any reason. Why are we, we can't afford to give the MTA another subway fee, fee or, or city bike charge when we're already paying for our vehicles, whether we drive or not. So you get more congestion. Please you conclude your remarks. More congestion, not less. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Morgan Adze, followed by Donald Alberti. Morgan, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hi guys. So I've, I've had the luxury of hearing a lot of people speak eloquently. My name is Morgan. I'm a son of Gotham, born in Manhattan. I think that the congestion pricing overall is very inconsiderate. I think it's overall a cash grab, like many people have said. During the pandemic, I had traveled to the city just to watch the change because I was born here for 45 years. And um, the city was empty, particularly the CBD district, which was, and I do commercial leasing, which was totally um, vacant of life because all of the properties there have been converted for strictly commercial. That's another conversation. Caregivers, bus drivers, residents who pay rent and live on the island of Manhattan should not be broken up into below 60th or above 60th. It should be one island and not a dime should come from anyone that lives on the island at the bare minimum. Regarding some of the statements that other people made regarding the MTA and, and, the, and, and where they're pulling this funds from, I think quite frankly that they should be audited. Some of the salaries within the MTA are exorbitant. We really appreciate those people for staying down there under those tunnels. Who wants to do that on a daily basis? God bless them. But at the same time, we have to take account that this system is not going to be funded by people who are out and above ground. It is not fair, it is not right. You have many people here who have gotten cars because they do not believe in the system that's below ground because it's quite dangerous. Um, I, I think there have been some entitled comp and comments by people who say, I can get on my bike, I can get on this. Well, you go ahead and do that. The 80 year old lady who has to go to dialysis, she's not doing this. I was a caregiver for my mom. I really resonated with that gentleman very early on this morning who also expressed this. I think there is a way that for you guys to grab some cash. In Zurich, they have a system where uh, residential parking permits are for certain cars. You have many people parking, sorry. You have many people parking cars, uh, give an example, commercial trucks like that, things that shouldn't be on the sidewalk where people could have good parking spaces. Some of these people also come from out of state and they leave their cars so they can maneuver in the city. If you guys gave some residential parking, and, and, and it's and it's quite quite scary to think that crossing the high line, there's a camera right between 12th and 11th Avenue that's going to be flagging my car. I mean, that's just not a way to live. The city has changed too much. And the son of Gotham says, guys, figure out a better way. My 30 seconds, I shall yield it to somebody else because I was waiting all day. And like the other lady said, bathroom breaks are important. Ciao, everybody. Thank you. The next speaker is Donald Alberti, followed by Brian Hess. Donald, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. I'm unmuted. Um, did I just hear a, that there's a proposal to uh, tax vehicles that are in garages if they're unused on a daily basis? Well, anyway, I have lived below Houston Street since 1977, at which time I moved to New York City in search of a community of like-minded artists and intellectuals. I'm a member of the 9-11 World Trade Center Survivors Health Program and so far, a cancer survivor. I'm 71, retired and living on a fixed income of social security and a small pension. 
In 2014, aware that the rent stabilized loft rental where I'd maintained my painting studio at home for 35 years and raised a son was unsustainable due to inevitable luxury decontrol, I looked for an alternative retirement solution, uh, which resulted in moving to one of uh, a much smaller apartment in the Hillman Co-ops on Grand Street. It's two blocks by foot from the FDR or a half mile or a two minute drive to the nearest FDR entrance at Montgomery Street. After a two year wait list, a parking spot opened for me in the Hillman garage. When I gave up my studio on Crosby Street, I moved to a location, a studio location outside of Manhattan that I could afford. I'm a CBD resident that was uh, that uses a vehicle to drive to my work studio and return to New York City. There's no public transportation available to reach my workplace. So now I have a reverse commute and operate my vehicle in an uncongested area of the zone for less than 10 minutes during a round trip over a course from the FDR Grand Street exit or the Montgomery Street entrance to my co-op garage. Will I be charged twice for operating my vehicle exiting the zone and on my return home? $46 to leave and return home. Some might say it's entitled or a luxury to drive and have a studio out of town. But the luxury for me was to have a live work studio in New York City, which I could afford at the time and required no driving. I'm not a fan of auto culture or driving. I had to drive in New York City as a salesman. Driving is a liability. I'm, I'm a proponent of public transportation and the goals of reducing New York City traffic to mitigate harmful effects of pollution and carbon emissions. If there's to be congestion pricing, I'm appealing for a residential exemption or consideration similar to the residential parking tax exemption. How many vehicles are registered to addresses in the zone? What's the data show? Or consider a technological solution in which the easy pass is configured to time, motion, or distance and peak off peak hours and charged accordingly. As a matter of fairness and equity, five minutes on the periphery should not be the equivalent of four to 12 hours in congested areas. I also have concerns about the constitutionality and use of tracking data, which could be used in unknown future ways, but that's a subject for a separate forum. Thank you. Thank you. Alison de Serenio has informed me that she would like to correct some statements that several speakers have made. So I will let Alison de Serenio uh, state that now. Thank you. And thank you again, everyone, as we're listening to the comments. We really appreciate your staying here all day with us. Uh, I would like to just take a moment to correct some information that's been said a few times. Uh, and you can see this in the EA. We will not be charging for vehicles that remain parked entirely during a day within a garage or even on a street. They will only be charged, as we described, for entering or remaining when they are moving. So those of you who have expressed some concerns that you will be charged a toll while your vehicle is in the garage and has not been used, will not be getting a charge for that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Hess, followed by Alex Wintz. Our next speaker and 275th on the list is Alex, excuse me, Alex Wintz. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sorry I'm not on video anymore, but um, I'm actually driving right now in, um, in the CBD. I just pulled over, actually. Um, and um, I'm driving right now. I do not want to drive right now, but I'm driving right now to go to work. Now, what is it that I do for work? I am a professional musician. I am a jazz musician. I play guitar, and um, I played it all of the major ven musical venues in that New York has to offer, Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, et cetera. However, all of us who are musicians don't just play places like that all the time. We play at a lot of bars and clubs and restaurants in the CBD. And a lot of us, like myself, have to bring heavy, expensive equipment around after hours, especially, or during rush hour on a train. So right now in my car, I have a guitar, expensive guitar. I have an expensive guitar amp. I have an amp cart. And I also have a uh, case with guitar pedals in it. So that's about, you know, 40, 50 pounds of gear that I'll be lugging back and forth. I have one gig from six to nine, and then I have another from 10 to one. So, um, you know, I just want that the panel to consider the fact that 
a lot of what makes the CBD and New York City so great, the music industry is going to be suffering from this because bass players, drummers, keyboard players, DJs, um, we don't, we can't take our equipment on a train. We, we, we have to use a car. It's, I do not want to have to take a car. And also the part that was kind of disturbing to me to find out about today is that, so when I get out of my, my work today around 2 a.m., when there's no cars out, I will still be charged again when nobody is on the road. Um, that just seems pretty unfair to those of us who work in entertainment, nightlife, and, and something a lot the things that make New York City so great, right? So I asked the panel, next time you go to see a musical event and you see a band up there with big instruments and you say, how do they get there? Well, most of the time we get there by driving. Um, so, you know, I, I, and, and the other, the last thing I'll say too, is that I made an investment during COVID to stay in New York city when a lot of my musical brothers left because it got too expensive. And so I live further out in the Bronx because it's more expensive to live here. And the idea, I understand that there are some households that earn 60,000 and, and individuals earn 60,000, but I suggest you do some research into how much it costs to um, live in New York City at the moment when it, the, the credit start, or exemption starts at 60,000 a year. Um, thank you. Consider the arts and entertainment. Have a good day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joanne Roberts followed by Cindy Solorzano. Our next speaker is Cindy Solorzano followed by Yosef Barmore. Cindy, you may begin your remarks. Cindy, you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. You may begin your remarks. Unfortunately, because we can't hear your remarks, we'll have to come back to you. Oh, we can see you. Can you try unmuting again? Hello? We can hear you. Okay, hi. Good afternoon. My name is Cindy Solorzano. I'm a resident in Queens. Um, I fully support congestion pricing. I also support exemptions for yellow and green taxis. I support exemptions for motorcycles that are electric and to disabled plates um, and possibly a tax credit for people in the arts. Um, I own a car, but I don't drive it all the time because I live near a train station. That said, the train stops running in the evenings, right? Like weekends or late at night, everything gets delayed. And I really am excited for um, the subway system and the buses to get better. And I really, I trust you guys that you're going to do a great job to benefit people in the boroughs, in New Jersey and Long Island. Anyone that takes public transportation should be made to see the difference that they're going to experience. I feel like the phrase, your taxes at work, is just kind of a joke to people when they think that nothing is being done with the money they're paying, that we're paying to be administered. And I think that you should focus on a campaign that shows people that the alternative to not do anything and to not contribute to saving the planet is not good. It's already not good, but we do, we're not being seen. We're not being made to see what the difference is going to be and the benefits that everyone, everyone that has spoken in these meetings that has a condition that doesn't feel safe in the subway right now, that they feel like um, they need, I have heard this, we have to pay. Why do I have to pay? Why should I pay? Why should I, I, I? New York takes pride in being a community. We have gone through a lot of things. I was displaced during Hurricane Sandy and I was helped by my friends, by my neighbors. I was here for 9-11 and I saw solidarity. And I know that if New Yorkers can be made to see the difference, 
and how much they're going to help every community. What affects people in Queens affects people in downtown Manhattan. What affects people in the Bronx is going to affect people in the Upper West Side, in the Upper East Side. If we can be made seen that our contributions are going to be put to work and are going to make the planet a better place and our neighbors safer, I think that you are going to be very successful. Forget about London, New York. We're good at this. We can support each other. I really think so. And I really have faith that this is going to help everybody, even the people that right now don't see it. I know that they're going to see the benefits, but it's your job to inform them of what those benefits are going to be. Campaign it throughout. Please do it. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Yosef Barmore, followed by Craig Seal. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Joseph Barmore. Um, good morning, and uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the space to share our thoughts on congestion pricing. I currently live in Westchester near the Bronx and I've worked in New York City uh, for over 12 years. I like the idea of getting rid of congestion in the city as I've spent innumerable hours stuck in traffic. I also like the potential positive environmental implications but I do not feel that it should be the burden of the citizens that already have some of the highest tax burdens in the country to further fund the MTA at this time, especially at a time when inflation is an all time high and affordability is a major issue to many in the tri-state area. The MTA receives billion, received billions in pandemic aid to balance their budget in part because of the loss of ridership. Every year since 2009, the MTA has raised fares to balance their budgets. Out of all the money that the MTA brings in, I don't believe the cost of operation matches the service that many everyday patrons get. Congestion pricing, I believe, is supposed to raise about a billion dollars a year. How much of that billion dollars is actually going to be used for the projects that are proposed and not get stuck in operational costs and other wastes? We've often seen MTA projects and general infrastructure projects in New York City go insanely over budget and completion time. New York City and state taxpayers already pay hundreds in tax subsidies to the MTA every year whether we use this or not. From a personal standpoint, no matter how much money we give the MTA, service does not seem to improve much. And in certain areas, the system has declined in my opinion. I think most people with the means wouldn't mind doing their part with congestion pricing that was a few dollars, but these fees up to $23 a day potentially will keep the lowest income workers off the roads and put those who have no choice under greater financial duress. With my current job, I'm on the road before 5 a.m. until my destination before much of the traffic even begins. I was also considering purchasing a fuel efficient car to help, with the, to help the environment and cut down on my own personal gas costs. I believe a person is not a part of the direct problem. They should get discounts on these fees. $23 a day is about 460 a month or about 5,500 a year. It's outlandish fee uh, prices to take on uh, for family. Furthermore, I believe in order to force people off the roads, you need to provide better alternatives. I would love it if there was clean, reliable public transportation, but that does not currently exist uh, uh, from my standpoint of taking public transportation. Prior to living in Westchester, I was a longtime resident of New Jersey. I used to participate in the carpool rule that says if you have three or more people, you can get a discount on your tolls. This essentially allowed us to save money and decrease the amount of vehicles on the road, but this practice has been uh, discouraged many times in the past and now canceled since all the new toll systems have been put into place. Would it be impossible to innovate a system with the Port Authority that could bring this back? Uh, please consider greatly reducing the congestion costs or at least giving better alternatives and incentives that would achieve similar goals. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your time here. Thank you. Our next speaker is Craig Seal, followed by our 280th speaker, Justin Gundlach. Craig, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. All right, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, I'm Craig Seal. I live and work within the proposed Central Business District. I am an MTA transportation rider and supporter, though I also walk, ride bicycles such as City Bike, and I'm a motorcycle rider, weather permitting, uh, within, and, within and around Manhattan and to the other boroughs, um, as well as getting outside of the city. As a resident within the proposed CBD area, I don't believe that it would be fair for me to pay a toll travel in and out of my neighborhood. 
that I live in when using my motorcycle and or to pay when coming back in to just park my motorcycle in a garage that I already pay for and pay tax on. Um, I already pay enough taxes to live here, um, plus uh, tolls when I use the bridges and tunnels to enter into the city from out, out of state. I find many of the comments and statements of my fellow New York City residents and commuters that have spoken thus far in a lot of cases to be somewhat inflated or unsubstantiated without noting verif verifiable, uh, verifiable preferences, though I would like to um, applaud the efforts of Zaire Baptiste and Aaron Bloom, uh, whether I thought their comments were right on. With that said, I am once again advocating for exemption of motorcycles from the CBD tolling. Motorcycles not only do not contribute to the factors that would warrant CBD tolling like parking, congestion, air quality, stress in our roadway infrastructure, but rather motorcycles help to alleviate them. I haven't seen any reports or studies that specifically indicate that motorcycles contribute to any of the factors that would again warrant congestion pricing for them. Most, if not all cities around the world exempt motorcycles from congestion pricing and there's no reason why New York City should not follow suit. Congestion pricing studies referenced within the board's presentations and studies that were shared exempt motorcycles. Stockholm exempts motorcycles. London exempts motorcycles providing they meet the minimum EU emissions or they pay an ultra low emission fee zone uh, or fee for that said zone. Most modern motorcycles manufactured after July 2007 adhere to those standards. Um, some talking points to note, virtually every municipality around the world where congestion pricing has been imposed exempts motorcycles. Motorcycles indisputably reduce traffic congestion Motorcycles are impressively fuel efficient and produce significantly less greenhouse gases as compared to cars. Motorcycles are lightweight and uh, do less wear and tear on the roads. Uh, two wheel vehicles take up a small fraction of space when parked. Um, also in moving forward, if there was legalization of lane splitting as done in several other US cities and around the world, that would further assist with congestion. Um, there's a good Can study. You include your remarks. Sure. There's a study out of California that is well known about lane splitting and Thank the safety you. of that. Am I Our next speaker is Justin Gundlach, followed by Alec Raggio. Our next speaker is Alec Raggio, followed by Harry Schwartz. Our next speaker is Harry Schwartz, followed by Tony Thompson. Our next speaker is Tony Thompson, followed by our 284th speaker, Ben Garen Kane. Our next speaker is Ben Garen Kane, followed by Ali Ryan. Ben, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Hi, I would like to recommend um, the implementation of congestion pricing uh, without exemptions. I am a, more or less a lifelong resident of Kings and Queens counties. Uh, I currently work on the weekends and, and do ride a bicycle um, into the in, at to the, into the Metropolitan at to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, so through the Central Business District. And I think the, the uh, benefits of congestion pricing. Um, outweigh any of the uh, negative effects that the previous speakers have mentioned. Um, I, I particularly find spurious the argument that congestion pricing negatively affects working class and immigrant people. And, and that's been stated several times today, um, including by the speaker representing the Independent Drivers Guild. Uh, I live in an immigrant neighborhood and the stat has been stated previously that, that more than 90% of, of low-income people by the, these studies measures use transit to access the central business district and not private vehicles. So I, I think we need to be uh, truthful about our statistics be, before we can have any reasonable debate. Um, I'd also like to, to mention that in 2016, the then mayor of New York City, along with the council speaker at the time, uh, proposed a cap on Uber and for hire vehicles. 
Um, the, the cap would have limited expansion of the for hire vehicle Black Fleet to 1% a year and would have uh, created a, a, a cap at 80,000. And, and as some speakers have mentioned earlier, we're now at 90,000. So it's unfortunate that you know our legislators who have expressed dismay about congestion pricing, people like Assemblyman Weprin and Councilwoman Brooks Powers uh, weren't on the front lines in 2016, trying to help the mayor and trying to help the, the, the speaker of the city council uh, get past legislation that would have been that would have had vision in limiting all these taxis in Manhattan um, and all these for hire vehicles, which are now causing congestion and 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 and, and creating the problems. Um, that's all I want to say. Uh, I, I thank you for the time and I yield. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ali Ryan, followed by Ahmad Saeed. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, my name is Ali Ryan and my family lives in the Lower East Side. I am testifying against congestion pricing again today. Um, I testified yesterday, even though I am a pedestrian, a bicyclist, and I use the MTA. This is a war on the middle class, on fixed income people, on the backbone of Manhattan, its residents. The high income financially secure Manhattanites and the non-residents activists who believe this tax on the average citizens is some virtuous solution for global warming are naive and anti-New Yorker. Congestion pricing is really about creating a new income stream for the MTA, not solving congestion. How is $18.6 billion not enough to run the MTA. MTA and recent New York City policies are causing more congestion. The MTA presentation focuses on drivers coming into the central business district, yet many people are working remotely. And according to the city, New York City's office occupancy just reached 41% in June, 2022 which makes me question why commuters are conveyed as congestion villains in the environmental assessment and that the MTA congestion pricing income stream will be significantly lower than projected. Politicians must start taking public transportation and paying for it out of their own pockets before we will take them serious or consider reelecting them. Ridership is at 60% of pre-2020 levels and fare evasions costing hundreds of millions of dollars. I have found myself in unsafe situations recently on the subways and I will not be taking them with my eight and 10 year old daughters until the MTA and transit police can properly use their budgets and deal with crime in subways. There is an unconscionable absence in the MTA presentation on how congestion pricing will affect residents who live in the central business district. I like to share how congestion pricing would impact my family. My husband is a freelance electrician and works within the five boroughs at odd times of the day. And if my husband pays a congestion fee to leave our neighborhood and return home, it has a real financial impact on my family which equates to $230 a week, and then multiplied by 50 weeks, $11,500 a year. We have already cut our expenses to the essential and we pay our fair share of taxes. This is a war on low income and middle income residents who have chosen to not or on- you Include your remarks. City. Fix the MTA, respect New Yorkers and their different Thank stories. You needs. Our next speaker is Ahmad Saeed, followed by Ryogan Vasquez. Our next speaker is Ryogan Vasquez, followed by Daniel Reed. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you for all the moderators for staying with us. I hope you were able to get some food uh, at some point and also to the translators. I hope you were able to eat something. Um, uh, 
I am a I'm a father of two. Um, I am and I suffer from a debilitating uh, tinnitus, which is basically ringing in my ears. I feel like I have a a train whistle uh, in my ears, and I am not able to take uh, public transportation. It is uh, so debilitating that I've had to uh, quit my uh, uh, quit my full time job. And now I, I work as a part-time professor at Rockers, and I also teach self-defense and rape prevention for women in Brooklyn. I lived in the congestion area. Um, some of us do not have the ability to take public transportation. And to me, uh, frankly, what I understand a lot of the other implications, um, it is somewhat shocking that we have not seen anything regarding exceptions with people with disabilities like myself that I used to take public transportation, but I just can't do that anymore. And this is not because I don't want to, it's because I can't. So how can we not talk to people like myself, people that are, have autism, people that have claustrophobia. Some people have mentioned that they're suffering from cancer. A lot of people that are uh, COVID, uh, um, that they're, they're very vulnerable to COVID that cannot take uh, public transportation because they're going to be exposed. Um, this will be a very limited, uh, have a very limited uh, economic effect because it's not that many of us, but it would make a huge life difference for the for some of us that are suffering, uh, some of us that have uh, very debilitating diseases. I heard somebody also uh, with multiple escler uh, sclerosis, etc. Um, on a more general level, uh, as a, as a person of the uh, that lives in the zoning question, um, anytime I take my car, I go from Avenue B to uh, <clears throat> to the FDR. I am contributing, uh, contributing very minimally to the actual congestion. Yet in a lot of your plans, I am going to be taxed and I'm going to be charged from going from Avenue B to the FDR, the same exact amount that an Uber car that is picking up 20, 30 rides. And I'm, it's also driving around the congestion area while uh, listening, uh, while waiting for those. So how can 30 people that are taking Uber rides, that are creating much more congestion than I am, not participate in this anti-congestion policy. So from an economic point of view, which by the way, this is what I teach at Rockers, it, this makes no sense that the people that are creating the problem, which are the Uber, Uber riders, are in a lot of some of, in some of your plans, are being taxed the same, uh, the same thing that a person like myself that only goes from Avenue B to the FDR. Um, and finally, and also the uh, uh, the truck drivers. Well, again, I do understand the economic consequences of taxing uh, deliveries. The major culprits of uh, congestion are truck drivers uh, that are double parked and are taking sometimes one lane on one side, one lane on the other side, and creating the congestion. Uh, so please take this into account uh, this uh, uh, as as you look at your economic projections. Uh, and finally, uh, 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 if I could clarify. Uh, Allison, uh, when you said about uh, people driving in and also driving within this zone, uh, uh, I didn't understand whether this was just people coming in or driving within the zone because I have to move my car for alternative parking every two days. And I don't think I should be taxed uh, for moving my car if it's something that the city is mandating me to do. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Reed, followed by Anna Kakin, Kakinis. Our next speaker is Anna Kakinis, followed by Benjamin Tolentino. Our next speaker is Benjamin Tolentino, followed by our 291st speaker, Gregory Cohen. Our next speaker is Gregory Cohen, followed by Linnea Wiles. Gregory, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Greg Cohen, Government Affairs Representative for Greyhound Lines. Greyhound's largest hub in North America is located at the Port Authority bus terminal. Millions of our passengers arrive and depart there each year. We have a 108-year history as an affordable transportation provider that serves the public, and we are strengthened by our fully unionized driver and mechanic workforce. Uh, in London, Singapore, and Stockholm, congestion pricing uh, specifically exempts large buses from their pricing scheme. And our biggest concern is that there are uh, more scenarios in this EA that do not exempt inner city buses than that do. 
that being said, two scenarios, B and F, do appear to exempt buses. So these would be our preference at this time. Regardless of which option is ultimately selected, inner city buses that serve the public on a fixed schedule must be exempted for the following reasons. First, for most inner city tri trips, they provide the most affordable and lowest carbon intensive transportation option to consumers. Bus riders carbon footprint in an inner city bus of average occupancy is a mere 0.17 pounds per mile, the smallest footprint of any mode for a person traveling alone or with a companion. As buses fill up, per passenger emissions drop further. A key objective of congestion pricing is to reduce emissions in DMT. Our buses carry 50 people and can take 50 cars off the road. In keeping with that objective, tolling of buses makes no sense. Second, we have serious concerns that the EA's environmental justice section completely missed any discussion or analysis of the impacts of pricing on inner city bus passengers. It's, it's astonishing actually, because I know we commented on this in scoping. The majority of Greyhound's customers are minorities. Most earn less than $35,000 a year and tolls paid by Greyhound have to be passed on to those customers. Third, Greyhound and all class one scheduled service bus companies are now 100% ADA accessible with wheelchair lifts. There are many more passengers without wheelchairs that also have special needs. EA recognizes that vehicles with disabled plates should be exempt, but fully accessible buses like Greyhound do not display these plates while having a high frequency of passengers who qualify for such permits if they were in a car. Clearly ADA compliant buses should be exempt like any other vehicle that carries, regularly carries disabled passengers. Fourth, under federal law, there is now specific language requiring toll equity between publicly operated and privately operated buses and FHWA sponsored projects. Although this project is being developed as part of, part of the value pricing program, the toll equity provisions from section 129 and 166 still apply. Finally, the goal of congestion pricing should be to reduce the number of cars and trucks in Midtown and Downtown. Buses entering Midtown are critically beneficial. Our buses have no other reasonable option that could avoid congestion north of 59th Street because our no other facility can handle things, buses like the Port Authority. It's Please particularly conclude your remarks. To, well, thank you again for the opportunity to raise these key points and we'll have written testimony. Thank Thanks. you. Our next speaker is Linnea Wiles, followed by Elizabeth Pugh. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Pugh, followed by Steve Sabiga. Our next speaker is Steve Sabiga, followed by Sharon Wine Carmona. Our next speaker is Sharon Wine Carmona, followed by Barry Jensen. Our next speaker is Barry Jensen, followed by Renee St. Jacks. Our next speaker is Renee St. Jacks, followed by our 298th speaker, Ephraim Aaron. Renee? You may, Hi, begin, yes. you may begin your remarks. Hello. Um, yes, hi. Uh, this is Renee St. Jacques. I'm with uh, New York Farm Bureau, Associate Director of Public Policy. Uh, New York Farm Bureau is the state's largest agricultural ag advocacy organization. We represent farmers from across the agricultural community in New York, including dairy farmers, fruit, vegetable and growers, maple producers, livestock farms, beekeepers, so many. And many of these farmers are concerned about the tolls they will have to pay as they transport food products into the central business district. We recognize the purpose of congestion pricing, but it is also imperative that New York farmers can affordably transport New York food products throughout New York City. The pandemic has shown the important role of New York farms in combating food insecurity, especially in urban areas. The Central Business District does include farmers markets, including Union Square Green Market. This market is open Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays year round. And during the peak season, there are more than 140 farmers, many of them New York farmers, selling their products to more than 60,000 people visiting the market. 
farmers participating in this market and others will have to pay these tolls each time they bring their products to sell. So instead of increasing the transportation costs for farmers and creating more barriers to combating food insecurity, the New York Farm Bureau recommends the establishment of a toll exemption for agricultural vehicles transporting farm products into the central business district. We urge you to take into consideration the negative impact these proposed tolls would have on New York farmers and their ability to provide fresh farm products to food insecure residents of New York City. Thank you very much for your time and consideration of these comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ephraim Aaron, followed by Andrea Kay. Ephraim Aaron. Our next speaker is Andrea Kay, followed by our 300th speaker, Rona Rubenstein. Andrea, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. My name is Andrea Kay, and I was born, raised, and continue to live in Brooklyn. I'm strongly against congestion pricing. Several of the many issues surrounding just congestion pricing include congestion pricing is nothing more than another money grab another tax against the already financially burdened lower and middle classes. And much of the congestion is a result of the 80,000 plus Uber and Lyft vehicles. Start by eliminating the number of these vehicles in the city. Additional major contributors include middle of the street parking plazas, bicycle docking stations and dining sheds among many others. If you are removing lanes from automobile travel, how can you not expect more congestion? Road and utility repairs and maintenance that block lanes and roadways are another constant that create congestion. Some of these repairs have been going on for years. It seems to be never ending. Bicycling has been suggested as an alternative to autos. Other than the most passionate bicyclists, how many people are really going to bicycle into the city from the outer boroughs, especially in the winter and in inclement weather? And what financial contribution do bicyclists really make to the city? Automobile owners contribute to city and transportation costs with payments from driver's licenses, registrations, inspections, gas, parking garages, as well as taxes applied to utility bills. What financial contributions do bicyclists make? Since they are using many of the same facilities as cars, they too should be paying for the use of the roadways and the bridges. It's nice to be young and in good physical condition. But how will these people react to the price gouging if they or family or friends become physically limited and can no longer bicycle or take mass transit? And what about consideration for the elderly and the disabled? And to the young man who early today told people to use doctors in Brooklyn and Queens, how dare you? And to avoid this proposed $23 toll, those who can will avoid coming into the city to get to the tunnels and bridges and increased traffic and pollution in the outer boroughs, especially the Cross Bronx, the Staten Island Expressway, the BQE, the Belt, the Gowanus, and many others. Once delivery and home services are required to pay this additional toll, who do you think is going to ultimately pay for this? Of course, it's the residents in all of Manhattan, and you know it will be passed along to the people in the outer boroughs as well. As far as the MTA itself, everyone knows no one is held accountable for costs anywhere from the overblown salaries to the work itself. Why don't we know how the billions of dollars that the MTA received from the federal government has been spent? And before tolling is implemented, the MTA needs to document each work effort, its detailed costs and the timeline. How soon after this tolling effort is implemented will we see results? So from the start of tolling, how and when will transportation be improved for current Based and new riders? Your remarks. And the last thing is before long, you know that tolls will be increased. It won't take long. 
Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rona Rubenstein, followed by Jeff Schwain. Hello? You may begin your remarks. All right, well, first I should, uh, my name is Ron Rubenstein. I lived uh, almost 30 years in Brooklyn, almost uh, 20 years in Queens. I currently live in Manhattan and I travel to Staten Island and the Bronx, not just uh, for Yankee games. I had submitted a question to the panel because I'd like to know where you folks reside, what county you live in, whether you work in an office currently, and how you get to the office. So I hope you'll answer those questions uh, later on. Because I live on the Upper East Side, and uh, I'm going to tell you. What you need first is additional traffic offices to control traffic, but they must be trained and know what the hell they're doing. Because sometimes there's a traffic officer and he lets people block the box. I waited for a bus on Third Avenue two weeks ago. That bus, uh, third, I was on 3rd and East 38th Street. My bus was held up for four lights because the bo box was blocked on East 36th Street. There's no enforcement. Nobody really gives a damn, all right? You have double parking. First Avenue used to be a beautiful street to drive on. Now you have a bike lane, which frankly you don't need except for delivery people there. On the Lower East Side, when I eat there, I see numbers of people using the bike lane. So next to the bike lane on the Upper East Side is a parking lane. And all of a sudden, First Avenue that had four lanes is now down to two. And then we have double parking. So, and somebody said about 19% uh, the New York bus lane. I mean, that's pretty damn good because the other boroughs don't need congestion parking. They don't need congestion pricing because they don't have any traffic. So how could you give us a statistic of the difference in time of bus. I ride the bus. They are damn good with the bus lane. Please but conclude we need, your remarks. We don't need a bus lane, two bus lanes on Lexington Avenue. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeff Schwain, followed by Shane McMorrow. Our next speaker is Shane McMorrow, followed by John Banzer. Our next speaker is John Banzer, followed by Sonal Jessel. John, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. How are you? Um, I have a. I'm completely against the congestion charging for a number of, number of reasons. They are. Uh, we've reached the point of enforcement versus enticement, and you can't enforce this dream on people. We, you, you know, I, I'm an, a mentally disabled artist. I'm a write-in candidate for governor. I'm not taking any money. Spell my name correctly in a box if you want to see some fun stuff happen in November. But everybody on this panel has to have their. Uh, 
their their uh, private investment portfolios torn apart because if I find out anybody here has been making money off of Uber or Lyft or anything that's been going on throughout the pandemic, we're going to have bigger problems. And somebody brought up an even better point that I completely glossed over. If I find out so much as one first responder can't make it to their appointments because of this nonsense, everybody involved with this is going to be excommunicated from the city because it's easier to not play with 30 people such as yourselves or anybody else who fancies themselves as a leader, than it is to harm one more person. My dad was a first responder, a sheet metal worker, and a sand hog. He'd been all to the depths of the city and to the top. And the, the, the first thing he said when he retired, never wanted to go west of 110 again. Doesn't matter what I'm trying to do or perform. I can't get anybody to go anywhere, to go anywhere near the city. And I'm stuck out on this island. It's a non-starter. You are gonna start a fight with every construction worker in the entirety of the surrounding area of that city. We're not paying any money more, any more money to go to work. As an artist, I have a right to take my drunk friends home without it costing them $400 total in three separate cabs. I can't take my tools on the train as a carpenter. I can't take my tools on the train as a artist. Because if the train stops and my 50 pounds worth of speakers or my 300 pound toolbox keeps going, it's going to kill somebody. It's not going to be pretty. And the bad part about a toolbox is once it starts and the drawers open, guess what keeps flying out? Everything that's in there. So my goals for uh, all of everybody here is for 40% reduction in tolls across New York and the tri-state area. And you're going to make sure that every single new train station is a library because I'm not giving a billion dollars to be poured underground as the sea levels are rising. If you can see how we've already had to shut down the subways due to inclement weather, we don't have the, we don't have anything set up and I'm not paying for it because you're gonna be calling people like me to come help build it. So I'm not paying to go to work. And that being said, you better get an army together because the first person who's a single mom who gets arrested because she couldn't pay to go to work, that prison's getting ripped in half. You want to see fun. Oh, that's don't do that. Let's do something productive, like putting solar panels on Sunrise Highway. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sonal Jessel, followed by Xiaoshu Chen. Our next speaker is Xiaoshu Chen, followed by Lionel Morales. Our next speaker, speaker is Lionel Morales, followed by our 307th speaker on the list, Lopin Zhou. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Lionel Morales, and I'm the Communications, Outreach, and Marketing Manager of the Black Car Fund. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the black car industry at today's hearing. The environmental assessment before you now envisions scenarios that will impose significant harm on black car drivers. It acknowledges that the tolling scenarios it envisions will have a disproportionately high and adverse effect on the taxi and for hire vehicle driver populations. That means reduced wages and lost jobs. Under federal directives, no program can proceed until those harms are mitigated to the extent practical but the environmental assessment before you does not even begin to do so. The most obvious and effective mitigation would be to exempt for hire vehicles from the toll altogether, an option that the environmental assessment does not meaningfully consider. This is completely arbitrary where the assessment notes that an exemption could be granted while maintaining the program's revenue goals. This is a practicable mitigation measure that the environmental assessment declines to consider without explanation. At a minimum, the agency should reject any scenario that does not include a once a day cap on tolls charged to for hire vehicles. While a cap would not be as effective as a complete exemption, it would at least reduce some of the harm the drivers will suffer, which is more than can be said for the so-called mitigation measures considered in the environmental assessment. The assessment suggestion that efforts should be made to ensure that passengers rather than drivers pay the toll is hardly mitigation at all. It does nothing to address the effect that such a policy would have on the demand for taxi and for hire vehicle services. A toll is going to reduce the demand for drivers. The drivers will pay the price for that, even if passengers supposedly pays the toll. The second mitigation measure proposed, converting drivers to other jobs, is a little more than wishful thinking. 
The assessment suggests that four hire vehicle drivers who lose their jobs can work for the MTA or as a paratransit driver. There is no analysis as to whether the demand for such drivers is sufficient to help the number of drivers likely to lose their jobs, nor is there any analysis of whether these new positions would provide comparable wages, let alone living and working conditions. These proposals simply do not satisfy the mitigation requirement. Not long ago, during the pandemic, black car drivers were considered essential workers. Now, in this assessment, it seems that those same drivers are expendable. No real efforts are proposed to mitigate the devastating effects the tolling program will have on these drivers, and that is contrary to multiple federal agency directives. Also, it's just wrong. The environmental assessment, as it's written, must be rejected. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lopen Zhu, followed by Erica Flores. Uh, hello, I'm Lopin, and I'm a resident of Greater Harlem and a high school at Tybeson High School. As someone that commutes to the financial district for school on transit and on bicycle, I have a first-hand experience of the negative effects of private motor vehicles. Every day at 3.35, thousands of students cram onto the narrow sidewalk along Chamber Street, where a vehicular traffic is usually slower than a conga line of students walking to the subway. This excessive traffic, much of which is caused by drivers that don't need to drive, causes air and noise pollution that affects students, residents, and workers alike. New York City is extremely vulnerable to climate change and rising sea levels, so this form of pollution reduction must be implemented. An NYU study of people commuting into Manhattan's central business district found that only 11%, or one in nine people, commute into Manhattan by single person private vehicles who are disproportionately wealthy. Uh, the 89% of people that use sustainable climate friendly modes of transit, which is a great public transit system, uh, biking, bike share, and walking, should be prioritized over the small minority of private drivers. As one of the densest areas in the world, ca cars should not have free access to Manhattan, but was not built for cars. For example, the M22 and M9 buses, which link Stuyvesant and the financial district with the low-income neighborhoods of the Lower East Side and Chinatown, are often slower than walking pace. As a pedestrian along the same half-mile corridor, I often beat the buses by two to three minutes. Essentially, the 25 people riding a bus should be prioritized over the five people in cars blocking the bus from moving. Due to traffic, buses in the CBD often operate only four miles an hour, which is just over walking pace. According to the DOT, Bus speeds have been on a constant decrease and travel speeds within the CBD have declined by 25% since 2010. The extra funding caused by this program is needed to improve our transit, which has been dire need of funding due to years of underfunding from the federal and state government. It is absolutely ridiculous to be stuck north of Union Square on a train for 20 minutes due to switch problems. Since many contributors in past hearings have complained about rising crime, I do want to point out that statistically, the transit system is still much safer than trusting other drivers, which are possibly drunk, sleepy, texting, or road raging from not crashing into you. However, I do have two complaints to make. Stuyvesant is located at Chamber Street and the Westside Highway, an intersection that is so dangerous that when Stuyvesant was built, a $30 million bridge had to be constructed so that the school's 3,500 students didn't have to cross 11 lanes of absolute chaos. The Westside Highway is not a highway. It is not a limited access road. There are intersections everywhere, and therefore, it should not be exempted from this plan. Pedestrians die crossing this highway, and it's... It's a high speed road, it's not a highway. Also, free parking should not be in, uh, kept in neighborhoods outside of the CBD, as uh, the EA estimates that uh, a lot of vehicles will be diverted into neighborhoods outside of the CBD. Uh, and I, the, the city should not be providing free real estate for drivers to park their two ton blocks of metal. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Erica Flores, followed by 30D. Our next speaker is 30D, followed by our 310th speaker on the list, Robert D'Angelo. Our next speaker is Robert D'Angelo, followed by Mary Perillo. Our next speaker is Mary Perillo, followed by Luigi Capage. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, my name is Mary Perillo, and I'm a lifelong New Yorker living in Manhattan for 45 years and in the financial district for the last 39 of them. Um, I support the goals of reducing pollution and mitigating congestion, but I don't think this plan will do that. 
a mysterious walker, occasionally use city bike, but almost every time I leave my neighborhood, I take the subway. I don't want to starve the MTA, but I think this plan has them looking in the wrong pockets. In recent years, there's a massive increase in traffic downtown in the smallest streets on Manhattan Island. And it happened when the city decided to shove, shove tens of thousands of black cars down our throats. Um, I'm having a problem because I can't roll my uh-oh, I'm just stuck in Zoom and I can't get my Word document. Okay, so what my point is, is that there is a way to do what London did and make certain, uh, certain, uh, I'm blowing my time. Let me see if I can do it in the thing I just sent out. Uh, shoot, open message viewer. Uh, no, I'm trapped. Uh, I am going to put it online and give my time to someone else. I'm sorry for my technical difficulty. It'll be in print. Thank you. All comments received in writing or at hearings are considered equally, and we'll make sure that you have the right information about how to submit in writing. The next speaker is Luigi Capage, followed by Tamir Adams L. The next speaker is Tamir Adams L. Excuse me, is Luigi Capage. Hi, my name is Luigi Capai. I am a native New Yorker, lifelong father of three kids. I regularly drive because I need to. I live in Staten Island, it's a necessity. Um, but I also use public transit whenever possible. Before the, before the lockdowns for the pandemic, I was in the city six days a week using bus, you know, using express bus. And I am keenly aware that the, one of the major problems with this is there is no viable alternatives. Yeah, it may be great to use your, you know, to walk or bike if you live in Manhattan and you're going a few blocks away, but coming from another borough and you're going, you know, over several bridges, there is no so, you know, there is no alternative that compensates for being able to drive. Express bus service, I mean, the express bus service alone, they eliminate it every single stop that I use. They eliminate the job near my weekend activities. They, they eliminate the stop near my house. They eliminate it to stop, you know, near my job. I mean, just it's just not a use, you know, they made the service worse and they increased the tolls. So how is that supposed to work? In, you know, your congestion pricing is not going to encourage someone to take a bus when the bus doesn't suffice for what they need. You know, the other thing is, I live in Staten Island, but my kids go to a citywide school in another borough. The DOE refuses to provide yellow bus transportation to across boroughs, so I have to drive my kids to school. I am not sending my six-year-old on a subway for a two-hour commute minimum because it's not in you know, because it's not a direct, you know, you know, go to work pipeline, I have to drive the kids to school. Is there going to be an exception for this? Because if not, I am looking at an additional $4,000 a year just to take my kids to school. And if the state of purpose of this is prevent people from using cars, you're now telling me that I shouldn't take my kids to school. That's a little ridiculous. I mean, are you going to have pass, you know, passes for people taking their kids to school exemptions for that? Now, and when you really think about it, we already have congestion pricing. I come from Staten Island. There is no way for me to drive from one from Staten Island to anywhere else in the city without paying a toll. You know, you're just talking about increasing the tolls and putting, you know, dressing it up. You're not doing anything that's actually going to reduce congestion here. You're just going to redirect it. You're going to put more traffic in other areas. That even your own model says it's going to move. You know, you're just going to move traffic around. You want less cars in Manhattan. Either they're going to go in anyway because they need to, or they're just going to drive somewhere else. Basically, the bottom line is the city needs to be accessible to all residents. This is a plan that is very short-sighted. It only serves a few New Yorkers. It does not serve the outer boroughs. It simply punishes residents of the outer boroughs. Um, you know, and the vast majority of the congestion are four hired vehicles. As someone that's on the road regularly, you can see almost every other car is an empty Uber driving around, causing congestion, waiting for passengers, for all these people that are complaining about congestion. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tamir Adams-L, followed by Oren Faarzaleh. 
Our next speaker is Oren Barzile, followed by Ronnie Dreyer. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon. My name is Oren Barzile. I'm president of FDNY EMS Local 2507, representing EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. Congestion pricing could be a death blow to members of the FDNY EMS. Let's start by acknowledging that members of FDNY EMS are at a stark economic disadvantage being paid at near poverty wages. Our members make a little over the hourly rate that's set by New York State. Despite EMS members' absolute devotion to protect the lives of New Yorkers and our society's most vulnerable, many of our members simply cannot afford to live anywhere close to the city that they serve because of the uncompetitive wages. This is why 30% of FTNY EMS members resign within three years and 70% resign within five years for higher paying jobs. It already amounts to a costly brain drain for the city's medical first responders agencies and its workforce. Adding more cost, roughly a few thousand dollars a year onto the shoulders of poorly paid FDNY EMS staff might just be the straw that breaks the camel's back. FDNY EMS members are the medical first responders for the entire city, meeting all five boroughs and not just Midtown and Lower Manhattan's congesting pricing zones. It will be critical that policymakers recognize that our assigned work shifts are not nine to five, but 24 seven, 365 days a year. And that being ordered to do a double shift or reassigned to work in another area is common occurrence and out of our control. As a uniform paramilitary styled organization and emergency response agencies, we don't have the luxury of choosing our work site. Curating our work hours, we simply report where, when, and as ordered. Our fire inspectors use their personal vehicles. They travel in and out of the zone routinely to conduct inspections. These men and women will, know, will not face additional expenses as the FDOI does not provide transportations for them to conduct these inspections. Those leading this money graph for the MTA need to understand that it is quite common that our members must travel from far away communities just to serve. FDNY members don't generally have the luxury of being able to afford living within the MTA way one or even two fare zone because of the cost of housing is simply too rich for our wages. Making the job of being one of New York City's medical first responders Please more and more your remarks. and cost without the city of New York paving liberal wage first. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ronnie Dreyer, followed by Frank Hardaway. Our next speaker is Frank Hardaway, followed by Anonymous Two. Our next speaker is Anonymous Two, followed by Emmanuel. Candelaria. Our next speaker is Emmanuel Candelaria, followed by Katie Wong. Emmanuel, you may unmute and begin your remarks. Hello. Um, we are communicating on regards to our family, and we are against congestion pricing because there are a few things that aren't being considered like the mta has a lack of reasonable service in the sense of ventilation on the air on the trains um accessibility meaning the elevators as well as there's always traffic or slow train service so it's hard to say get on the train because it's not always reliable and we can't always count that we're going to be able to get there for example also with the buses um, and someone had said earlier there was an issue with like emergency vehicles. If that's the case, they can have a lane for emergency vehicles and the bus lane and then prohibit commercial cars from parking 
we live in the downtown area and a, a lot of times that's the problem there's a lot of commercial vehicles always blocking those bus lanes also there should be some type of exemption based on license registration where your car is registered at because now we're paying from the hours of 6 a.m to 8 p.m 23 dollars 24 dollars a day just to come into the city or just to go home where we live um the mta also has a very bad history of misusing their funds that they get for example on madison square garden they just built a fancy train station we don't need fancy train stations we need working trains and on-time trains so i just want to say that we're against the congestion pricing thank you thank you the next two speakers are excuse me the next speaker is katie wong followed by devin desser Hi, my name is Katie Wong. I'm an Asian American woman who lives with my extended family in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. We live well below multiple poverty lines like many other Asian American New Yorkers as per a recent city report and we own a car. I make these points because my borough president and others refer to car owners and drivers as white wealthier people. And that is not my experience as someone born and raised in an immigrant family in Brooklyn. Like many Asian families, I grew up and still live in a multi-generational household with aging parents and elderly grandparents. We've relied on our car my whole life because we run errands all together, like frequent shopping trips for large quantities of groceries in Manhattan Chinatown and Costco bulk household item purchases, which is frowned upon on and even glared at by other riders if we take the train for these trips without our purchases. We seek medical care in Manhattan even more now because that's where our PCPs refer us to the best doctors, especially since my Medicare grandparents are much older. And I anticipate the same happening to my parents when they soon reach senior citizen status. My family visits multiple doctors and specialists in the proposed zone, including my grandparent who had a stroke right before the pandemic. The subway does not guarantee seating for elderly and those who cannot stand for decent periods of time. It also does not have consistent accessibility like ramps and elevators, clean and open bathrooms, and multilingual signage and assistance throughout the whole system. So an hour subway ride, assuming no delays is too much for families like mine, mentally and financially. Our medical trips are by a car that is not registered under my grandparents, and these trips tend to include three to four people. The patient, driver, main caretaker, and a bilingual family member to help translate. The subway during this Third year of the pandemic remains incredibly unsafe for those immunocompromised, even the young ones who have underlying conditions or not, and we are unable to isolate in a multi-generational household. My family and community are also terrified of anti-Asian attacks in the streets and on the subway, especially when they're targeted at us women and our elderly, often leading to death and hospitalization. The subway system, including my own home station, has gone through so many so-called repairs without any accessibility improvements, even shutting down both sides of the station for over a year, years ago. But service and the station continue to crumble throughout my whole life as fares increase. CP will become another huge burden on low-income multi-generational immigrant families like mine as we cannot, we cannot receive the medical care in Brooklyn and we cannot afford any further fees to be a New Yorker who also frequents Manhattan Chinatown for community visits and resources. There needs to be exemptions for poor and working class immigrant New Yorkers who rely on cars out of survival. As we saw huge lines when Greenlight New York passed and how the five cent bag fee was exempt for poor New Yorkers because every cent counts, but nine or $23 is going to kill us. We also need more inclusive intentional research into this program before it even passed in Albany. So low income communities of color are not impacted disproportionately by this and are included in such hearings. True environmental- Good your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. We have reached the final two speakers on the list. After they have been called, we will call the names of all the speakers who we previously called but did not yet speak. As we make our way through the list of speakers for the second time, those present who have not spoken yet will be given an opportunity to comment. If you missed your name being called, did not sign up to speak but would like to speak, or have joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function. You may also request to speak anonymously. Our next speaker is Devin Desser, followed by Elderly New Yorker. 
Our next speaker is elderly New Yorker. Can you hear? Yes, we can. Mass transit is a fast-paced environment. Slow, frail, elderly New Yorkers with brittle bones from osteoporosis can be killed by being pushed down or trampled. Actually, there is a victim of subway violence in a a victim in a coma. Mass transit is not for the feeble with balance problems, immunocompromise, etc. Mass transit is not appropriate for everyone. The pushback in the meeting is loud and clear, clearly overwhelming. Billions of dollars given by federal government to corporations and foreign countries, the federal government has given billions of dollars to corporate America in bailouts during financial crisis and during COVID-19 on the backs of the American taxpayer. And federal government has bailed out the auto industry, the airline industry, the hospitality industry, has given billions of dollars in PPP loans that were forgiven to wealthy people like Jared Kushner, Tom Brady, Khloe Kardashian, and has given billions of dollars in aid to foreign countries. Let the federal government bail out further support, MTA. The federal government has already recently given the MTA $15 billion. What happened to the $15 billion? That was given to the MTA? The The MTA needs money but it is not fair to take the money out of the pockets of sick elderly individuals who are on fixed income. There are so many groups that have valid reasons for exemptions that congestion pricing should not move forward as per all the testimony. The congestion tax will cause so much pain and financial hardship. Congestion price is a heartless, unfair money grab by the MTA as the plan does nothing to improve the congestion and environment, but merely redistributes negative effects of congestion and negative effects on the environment. People need to contact the governor and state senators and assemblymen to protest this outrageous congestion tax. These public meetings are being transcribed, and the transcriptions should be made available to the public. It is part of your job to listen to the meetings. The general public should not have to listen to the hours of video to learn everything that was said at the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. We will now read the names of those on our list who have not spoken for a second time, starting with those we believe may be present. Douglas Desser. Douglas Desser. If you're present, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh my gosh, okay. I, I was on since 10 o'clock, so I, I actually went through the whole uh, process. Uh, these are the, uh, the price, uh, what did we call this again? Well, what it is, I, I'm against it because what happens is that uh, I, I uh, well, I work in Manhattan on the Upper East Side. Uh, I work, I, I, my job, Starts at midnight to eight in the morning. I don't deal with traffic. I don't know why I have to deal with this congested price. I've been working in the city for 35 years. And on the same time, I also have a part-time job where I deliver medicine, food, and things to people in Manhattan. 
But uh, if this congestion price goes on, I, I can't do this anymore. I'll, and tell you the truth, I did used to deliver in, in Manhattan, and I couldn't deal with it because the traffic was bad. You couldn't find parking, and I was getting tickets one after another. So after three attempts, I gave up on it. So I decided to keep my deliveries in the other four boroughs, Brooklyn, Queens, and uh, Staten Island, Long Island. That's about it. But if you do the congestions, I'll say one thing. I, you know, I feel sorry for the people who live in Manhattan because I think these are the people that's actually pushed it more than anybody else because they're more worried about their environment. And then I think the MTA is looking for a hat in hand so to join the people in Manhattan to cause this, this drastic thing to happen to us because it's going to hurt the people in the outer boroughs. So I can't make deliveries in Manhattan anymore because I can't afford to do that. And eventually, uh, the people in Manhattan, they're going to lose business because that's where it comes down to. The people who live in the house, who don't work, who works from their homes, are not going to get their food deliveries. They're not going to get anything done. Their business is going to close. I work in the Upper East Side, and I look around. I don't know, maybe these people hide in their apartments, but you look around, and businesses are closing everywhere. There's homeless people sleeping in front of shops. And that's not just in Brooklyn or Queens. That's in Manhattan all over the city. So uh, this price congestion is not going to help anybody. This is, you couldn't do this at a worse time. I'm 62 years old. Thank God in a couple of more years, I'm going to retire because it doesn't pay for me to work. It, it pays for me to just go home, catch my pension and everything else. And then that's it. And with this, you know, I'll uh, give the time back to anybody. Thank you for the time. Thank you for emailing me this text because if I didn't get this text, I wouldn't know what was going on in the city. And uh is a very dangerous and bad time situation we're going through. I haven't taken a train in over 25 years, and I'm not about to take it now. The last time I took it, there were people doing drugs on the train, and that was it. Okay, thank you. With, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tal Barzile. Tal Barzile, followed by Ephraim Aaron. Tal, if you're able to. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, great. Okay, you can see me now, can you? You can see and hear me now. Yes. All right. Look, congestion pricing was never supported when it was first launched back when Mike Bloomberg wanted this. It is not supported now. The only thing it is seen as is a regressive tax to those on lower incomes while a punishment to those who do not have viable alternatives. But I also, but I feel like the groups that advocate it either do not drive on a regular basis or can easily afford it. That is why they are the ones pushing for it. And if it wasn't for the relentless push, it'd be long dead by now. As a matter of fact, it really, matter of fact, you say that car ownership is not big in New York City. Well, New York City is not just Manhattan. Also, the city boundaries do not stop where the subway lines do. And there are even transit deserts, even in city lines itself. But as a resident of Pleasantville in Westchester County, even I have some, even I would find it faster to drive because during off peak hours, both Metro North and B line have sporadic schedules to which driving will get me there sooner as opposed to taking either of those. I feel like sometimes people do not look at the causes to why we drive and rather focus on the effects. If we had better viable alternatives, we wouldn't have to drive. But I feel the main priority of congestion pricing is not really to reduce congestion or to have cleaner air. It is to make a revenue. Because if it got people out of, out of all their vehicles, there's no revenue on this. And then it will be just seen as a net money loser. So yeah, if you really thought it was about those things, then I guess I got a bunch of New York City bridges and tunnels to sell you on that. We should not amend this idea. We should just end it already. If you really want to help the people in the outer boroughs, especially in the outlying areas, build that IND second system and Triber RX that you were supposed to build decades ago and didn't. Until then, there will be driving. The same thing goes with the suburbs with commuter transit having sporadic schedules during off peak hours. As long as that exists, as long as you have as long as you have those built around those with just regular work schedules. Those that don't have it will always resort to driving. So once again, you've got to look at the causes and not the effects. You've got to help them. Even in London, they already improved their transit even before thinking of congestion pricing, not after it. And that's the problem. This doesn't really help anyone. So please do not amend this idea. 
end it. Okay, there, we're done. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ephraim Aaron, followed by Jesus Urena. Ephraim, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. Our next speaker is Jesus Urena. Jesus, you may unmute yourself and begin your remarks. I didn't mean to uh, come on the video. Um, well, yes. Uh, hey, good afternoon. Thank you guys for uh, taking out time or giving me the, the opportunity to speak. Um, I drive for, for Uber and for Lyft. Um, during the pandemic, uh, things were really tough. I, I, I contracted COVID about three times. Um, all the while having a family, and uh, it wasn't only for for monetary reasons. I, I also wanted to contribute. Also, wanted to give back. You know, we were considered uh, essential workers, and I had, at, as um, it has been mentioned here, but other people like it, it just feels like we're we're being thrown aside. Like uh, we we no lo no no longer important, even after you know contributing, even after you know uh, being there for for the city. It's really unfortunate. I mean, I feel like there's other solutions, um, other ways to go about it. But currently, we're in the in the, in the recession, um, coming out of a pandemic. It's just kind of nuts to me for this to take place this coming year, um, given the the current state of things right now. Rent being as as expensive as it is, um, groceries being as, as expensive as they are, and then um, for this. Uh, for this to go forward and uh, kind of just decimate our, just, just decimate our, you know, the, the industry and put us out of a job, I, you know, it, it, it just, it, it really doesn't make sense to me. Like, uh, I feel like some more time can be taken to find better solutions to the issues. Um, like I, I struggle with it. So I, uh, I have a, a newborn on the way and uh, now I gotta worry about finding an alternative job that may they may that might compensate you know uh the same way you know it, it's it's heart wrenching um I really wish that you know uh the people that are looking at this would take more time put this on hold reevaluate it and find better solutions a better way to you know get that income for the MTA understand that needs repairs um there there just has to be a better way to go about it. You know, especially after coming out of a pandemic, you know, after all these businesses are closing down, after you know inflation being at what it is, as, as I mentioned, there just has to be a different alternative. There just have to be there, more research needs to be done before this happens. I mean, it, it feels like no, you know, no, no consideration is being taken uh, considering the current state of things. You know, people are struggling out here, and uh, it, it would just yeah, it would just put us out of a job. You know, a lot of the, the drivers, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, people that were, you know, here for the city. And uh, and not to mention everybody else, all the, all the residents and citizens that I pick up that complain about how much you're struggling to make ends meet. Um, but thank you. Thank you for the time. Love you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Erica Flores. Hello. We can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, hi. Oh, sorry. One second. 
Um, so my name is Erica Flores, and I'm a resident of what's being called the Central Business District. Um, I, I've spoken before, and I just want to reiterate a couple of things that I've shared. Um, I think that there's this notion that the people who live in the CBD are all wealthy, and that we would be able to kind of, you know, take on this, this additional expense. We just heard a gentleman who just spoke about the current state of things. Groceries are up. Just last week, I spent $6.99 on a dozen eggs. A carton of eggs was $6.99 in my neighborhood. I don't live here because I'm wealthy. I live here because it's what I can afford. Um, I live with family. Um, it's just, you know, this, this proposal, it's going to hurt a, a lot of people, not only within the CBD, but outside of it, neighboring. Th this just shuffles around the problem, um, the impact for the, the you know, the, the, the potential impact that we've seen in, in London, how it's a disaster there. It's not worth putting New Yorkers in more of a financial debt. People are struggling and we're only going to shift the problem to other neighborhoods where there's going to be congestion now above 60th street. Folks are going to be parking their cars in those neighborhoods and then um, kind of hopping on the train, which is already an insufficient. Ridership is down. Crime is up in trains. People are scared. And you're going to have people who are either going to hop on the train um, and cause more delays there and make that less of a, of a, a reliable system and people getting in the cab. So I, I don't understand how this makes any sense. Um, in in the this the um, the presentation earlier, you know, there's a lot of buzzwords being used like environmental justice. And in your research alone, you show that areas like um, neighborhoods that surround the Cross Bronx or the Bruckner are going to be further. Um, uh, disadvantaged because of this. So how is this an environmental justice policy when black and brown people in those communities that are already, you know, youth there and adults, it's like the highest asthma population in the world, you're just further going to disadvantage them. You're going to reroute traffic. And this is just not a good policy. It's a money grab. We've heard that over and over. Um, these calls have been by far uh, of people saying that they're against this policy and we should have been, this should have been, this session should have happened long before. Um, I really hope that you take all of this into consideration. People are gonna suffer and disabled people, poor people, people of color, the very communities that you're saying that you're trying to help. I, I just don't understand it. Um, and I hope that you all listen to us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now continue reading the list of speakers who have not spoken yet for a second time, if you hear your name being called, please let us know in the Q&A function. Sarah Gribitz, Stephen Salveson, Quentin Hilbroner, Sophia Kekarala, Arnold Hamilton, Peter Treestman, Andrew Grossman, Darren Gitlitz, Marietta Vieira, Nicole Love, David Gazehals. Hassan El Helwa, Louise Torres, Bill Feinberg, Meyer Flores, Chrisita Connolly, Mohammed Islam, Ray Wolf Richards, Nomi Castillo, Navina Kosick, Patricia O'Rourke, Stephen Graham, Alberto Alamo, Kiala Montgomery, William Delaney, Rosemary Chatterton, Cullen McGraw, 
Adam Albarin. Dario Cremades. Daryl G. Fulton. Donovan Hunt. Craig Hudson. Haydar Akbar. Jonathan Tinio. Warren Green. Kevin Ritter. Rodney Hughes. Eric Diaz. Michael King. Jody Stewart. Siva Giamaris. Gordon Watt. Polly Brewster. Donna Bartolini. Michael Goles. Beta Vita Sai. Teo Ajapan Yamoa. Sophia Feist. Adam Ahmed. Constance Stellis. Thomas Greck. Eric Dorfman. Sarah Hughes. Imani McKinnon. Jordan Force. Erica Schwarz. Wendy Breuer. Ahmad Quayam. Baraz Qureshi. Carol Parker. Christopher Sanders. Lena Melendez. Christian Aru. Michael Harachi. Vishan Chakrabarti. John Jedrosich. Michelle Grossman. Casper Lant. Munib Reman. Michael Prisco. Mitch Watson. Christine O'Brien. Sheila Pierre. Chris Castillo. Caswell McLean. Alfred Lynch. Connie Zambianchi. Cecilia Guerra. Philip Shinilev. Jorge Urena. Krishaveni Drummond. Raul Rivera. Peter Costello. Elizabeth Larkin. Patricia Keenan. Beatrice Chisholm. Leo Strauss. David Schroeder. Catherine Myers. Charlene Burke. Charles Yu. Scott Henry. Michelle Winfield. Carl Wojciechowski. Mamadou Diallo. Gordon Lee. Cynthia Nwamara. Judy Densky. John Chimillo. Tinetin Chargishvili. Pierre Benjamin. Donna Myers. Kurt B. Brian Freeman. Ariel Schaffer. Steve Azor. Henry Ward. Veronica Mosey. Lee Arthurs. Kerry Flaherty. Juan Carlos Marin. Emma Cintron. Denise Hebe. Joan Kimmel. Carolyn Protas. Emilio Estella. Teddy Edris. Adina Schulemsen. Dominic Sanino. Alexander Ross. Merrick Kuzelnicki. Amadeo Pellin. Jennifer M.C. Judy Pesson. Ashraf Ahmed. 
Matt Bewley. Joan Martinez. Aura E. Joseph Stoffel. Milana Mates. Bernardo Celerino. Liam Jeffries. Norman Buenaventura. Wolf Hertzberg. Gollum Istikyu. Richard Chalfin. Howard Schaefer. Rosalie Shields. Suzanne Musho. Joe Troiano. Erwin Miller. Brian Hess. Joanne Roberts. Justin Gundluck. Alec Raggio. Harry Schwartz. Tony Thompson. Ahmad Saeed. Daniel Reed. Anna Kakinis. Benjamin Tolentino. Linnea Wiles. Elizabeth Pugh. Steve Sibiga. Sharon Wynn Carmona. Barry Jennison. Ephraim Aaron. Jeff Schwain. Shane McMorrow. Sonal Jessel. Xiaoshu Chen. 30D. Robert D'Angelo. Tamar Adams L. Ronnie Dreyer. Frank Hardaway. Anonymous speaker number two. Devin Desser. Devin, you may unmute yourself and share your remarks. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm sorry for joining so late. But yes, I just wanted to quickly say that I, I definitely disagree with this congestion uh, pricing policy that the city is going to implement, um, mainly for many of the reasons that have already been stated by many other uh, New Yorkers or other residents who depend on driving into the city to you know, support their way of life or how they've been moving through out this crazy, crazy, insane time we've been through. I think that an additional fee that's levied upon different drivers is quite disastrous in this time when there's, again, record levels of inflation, all the goods and prices are increasing, rent is increasing, everything seems to be getting more and more expensive in this time period. And I feel that the city using a policy as more of a disincentive versus focusing on one that provides more of an incentive to use public um, transportation is not the best move at this time period. You know, some other people have stated this as well too, that the subway system has not been safe um, for many people and there are different viewpoints on it. I do think that if the city was to first begin with providing a level of confidence that they can provide a safe, subway system or alternative method of transportation for people to get in and get out of the city effectively and efficiently, then I think we can start into the conversation about should people be needing to drive into the city. Um, but I feel like as it stands right now, some people are definitely not feeling that the subway system is safe, um, as well as driving into the city as well too already has a lot of disincentives already that the drivers take on including excessive fineage if you're like a minute or two over the parking meter getting your car towed by you know the department of transportation and having to pay upwards of a 300 dollars fee already so there's a lot of disincentives already driving to the city so when people are going in and driving they need to get there it's not a pleasurable thing sometimes they really do need to drive so it's not a question of like 
oh, you know, it's just a luxury to do so. Like we understand the situation, the risks that are involved in that type of situation. So adding an additional fee on top of the already excessive, excessive fees that drivers already deal with, including the levels of insurance, which are record high across New York City, plus whatever the car payments are, it's, it's just an additional excess. That's all I had to say for today. So thank you for listening. Thank you. That concludes our reading of the list of speakers for a second time. Thank you all for joining us today. For the record, during today's hearing, Paul Fryman stepped in as hearing officer when I took a short break. For those who did not do so already, we encourage you to take our short survey via the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the Q&A section of the Zoom. For details about the Central Business District Tolling Program and the Environmental Assessment, please visit the project website at mta.info slash cbdtp. As a final reminder, in addition to the six virtual public hearings that have been held, there are several other ways you can provide comments on the Environmental Assessment through September 9th, 2022. We encourage the public to comment via the CBDTP website, where you can also find the latest project information and sign up to stay informed via email. You may also email comments to cbdtp at mtabt.org, send them via mail to CBD Tolling Program, 2 Broadway, 23rd floor, New York, New York, 10004, or call 646-252 7440. Comments may also be provided directly to the Federal Highway Administration via email to cbdtp at dot.gov or via mail to FHWA New York Division Ray CBDTP Leo W. O'Brien Federal Building 11A Clinton Avenue Suite 719 Albany, New York 12207. The time is currently 6.58 p.m. This concludes the hearing. Thank you again for your participation.